Sweet Valentine. Narrated by Josephine Bindema. Written by Josephine Bindema. Chapter 1. The dragon was calling him again. Derek shifted the tray of lattes, bag of gourmet takeout, dry cleaning and personal mail into one hand and arm as best as he could while he fished for his cell phone with his other hand. He crooked his head at an odd angle to keep the cell tucked between his cheek and shoulder so he could redistribute the items before anything hit the ground. Kramer, Derek bit out as a pedestrian almost knocked the tray of drinks out of his hand. You're supposed to be answering the phone. Miss Stone's office, Derek speaking. Cynthia's tone was not pleased. I knew it was you. It's called call display. Derek J. walked through traffic. "'Whatever. Just do it next time,' she replied, still annoyed at him. "'Is there a reason for this call?' Derek tried to keep his tone civil as the cab honked at him, the driver making a rude gesture. "'Other than I'm your boss and I can call whenever I like?' Cynthia practically purred into the phone. "'I need the Nelson case files brought up from the copy room. The drones from downstairs report that they've been collated.' "'I'm supposed to be your paralegal, not your PA,' Derek responded through gritted teeth." Cynthia sighed. You're both until Missy gets back from vacation. You know how I hate temps. They're obnoxious, clueless, and don't get me. That means you get the job. Sweet, Derek said, unamused. You bet it is, Cynthia replied just before she ended the call. Derek growled in frustration and picked up the pace. When he was younger, he had envisioned himself becoming a lawyer, protecting the innocent from the scum of society. Despite his natural cynicism, He'd wanted to change the world for the better. Lack of money had put a crimp in the idea, so he'd decided to make the best of his dream, becoming a paralegal on scholarships and loans until he could set aside some time and savings to become the lawyer he'd always wanted to be. Now, reality had intruded. He realized his idealized version of the law wasn't often what happened in the courtroom. Now, the very thought of trying to further his career, the one he had grown to hate, turned his stomach. He needed another in acid. He needed a new job. Derek entered this prestigious building of Yates, Kramer, and Stone. It was the irony of his life that some guy with the same last name was a partner. He had been working for Cynthia Stone for what felt like a life sentence. In reality, he had been there eight years. He regretted every single one of them. Derek had been enslaved by Cynthia. She ran his life. He didn't remember the last time he had a girlfriend. Cynthia was determined that when her uncle retired from the firm, the name Stone would stay on the partner list. She was driven to make senior partner, which meant she drove Derek crazy. He worked anywhere from 16 to 20 hours a day. The only time he took off was Thanksgiving weekend to camp with his friends. Otherwise, he had zero life. Derek didn't even bother to flirt with the pretty new intern in the copy room. There was no point. He had her slip the appropriate documents in his shoulder bag, then made a bee line for the elevators. If the dragon's latte was cold, she'd have it in for him. He had no idea how her P.A. Missy put up with her. Derek frowned. How did Missy even get a vacation? It boggled his mind. He was still scowling as he dumped everything over his desk. He grabbed the tray of drinks with the food, making his way to the boardroom, only to find it empty. Derek stood there for a moment, wondering where everyone had gone. Clearing his tired thoughts, he went to Cynthia's office, not bothering to knock. Oh, good, Cynthia grabbed a latte. I needed a caffeine boost. Where is everyone? Derek asked, flopping into a chair. Gone. They got tired of waiting for you. Cynthia took a long sip. You know, it doesn't reflect well on you when you're late. Maybe, if I wasn't picking up your dry-cleaning, copies from the copy room, which could have been sent up via one of the copy room drones, or getting that red nail polish that you just had to have, I might have been on time. Derek took the nail polish from his suit pocket and lobbed it to Cynthia, who caught it one-handed, especially since it took fifteen minutes of picture messaging to get the right shade. I sense a little sarcasm there, she leaned back, raising an eyebrow. Derek grabbed a cup. There was no point in letting coffee go to waste, even if it was the girly kind. I have trouble believing you regularly send Missy to get nail polish for you. It could have been worse. I could have sent you to get tampons. Cynthia had a sly smile. Besides, I have a date tonight. A date? Derek said the word like a foreign concept. 
pretty much was. He wondered when she had time to date. She worked just as much as he did, maybe more. Sometimes he thought she dreamed about work and ways to pile it up on him. You do that? Yes, she replied a little testily. I ran into an old friend from college and we decided to go out, hence the dry cleaning and nail polish emergency. Derek pulled out her container of General Tao's chicken, putting it on her desk with a set of plastic cutlery and a fortune cookie. He grabbed the rest of the grub and headed for the door. I've got real work to do. Hey, you don't even like egg rolls, and I know for a fact Yates ordered some. Cynthia pointed a plastic fork at him. Derek smiled as he left. Yeah, but I paid for them, so I'll eat them anyways. He had paid for them dearly, since she specifically wanted them from the expensive Chinese restaurant, rather than the good restaurant named Angry Walk that had the exact same food for a more reasonable price. The Angry Walk was closer, too. However, Cynthia got what she wanted. Derek was busy at his desk when Cynthia came out of her office. She was wearing some red dress that looked like it was missing a lot of material. Her nails had been lacquered red to match, and she had on an extra layer of makeup. It seemed a bit much for a first date, even if she and the guy had known each other back in college. More than one man had remarked an admiration on her figure since Cynthia kept it in excellent shape. What they didn't realize is that she had a hard skin, sharp, biting teeth, a gleam of avarice in her eye, and could burn a man with just a few words. Hence the nickname Dragon. Not that Derek would ever call her that out loud. He valued his life too much. Make sure you're back by curfew. She rolled her eyes, perched on the edge of his desk, and grabbed one of the remaining fortune cookies. Popping a piece into her mouth, she read the fortune. Your life will take an unexpected turn. Embrace change. How original, Derek remarked dryly. Who knows, Cynthia said smugly. He could be the one. Santa could exist, too, Derek shrugged. I heard the tooth fairy is showing up on YouTube. I know you're a cynic, but don't you think there's a chance for love? She crossed a leg, swinging it gently. He dragged his eyes away from it. She was stunning, and he was male enough to admire a good leg. However, she was his boss and dangerous. In my experience, people are selfish and messed up. We make each other miserable. And that is why you will end up alone, a cranky old man. Cynthia slipped off his desk. I already am. Derek crunched down on the remaining fortune cookie. He looked at the small slip of paper and smirked. Oh, look, your life will take an unexpected turn. Embrace change. That's disappointing. They can't even remember to give different fortunes to their customers. Cynthia shook her head. Well, I'm through making Carl wait. Don't forget, the Nelson case needs all of the phone calls from June 17th highlighted. Sure thing, boss. He'd add that to the list of things he needed to get done. Doing Missy's work, too, was putting him badly behind. Even though she was taking the night off, he was going to be burning the midnight oil. The only good news was that he could take his work home with him since she was going to be gone from the office and wouldn't require him to be in. He hoped Carl put the moves on her and kept her in bed for the better part of the morning. Derek could use the chance to sleep in. He watched her great set of legs walk away before popping another antacid. Another three hours later, Derek packed it in and went home to the tiny three-bedroom apartment that he shared with two roommates. It was clean, by man's standards. It boasted a 60-inch television with amazing sound speakers set up and video game systems. His roommates might be in their thirties, but they pretended they were teenagers too often for Derek's liking. Then again, it wasn't like he did anything there but store his suits, shower, and sleep. He wasn't even sure if roommate number two was named Ned or Nick. It was one in the morning when his phone rang. Derek automatically pressed it up against his ear, running a hand over his sleepy face, dislodging a paper that had gotten stuck on his cheek when he'd fallen asleep highlighting. Kramer. Get in here. We have work to do. Cynthia's voice was sharp. Great. Derek said to the ceiling above his bed, as she'd already hung up on him. Obviously, the date had not gone well, and now he got to deal with the fallout. Lucky him. He groaned and rolled out of bed. A quick shower and shave, new set of clothes and cab ride, saw him back at the office. The night guard gave him a sympathetic look. Howard, Derek nodded in greeting. How sad was that? He knew the guard's name, but not his own roommate's. She got you in again? He shook his head. No rest for the weary, 
Derek said the oft-repeated phrase. Or the wicked, Howard replied. I don't have time to be wicked. Derek punched the elevator door button to close. He checked that his tie was straight before exiting. Did you bring coffee? Cynthia was back to looking her professional self, expensive suit and moderate makeup. Her voice had a brisk cut to it. I'm not a mind reader. Derek dumped his files on his desk. I'll start up the machine in the staff room. Don't bother, she sniffed. That stuff is second rate. Derek wondered if he could get gourmet coffee delivered at this time of night. Missy would have been able to. He wasn't going to try. He'd had two hours of sleep. Fantastic. What was so urgent that I needed to come in for? He asked tiredly. She looked at him like he was silly for asking such a question. You're behind in your work. I still don't have the Nelson files. The notes from the winter statements have been typed or filed. Don't get me started on the Underhill's case. It's like you haven't even touched it. He hadn't touched it. It had just come in yesterday, and he'd been picking up lousy dry cleaning and nail polish. Derek popped an antacid to combat the coffee he'd scalded his tongue on during the taxi ride over. I take it the date didn't go well? Derek winced. He hadn't meant to say anything. Somehow the words had just popped out. No doubt she would think he was retaliating over a criticism of his not getting his workload complete. She glared at him. It was perfect, until I realized he was married with three kids and was just trying to get laid. Ouch. Derek grimaced. I guess you're right. We're all just selfish and make each other miserable, she ground out, a little bitter over the experience. Derek sighed. It was obvious she was hurt over the episode. He tried to offer a reconciliatory remark. Just because I haven't seen much evidence of people having loving relationships doesn't mean they don't exist. I don't want to talk about it. She dismissed his remarks and arched an eyebrow. We have work to do. Five hours later, he'd put a sizable dent in the pile of work on his desk. The sun was rising in the sky. Everyone else would soon be joining them for normal office hours. Derek stood up, stretched, and hit the second-rate coffee from the staff room. He looked at the day-old donuts that were left there. They were probably more like three-day-olds, but weren't growing any mold yet, so he took one. It was a little crunchy, but better than just coffee for breakfast. He wandered over to Cynthia's office to find her sleeping on the expensive leather couch she had designed into the layout of the room. For pity's sake. Here he was, working hard, and she was softly snoring on the sofa. Derek picked up a file on papers that had been strewn on the floor. When he straightened up, he saw Stone Sr., one of the senior partners and Cynthia's uncle, walking towards the office. If he kept on the same trajectory, he was going to see his niece sleeping. Knowing how much she wanted the senior partner in position once Mr. Stone Sr. retired, Derek knew he had to do something so her uncle wouldn't see her sleeping on the job. Shifting to hide what he was about to do from Mr. Stone's view, he smacked Cynthia on the head with a thin file. He didn't do it hard, but firmly enough to wake her. She jerked to sit upright on the sofa. So that's why I think the Nelson case has a loophole that we can exploit, Derek said loudly as Mr. Stone came in. Cynthia stood up, straightening her suit jacket, professionalism coming to the fore. About time you figured that one out. It was obvious. That was the last time he rescued her, Derek thought darkly. Let the old man catch her napping. It would serve her right. Excuse us, would you? Mr. Stone gave him a look reserved for annoying insects and drone workers of the firm. Derek knew that Stone didn't even know his name. He gave a brisk nod. Of course. He shut the door behind him and went to his cubicle. Dropping into his chair, his cell phone rang. Cynthia Stone, Derek speaking. Derek leaned far back in his chair, looking at the ceiling. He repeated his mantra of needing a new job. However, there were none that paid like this one. He'd looked. The overtime hours he put in were phenomenal for earning money. Mr. Kramer, my name is Sally Winthrop. I've been calling for the past three days trying to get hold of Mrs. Stone. I urgently need to get in contact with her, the voice on the line said. First, it's Ms. Stone, Derek corrected. He was doing them a favor by making sure they got the right prefix. For a woman who was driven by her career, Cynthia was particular about her marital status. Second, Ms. Stone is a very busy woman. If you'd leave your information and what this is about, I'll pass on the message. 
"'You've passed on the message several times already, Mr. Kramer,' Sally was impatient. "'I need to speak directly with Miss Stone.' "'I'm afraid that's just not possible.' Derek was getting a small measure of enjoyment from torturing this lady. "'You could email me your concerns, and I'll direct them to the appropriate person.' "'Mr. Kramer,' she tersely replied, "'I am an attorney for the late Guy and Alicia Roms. "'Alicia Roms is Cynthia's sister.' I suggest you have her call me immediately. Derek's feet hit the floor as he abruptly sat up. Say again? Alicia Roms? Cynthia Stone's sister has passed, Sally repeated. I need to contact Miss Stone for several particulars. Derek closed his eyes. He had been putting her off for three days since she hadn't exactly been forthcoming with what she wanted to talk to Cynthia about. It was part of Missy's duties to head off any unnecessary communication with people, and he may have taken it too far. His stomach swirled in rebellion, reminding him that he should probably pop another antacid. Either that, or he needed to lay off the coffee. But since it was about the only thing keeping him awake, it was unlikely that he would quit caffeine. Cynthia was going to be very unhappy with him. "'My apologies, Mrs. Winthrop,' he said, feeling like a complete heel. I had no idea. I'll talk to Miss Stone directly and give her your contact information. Thank you, Mr. Kramer, she said with some relief. I would appreciate that. Derek jotted down her information. He waited for Mr. Stone Sr. to leave Cynthia's office, then tapped on her door before entering. She was sitting on the leather couch with a tissue in her hand. Maybe Mr. Stone had already told her about her sister. He hoped she wasn't going to cry. He had no idea what to do if she did. One didn't exactly try to console a cactus, or a dragon. Her eyes narrowed. She stood up, walked directly into his personal space, a militant gleam in her eye. You are supposed to inform me of everything. Everything! Do you understand? That is what I pay you to do. That is your job. If you can't do your job, then you are no use to me. I deeply apologize, Miss Stone. Derek began, trying to make amends for the mistake that he'd made. I had no idea that it was this important. Otherwise, I would have brought it to you immediately. You didn't think this was important? Cynthia growled. How could it not be important? This is my life! Again, I'm sorry. Mrs. Winthrop didn't say she wanted to talk to you about, and I stalled her. It's entirely my fault I didn't put the call through. Derek tried to explain while taking the blame. He deserved it, and he would own the fact. Mrs. Who? Cynthia looked at him like he was on another planet. Mrs. Winthrop, the lawyer for your sister? He began to tread carefully with his words as he realized they probably weren't talking about the same thing. Who cares about my sister's lawyer? Cynthia poked him hard with a finger to the chest. I'm talking about being passed up for partner for Jameson. Jameson, for the love of pizza and wine! Derek blinked. He'd never heard that phrase before. He absently massaged his chest where she poked him. It hurt a little. Jameson! She threw her hands in the air and paced. He's a cruddy lawyer. He tries to get in the intern's pants. Are they serious? Derek had been hoping she'd make partner. It might make her happier and easier to deal with. Plus, he thought he might get a nice raise out of the deal. They can't be serious. You're a far better lawyer. She rounded on him. You are supposed to keep me in the loop. I pay you to know the rumor mill around here. I was blindsided by my uncle who came in to let me know. What do you do all day? Work. Nothing but work, he thought. He didn't even sleep any more, it felt like. Wait, this mean that she didn't know. Derek rubbed his tired eyes with his thumb and forefinger as his stomach bottomed out again. He desperately needed a new job. Miss Stone... I think you should have a seat on the couch, he began. Why? She threw the tissue in the trash. Cynthia continued to pace the room in her snit. I have more bad news. Derek wanted to sit down himself, but felt it would be wrong to sit when she was standing, and he was about to inform her of the esteemable Miss Winthrop and her news. Please. Fine, she hissed through clenched teeth and sat. Cynthia looked up at him expectantly. Well? Derek pulled out one of the leather chairs to face the couch and sat down. He clasped his hands and wished desperately he didn't need to be the one to tell her this. 
Mrs. Winthrop, your sister's lawyer, has been calling for the past couple of days. I didn't realize how important it was until this morning when she informed me that Alicia and Guy have died. She needs to contact you about the particulars of the estate. Cynthia looked a little shell-shocked. It was the first time he had ever seen her with nothing to say. I am incredibly sorry. There are no words to express the sorrow I feel at the monumental mistake I made of not forwarding Mrs. Winthrop's call to you sooner. Derek cleared his throat. Again, I apologize for my error. You have my deepest condolences for your loss. Is this a joke? Cynthia looked at him in disbelief. I talked to Alicia last week. She's fine. She's not fine, he said in sympathy. Call this Mrs. Winthrop woman, she demanded. Right here. Put her on speaker. I'm going to tell her how wrong she is. Derek punched in the other lawyer's number and waited as it rang. Sally Winthrop, she answered crisply. Mrs. Winthrop, this is Derek Kramer. I have Miss Stone here on speaker, he responded as he looked at Cynthia with some trepidation. Who knew how she was going to react to Sally Winthrop if she wasn't willing to accept the death of her sister? "'Miss Stone, you've been a hard lady to get a hold of,' Sally said with some relief. "'I'm the lawyer of Guy and Alicia Rom. I'm sorry to tell you that your sister and her husband passed away recently after being in an automobile accident.' "'You're wrong,' Cynthia said badly. "'I talked to Alicia last week Monday. There must be some error.' Sally hesitated a moment. "'I am sorry for your loss, Miss Stone. Alicia died last Tuesday in hospital.' Her husband also passed during the aftermath of the vehicle accident they were in. "'This is a mistake,' Cynthia grabbed her cell phone and dialed her sister's number. "'I'm going to call her. She'll tell you that she's perfectly fine.' "'Miss Stone, I feel for you. But Mr. and Mrs. Rom died after a drunk driver hit them,' Sally responded patiently. "'You're wrong.' Cynthia waited as her cell phone went to voicemail. "'I'll text her.' Derek put a hand over hers to prevent her from fiddling with her phone. Cynthia, they're gone. Tears welled up in her eyes, and he quickly grabbed the box of tissues offering it to her. I'm very sorry, Miss Stone, Sally interrupted as Cynthia blotted her eyes. With Alicia's death has come some important details that need to be settled. You have been appointed sole guardian of the children. What? Cynthia looked at Derek in confusion. Why would she choose me? She knows I'm a career woman. We always argued about how much I was focused on my career. You're her only living relative under the age of sixty, Sally said dryly. Guy was estranged from his family. They chose you to raise the children in the event of their demise. Derek couldn't picture it. Cynthia? With kids? It just didn't compute. No doubt she'd buy a nanny to look after the poor kids and neglect them terribly. Just how many kids did Alicia and Guy have? Four, Cynthia supplied faintly. Five, Sally corrected. There are five children ranging from one year to age fourteen. Derek was suddenly bombarded by an image of Cynthia holding a screaming little one, packing lunches and dealing with the throes of teenage angst from the oldest. A snort of laughter escaped him. It was rude. It was wrong. It was incredibly funny. He tried to hold another one in, but failed. She was so doomed. This confident, savvy dragon of a lawyer was out of her league. What is so funny? Cynthia's voice cut across him like a whiplash. Even that didn't stop his chuckles. You, as a mom, trying to bag lunches, making sure they do their homework, talking to teachers in PTA meetings? Do you even know how to cook? I can microwave? She stared at him like he was the lowest worm. He should feel like one for laughing during her time of sorrow, but it was too delicious. He blamed it on lack of sleep and lack of empathy for her. Another set of chuckles escaped him, and he wiped his eyes. Microwaving isn't going to cut it. You've got five mouths to feed. Do you know how to cook? She tilted her head at him, a calculating look in her eye. He missed it. He should have been paying more attention before he admitted such a personal detail. Yes, I know how to cook. Nothing fancy, but I'll never starve. Good to know, she stared shrewdly at him. What do you know about raising kids? Oh, no, Derek was on to her now. 
I'm already a paralegal and filling in for your PA. I am not about to play nanny as well. I wasn't about to suggest that, Cynthia replied defensively. Derek knew differently. If she thought she could add more to his already full plate of work from her, she was out of her mind. Excuse me? Sally intervened. Miss Stone, I would like to meet with you as soon as possible, today even, to discuss the custody of the children and the estate of your sister. Yes, Cynthia pulled her attention back to the cell phone and Mrs. Winthrop. Derek, cancel all of my appointments for the rest of the day. I'll need the car service to bring me to Mrs. Winthrop's office. They set up a time, and Derek saw to the arrangements. He knew he was going to use the rest of the day to try to catch up. Maybe he'd manage to get home before nine and get a good night's sleep. Another part of him thought that maybe, just maybe for the first time since he'd known her, Cynthia might take a day off work for the funeral. Surely he could work just a regular nine to five that day. A nice eight-hour day where he could sleep in and go to bed on time. It was sad when a man fantasized about sleep rather than a woman. Derek sighed. How's it going, Kramer? Lonnie DeWelt hung a lean arm over the edge of Derek's cubicle. Fine. You? Derek tried to be quick and direct. First, because he didn't have time to chat it up. There was a pile of files to go through on his desk. Second, because Lonnie was a loser. It was a mean thing to say, but entirely accurate. I'm booming, man, Lonnie grinned, showing her crooked teeth. My boss is moving up. Rumor has it. Pete's going to replace Jameson when Jameson goes to senior partner. Good for you, Derek replied curtly. Great. That meant Lonnie was going to be joining the farm of little cubicles where Derek worked. Wonderful. As if this weekly doses weren't enough, now he was going to have to deal with the guy daily. Hey, sorry to hear about your boss, Lonnie pretended sympathy. Her getting passed up like that. You guys work so hard you make the rest of us look lazy. Derek endured the fake laugh from Lonnie with as much grace as he could muster. It wasn't much. Thanks. It's too bad she's a woman. The men won't let a woman play a man's game. She'd have made senior partner years ago otherwise. Lonnie held up his hands in a crude gesture. It's the melons. She's too sexy. Instead of listening to her presentations, everyone's imagining her without her. Derek stood abruptly and grabbed Lonnie by the shoulder, steering him toward the staff room. Hey, Lonnie, don't you like maple donuts? There's some in the staff room. You should check them out before they're all gone. You're a good guy, Derek, Lonnie remarked, allowing himself to be pushed along. The other guys say you've got no guts. Bit of a mama's boy letting stone trample all over you. But I've always said you're just padding the resume until you can get to help a better man. Derek gave Lonnie a pat on the back as he pushed him gently into the staff room. He beat a hasty retreat back to his own desk every day with Lonnie in the same space. He wondered if he was being punished for something. Derek, now! Cynthia poked her head out of her office and then retreated back in after summoning him. He sighed. He wasn't a mama's boy. He was just whipped. Yes, Derek closed the door behind him, pulling out his cell just in case she wanted him to take notes. Cynthia grabbed her purse. We're going to see Mrs. Winthrop. The car should be downstairs. Did you check? Had he checked to see if the car was there? No. He'd been fending off the village idiot. Derek lied through his teeth. It's there. Wait, had she said we? Why was he going to the appointment? He needed to get caught up on his own work, not follow her around like some puppy. Good, Cynthia slung her purse over her shoulder. She waited as he opened the door for her, then strode forth, expecting him to follow in her wake. He was totally whipped, Derek thought. How demoralizing. Then again, she did pay the bills. Derek followed her. He saw Lonnie stuffing his face with a sprinkled donut. Someone had splurged and gotten fresh ones, and Derek had missed it. He popped an antacid. Chapter 2 The children have been staying with members of the church community that the Roms belonged to, Sally explained as they sat in her office. I'd like to have them transferred into your custody as soon as possible to help ease the transition away from those families. Each child has an education fund, which will continue to grow from the trust fund set up. Excuse me, Cynthia interrupted. Where am I supposed to house them if I take them? 
What do you mean, if you take them? Derek looked at her in surprise. Why wouldn't you have custody of them? Kids weren't exactly in my life plan, Cynthia responded dryly. You know what will happen if you don't. He frowned as he remembered his own childhood. They'll go into foster care. Maybe the youngest will get adopted, but the rest will be in the system until they're eighteen. As good as some foster parents are, there are bad ones out there, too. Maybe my uncle will take them, she shrugged uncertainly. The old guy who's about to retire because he has Parkinson's? Derek wondered what Cynthia was thinking. When it came to the law, she was a genius. This? He seriously wondered where she was going to do in her state of mind. Sally sensed that Derek was on her side, and she gave him a more friendly smile than the ice-cold one she'd given him before when they'd first met. The Roms family home is more than large enough to keep the children, the pets, and both of you. Pets? Cynthia frowned as she remembered the menagerie of animals Alicia tended to keep. Both of us? echoed Derek with a bit of alarm. Whoa, we are not together. I'm sorry, I thought you had that feel about you. Sally paused like a couple. What pets? Cynthia persisted. She remembered a couple of dogs and a bird, but Alicia had a habit of adopting stray animals. Everything could have changed since her last visit. Sally regathered her thoughts. A couple dogs, a cat, a hamster, some fish, the usual. I can't have animal hair on my suits. Cynthia pursed her lips like they were sucking on a particularly bad lemon. Oh, and the parrot, Sally added as an afterthought. A parrot? Derek was starting to like the deceased Alicia and Guy. They seemed as far removed from Cynthia's type A personality as possible. That's cool. Is it potty trained? Cynthia inquired. She couldn't remember it from her last visits what the bird did with its business. Surely she wouldn't have to look after that. I'm sure the oldest children know how to deal with the bird, Sally tried to reassure her. Obviously, you've met all of the children before, so I'd like to set up a meeting between you and your caseworker. Most of them, Cynthia muttered. Caseworker? Yes, Sally continued. The children have a caseworker assigned to them to look out for their best interests. She will occasionally visit to make sure that things are progressing nicely. Derek remembered what it was like to have a caseworker. He'd gone through several. Who is she? Sally looked at him in a bit of confusion. If you're not romantically involved, then why are you here, Mr. Kramer? I'm her paralegal, he clarified. He's my P.A., Cynthia effectively demoted him to Missy's status. There was nothing wrong with being a P.A. It just wasn't his job. Derek chose to keep his mouth shut. He didn't need to get into any sort of disagreement about his job status in front of another attorney. He idly wondered if Sally was hiring... Then again, with the way he initially put her off, there was more chance of him becoming Santa than getting a job here. Okay, Sally decided to drop the matter. We also need to talk about the funerals. With Guy being estranged and your parents being deceased, the final decisions of the funeral will fall to you, Cynthia. I've never planned a funeral, Cynthia frowned. Is there someone we could hire? Like a wedding planner? Sally seemed a little non-pulsed for a moment. Most of the details have already been taken care of with the pre-planned funerals that Guy and Alicia had already purchased. However, it would be nice if you took a personal interest. You could meet with the pastor to select hymns and verses. There's a budget set aside for flowers. Pamphlets will need to be printed. Did you write that down? Cynthia looked at Derek. He grabbed his cell phone and started to take notes. He'd never been to a funeral. It sounded complicated. I'll give you the contact information, but it will be up to you to see to arranging the final specifics. Sally rummaged for a page and held it out. Cynthia passed it to Derek. He quickly folded it and put it away for later. He wondered if there was a crash course on how to handle a funeral, something that was ten minutes or less. Derek would possibly find some how-to lists on the Internet. If she's available, you'll meet the caseworker tomorrow. Then the children can be released into your care. Here are the keys for Alicia and Guy's home. Sally handed them to Cynthia. The children are the sole beneficiaries of the estate. However, you have been granted a fund to use for the cost of their care. Since you are a fellow lawyer, I'll send you the paperwork rather than explain it. Well, that sounds good, Cynthia nodded. She didn't see any point in wasting both their time when she could have her own lawyer look over the particulars. 
Sally hesitated. "'Miss Stone, I know that this whole thing has come as a shock, and that you are expecting to become a guardian. However, you need to decide if this commitment is what you want to take on. These kids need someone to be permanently in their lives, especially since they've lost both parents so quickly.' They're Alicia's kids, Cynthia stated. She remembered what Derek said about the children going into foster care. If there really was no one else, she guessed they were stuck with her. Of course I'm going to help them. Cynthia, Sally persisted, they are going to become your kids. You will essentially be their mom. Are you ready to commit to that? Cynthia thought for a moment. She looked at Derek. What if I'm not any good at it? I'm not exactly maternal. They need you, he said simply. There is no one else. She strengthened her resolve and faced Sally. I'll do it. The meeting with the caseworker was set for the very next day. The day after that, Cynthia would go and collect the kids. It would be a time of big changes. Cynthia decided to take Derek along as reinforcement. Not that she was going to tell him that. He thought she needed him to take notes or talk over cases in the car, trying to catch up on their always overloaded work schedule. Cynthia thrived on her job. Now she wondered if having five kids was going to interfere with her career. Maybe she would get Derek to hire a nanny. It would be expensive, but well worth the money if she didn't have to worry about diapers and whatever other stuff children needed. Yes, a nanny was definitely what she needed preferably someone without a home life who wanted to move right in and adopt Alicia's little clan. Maybe two of them. Then Cynthia could keep running her life as she saw fit. Derek and she talked over the Underhill case and what the interview with the new clients had revealed. They also discussed what angles to take in the courtroom, Derek taking furious notes to type out for her later. When they arrived at the social services building, Cynthia frowned at the drab gray brick. It looked very depressing and old compared to the glass law firm where she worked. The driver helped her out of the vehicle. She went into the building with Derek in her wake, giving her information to reception. They were told to wait in the lobby for the social worker that was taking on the ROMS case. Cynthia took a seat, continuing to lob things out for Derek to write down. She was so into her work that she didn't notice the approach of someone until Derek cleared his throat pointedly. Oh, Cynthia leapt to her feet, extending her hand, and looked in disappointment at Allison Greenwald. Allison, how good to see you. I wish I could say the same. Allison did not shake her hand. It was a pointed gesture. Please call me Mrs. Greenwell. Okay, then, Mrs. Greenwell. Cynthia stood up a little taller. Are you here to take me to the caseworker who is handling the ROMS custody case? I am your caseworker. Allison allowed a malicious smile. She tilted her head. Why don't we go to my office? Said the spider to the fly, Derek thought briefly. Allison Greenwell was a scary woman, scarier than Cynthia, and that was saying a lot. The two women had faced each other in court numerous times, and it was safe to say that neither was a fan of the other's work. Derek didn't think this was going to go well. Sure, Cynthia put a smile on her face. It was entirely fake, but at least she was trying. They followed Allison to her office. Oh, he doesn't need to come in. Allison looked at Derek dismissively. He's just your PA. This is personal business. He's my paralegal, and I require him to be present at this meeting. Cynthia gave her tone a slight edge. Allison stood firm, knowing she was wielding all the power in this particular encounter. I'm sorry. I just don't see what benefit his presence would be. I can just wait in the lobby. Derek offered, but the two women ignored him. He takes notes from me, Cynthia said sweetly, not backing down. I depend on him to remember things that I don't. Getting a little older, Miss Stone? Is your memory not what it used to be? Allison looked at her with false concern. If you're experiencing early onset Alzheimer's, I'll have to ask you to take a medical to make certain you are fit to retain custody of these children. Cynthia's teeth clamped. I'm perfectly mentally cognitive, thank you. Just to clarify, Allison faked smiled. The PA can stay in the lobby. Which is what I suggested, Derek chimed in. Fine, Cynthia growled, knowing that round one had gone to Allison. Excellent, Allison said smugly. Please follow me. Derek wasn't sure, but he might have heard Cynthia growl as she passed him. He did not envy Allison Greenwell. 
He slouched in one of the uncomfortable lobby chairs, working from his phone to put a dent in their caseloads. Forty minutes later, Cynthia returned. Is the car ready? she asked curtly. How would he know? He had no idea how long their meeting was going to take. Maybe, Derek called the car service. Five minutes. Cynthia huffed. Where's the nearest coffee place? I need something sweet. Two minutes later, they were in line at the nearest coffee house chain, and Derek was redirecting the car to their location. Do you know what that woman said? Cynthia couldn't contain herself any more. She practically vibrated with frustrated energy. No, I wasn't there, Derek commented on the obvious as he waited to unhold with the car company. She doesn't think I'm fit to be a garden to these kids. She thinks I'm going to fail. Cynthia glared at the person in front of her, who happened to look back. The man quickly turned around again. I never fail at anything I choose to do. Derek chose not to comment. It was probably better that way. Just because we had a small disagreement in court doesn't mean that she can be such a self-righteous snob. She's looking down her nose at me. She expects me to suck at this. Cynthia growled and tapped her foot. Disagreement in court? Cynthia had torn Allison to pieces on the stand. Obviously, she still bore a grudge. I am not going to fail. I'm going to be the best aunt there ever was, Cynthia grumbled. Really? When? Right now, their schedule is looking pretty full. Aren't you going to say anything? She turned to him expectantly. Yes, I'd like to change the address to where we are getting picked up, Derek informed the car service, who had thankfully picked up the phone in time so that he didn't have to respond to Cynthia's question. She probably didn't want his honest opinion. He made the arrangements so the car would meet them when they were done here. Well, she demanded as he ended the call. Well, what? Derek tried to look puzzled. He wasn't sure he succeeded. Sometimes it played to play the I'm not paying attention because I'm a guy card. She rolled her eyes and gave a huff of annoyance before turning to place her order with the clerk. Derek waited for his turn, then placed his order. He barely got his before Cynthia was ready to leave. Order me that Parenting for Dummies book, she told him. I'm going to need all the tips I can get if I'm going to win. She won't even let me hire a nanny. A nanny, for pity's sake. Lots of people get nannies. Derek sighed. Parenting isn't about winning. You can't win or lose as a parent. Cynthia frowned. Really? Are you sure about that? Yes, he said dryly. He'd order the book anyway, since it just might help her. Then again, she'd just tell him to read it and inform her of the important parts. Better that he get the cliff notes. Then how do I stick it to Allison? She wondered, a frown marring her face. By doing what you can for these kids? Derek shrugged. Shouldn't be about winning against Allison. It should be about helping your nieces and nephews. Their car arrived, and Derek got the door for her. Soon they were on their way. I get the kids tomorrow. Cynthia took a bite out of her Danish. You need to talk to the pastor, florist, and a printing company today. Allison is watching, Derek reminded her. This is your sister and brother-in-law. You need to be making these decisions on these arrangements. That means you need to be involved. Cynthia sighed, leaning back against the car seat. I hate funerals. That doesn't change the fact that you need to be there, he pointed out. Fine, Cynthia chewed her pastry with vigor. Great, Derek gave the driver instructions on where the funeral home was. We'll start by talking to the funeral director. Cynthia ate the last bite of her Danish. I should have bought a whole box instead of just one. It's going to be that sort of day. Derek privately agreed. He offered her the extra donut he'd bought on a hunch that she was going to need it. She took it. They made the rounds to the funeral home, the florist, the pastor. When they reached the printers, they hit a snag. While they could fill in many of the details of the funeral after talking to the pastor, they needed a photo of the couple. Cynthia didn't have one. Since she'd been given a key by Sally Winthrop, Derek suggested that they look for an appropriate photo at the Roms' house. It was a large house in an older gated community. Derek, who had only ever lived in the inner city, looked at it in appreciation. It looked like any wholesome home on television. Cynthia opened the front door and they both went in. When's the last time you were here? Derek asked as he took in the quiet and empty atmosphere. Thanksgiving, Cynthia replied. It was eerie how quiet it was. Every time she visited it, it was like a zoo with all the kids and animals. 
Since you take it off, I usually come here if I manage to get caught up at work. You don't bring any work with you? Derek was surprised. She seemed like the type that would bring work with her everywhere, including on vacation. Then again, Derek didn't think either of them had gone on vacation in the past eight years. There's no point. Cynthia went to the living room and started looking through the photo books. It's always too noisy and distracting here. Wait until the kids and pets come, then you'll understand. Then he'd understand? Whoa, wait a minute, Derek thought. Excuse me? I don't need to be here. This is your gig. Cynthia flashed him an unamused smile. Oh no, if I'm going to do this, you're going to help. Not in my job description, he pointed out as he looked through another photo book. What about this one? That's ten years old. Something current. Cynthia rejected it. You're hereby promoted to honorary uncle. That means you get to help. No. Derek snapped the book shut. Absolutely not. I have enough to do. I'll give you a ten percent raise, Cynthia said mildly as she continued searching. Ten percent. Derek blinked. I'm in. Good. Cynthia held up her book, showing him a photograph. We'll use this one. Are you sure? You don't want to go through the rest of the books and make certain that's the right photo? He asked. This is the one I want. Cynthia brushed past him. She looked around the house from the foyer. It's not right. Them not being here? It's not about right or wrong. Derek put the photo book he'd been looking at back and joined her. It just is. Cynthia swallowed thickly and led the way out of the house. Derek sighed. He should be working. He had dealt with the insurance company of the ROMs, submitting an obituary to the papers, then confirmed details with the pastor for the pallbearers and the ushers before giving the information to the printing company. His regular work had piled up, and he certainly had enough to keep himself busy for the next few hours. Instead, he looked over the farm of cubicles to see where the action was. Today, Henny was floating around with donuts. She was cackling at something Roger said— Derek could see her practically preening her feathers trying to gain Ruddy Roger's attention. He was more interested in the donuts than her. His mustache twitched and his beady eyes looked over the choices as Henny squawked on about the differences between the strawberry twist or the raspberry-filled powdered ones. Derek likened her to a hen and him to a weasel. Ah, there was Merle as always, popping her head up over her cubicle to take in the action. She wrinkled her nose in distaste, showing off her prominent overbite before descending straight down. Henny, ever gracious, offered Derek a donut. He took one because he didn't want to offend her. Also, they were delicious, so it really didn't hurt his feelings to eat one. As Henny moved on, Merle popped her head back up like the groundhog Derek sometimes imagined her to be. Those things will kill you, she snapped off a bite of celery. Cholesterol. Derek nodded knowingly. I plan on a heart attack three days before my retirement. I hope you'll be there. She glared at him through her glasses and descended downward again. Minnie brushed by Henny to scoop a donut. Mmm. There was no polite way to say of what he thought of Minnie. She wasn't small. He often likened her to an Angus cow. Not because of her weight. Actually, she'd gone through a period where she dieted and exercised, losing a great deal of weight. Unfortunately, she was a much happier woman when she ate chocolate in large quantities, which she did often, causing her to gain the weight back. Derek happened to think she was awesome when she wasn't pining for cocoa, and since she'd given up on her latest diet, she was much easier to get along with. No, it wasn't her size, which did look beautiful on her. It was the way she chewed and chewed and chewed, like a cow chewing her cud. She took a bite of the donut, and it took her fifty chews before she would swallow. Derek knew, because he counted. He shook his head and watched as she moved slowly onward, still chewing. It really was a cubicle farm. Hey, Derek, Bob leaned over the cubicle. Hey, do you have any staples, hey man? Hey, Bob, Derek replied. He couldn't help return the hey each time Bob said it. Derek searched through his drawer and handed the beleaguered little man with the goatee a pack of staples. How's it going? Hey, it's a rough day. Bob shook his spindly little head and disappeared. A moment later, Derek heard a stapler and staple scatter all over the floor. Hey! Derek smirked. The pygmy goat. Lonnie caught him smirking and gave him a laugh at Bob's predicament. Derek, do you know if I should get these documents notarized before I file them? Derek pretended to have a look. 
Well, Lonnie, I'd last Pete before you do anything. Sometimes you need clarification. When I get those types of documents, I usually make sure what Miss Stone wants done with them before I walk away. They were just for filing, but hey, if Lonnie wanted to risk his boss Pete because neither of them knew their job, who was Derek to stop them from annoying each other? Besides, Lonnie was like the farm dog, licking and sniffing where he shouldn't. Let him find out if his master was in a good or bad mood today. Merle popped up, nose twitching, then quickly popped back down, a sure sign that the groundhog had spotted danger. Derek quickly shoved the donut to the side and began typing. A moment later, Mr. Stone Sr. strode past, tall, thin, his close-cut fringe showing off his balding head. What was that portrait called, with the farm and his wife with that pitchfork? There went Farmer Stone, and all the little animals pretended to behave in his presence. Derek briefly wondered what animal he played in all this. He hoped it was the fox. He is rather partial to that idea. Derek, office! Cynthia strode past. He sighed and grabbed his phone for note-taking before following her. He was not a fox. He was probably the tired old draft horse, sore and neglected, but still being put to harness to work a full day in the hot sun. That was depressing. And Cynthia was definitely a dragon. As soon as Derek closed the office door, Cynthia frowned at him. "'Do you have a license?' she immediately inquired. "'Excuse me?' Derek asked. He was a little surprised by this line of questioning. "'A driver's license. Do you have one?' Cynthia repeated. "'Yes,' he said cautiously. It was dusty. Derek didn't know what he'd been thinking even bothering to take the test years ago. He lived almost downtown. He worked downtown. It was prohibitively costly to own a car in the inner city, so Derek had never bothered. "'Good,' she sighed in relief. "'Do you have one?' Derek inquired. Now he was concerned. She didn't expect him to drive, did she? Yes. It just occurred to me that it would be best if we both were able to drive, especially now that there's going to be a commute, Cynthia frowned. You should find out from my building if I can sublease my condo. If not, I'm going to have to put it on the market. There's no point in keeping it if I'm going to be moving in with the kids. Allison was adamant the kids remain in their own home. She won't let me move them to a bigger condo downtown. Five kids. Do you really think you're going to find a downtown condo big enough? Derek said dryly. With enough money, you can do anything. Cynthia gave him a look like he was silly. I haven't driven in ten years, Derek warned her. What? She looked at him in surprise. I don't have insurance either. He thought she should be informed. Then you need to get some lessons and get some insurance. Cynthia dismissed his concerns with a wave of her hand. She stopped as a thought came to her. It's probably like riding a bike. It'll come back to you with a little practice. What is it? Derek had a suspicious of her sudden pause. He wondered when he was going to schedule in driving lessons, since he didn't think it was going to be anything like riding a bicycle. Cars were much bigger and went a lot faster. I'm going to have to give up my car. Cynthia sat down in her chair with a thump. It's a two-seater. Derek sat, crossing his legs and watching her. I love my car. It's brand new. She looked at him in alarm. It has sunroof, leather, all the gadgets. It's not a mom car, Derek said sagely. He was enjoying this. Cynthia sucked in a breath of horror. I'm going to have to get a minivan. He nodded with glee. Derek shouldn't be happy at her reaction, but it was priceless. I'm going to become one of those soccer moms, baking cookies for PTA functions, going to school plays that have bad acting, ferrying the kids around in a minivan. She leaned back and put a hand to her forehead. This is a disaster. Derek shrugged. He could think of worse things to happen, but if she was this fixated about a minivan, he'd play into her fears. Be sure you get one of those DVD players in the back to keep the kids quiet. Otherwise, you'll just be trapped in there with them talking to you. They have those? She tilted her head and looked at him with hope. He nodded. How are you going to schedule all this? I mean, buying a van, all the kids' programs. You know each kid is probably going to have their own specific activity that they belong to. This is going to eat into your work time. You're helping me, she pointed a finger at him. I'm giving you a raise, remember? He certainly did. There was no way she was going to let him forget it. That doesn't mean that we can keep working at the same pace. We need to reduce our clientele and caseload. 
otherwise neither of us is going to have time for these kids. With Allison breathing down her neck, Cynthia knew they had to be her first priority. What about the Barnes case? We're supposed to meet them for the preliminary interview tomorrow. You'll have to pass, Derek shrugged. Let someone else have it. She pouted. It's an open and shut case. It won't even be hard. That may be, but we've got more than we can handle right now, Derek said. You've got a funeral in two days. You're going to get the kids tomorrow. Life as you know it has changed. He stood up, but paused at the door. You'd better get on that minivan shopping. Derek chuckled when she threw her stress ball at him as he exited the office. Chapter 3 Allison made them wait forty minutes in the lobby, claiming she was running behind. Cynthia didn't believe her for a second. However, when Allison did come, it didn't stop Cynthia from smiling and being gracious in her greeting. She'd kill her with kindness if that's what it took. Allison also put on her fake smile. If you'll just follow me, I've arranged to have the kids and pets to be at the Rom's residence. That way I can inspect the home. What do you need to inspect the home? Cynthia asked. I always inspect the home of the children appointed to my cases, Allison said. It's procedure. I'll also be making regular visits, both scheduled and unscheduled, until I feel comfortable leaving the children in your care. Surely that's not necessary. Cynthia forcibly kept her smile on her face. I'm the children's aunt, not some foster parent or stranger. From what I can gather, you've been a bit of a stranger in the children's life. Allison remarked curtly, they hardly know you since you only visit once or twice a year. I intend to supervise your situation closely. Wonderful, thought Cynthia. She wanted to protest, but one look from Derek had her deciding not to. Derek was better with people than she was. Cynthia tended to take cues from him on how to effectively handle people outside of the courtroom. That sounds great. They all knew she was lying through her teeth. However, Allison could never say that she wasn't cooperative. Cynthia and Derek got into the new minivan that she had rented for the day. The dealership wasn't ready for her to pick up the one that she had purchased, so she'd gone with a rental just in case she needed to transport the kids from the social services building to her sister's house. Cynthia knew that she was going to have to move in. For now, she just had a couple of suitcases of necessities. She didn't want to feel like this was a permanent thing. That her sister was really gone. She wasn't ready to face that. By pretending it was all temporary, it was easier to take each step, even if she was lying to herself. Pulling up in front of the house, Cynthia took a deep breath. "'Are you ready?' Derek asked her quietly. He'd been silent for the entire trip, and she was grateful for that. Sometimes he could read her and know exactly what she needed, like when he'd gotten the extra pastry the other day. She knew her thighs didn't need it, and she'd done extra time with her home gym, but it had been exactly what she wanted in the moment. Cynthia nodded. She grabbed her purse and went forward to where Allison was waiting. Remember, Allison said, these kids are grieving. They probably won't accept you at first. It's going to take a lot of time and patience to integrate your lives together. Don't push them. Respect their boundaries. Okay. Cynthia tried to remember all of that. For some silly reason, she felt nervous. She was used to being under high pressure, yet here she was, worried about meeting kids she already knew. I can do that. Allison gave her a look that conveyed her doubts, before opening the door. A couple of dogs greeted them with loud barks. Boomer! Digger! A little girl ran forward to grab the dogs, ineffectually by their collars. Hi, Aunt Cynthia! Hi. Cynthia couldn't remember the kid's name. It started with an S. They all did. That was one thing that she thought was odd. Why Alicia would want all her kids to start with the same letter in the alphabet, Cynthia didn't know. This is Sarah. Allison gave her a look, which clearly said Cynthia was in over her head. I know, Cynthia said defensively. Hi, Sarah. Sarah giggled. You already said hi. I did, didn't I? Cynthia smiled. Why don't you take me to the rest of the group? Cynthia tried to remember as many names starting with S as she could. Sally, Susie, Sylvie, Sean, Sherry, Cheryl, Sam. None of them sounded quite right. She knew she couldn't bluff her way through this. One, because kids were offended if you couldn't remember something as basic as their names. 
too, because Allison Greenwell breathing down her neck. Okay, Sarah let go of the dogs and led Cynthia into the living room. There were the four other children with a pair of adults. Cynthia introduced herself to the adults. Cynthia Stone. Good to meet you, Miss Stone. The male extended his hand. John Devent. This is my wife, Lucy. Hello. Lucy shook Cynthia's hand. It's been a pleasure taking care of the children. Thank you for looking after them, Cynthia said. She smiled at the kids who watched her. Serena, that was the oldest girl's name. Hello, Serena. Hi, responded the girl dully. She didn't particularly look pleased with what was happening. Cynthia could relate a little. Cynthia looked at the boy with the glasses. Hi, Simeon? Simon, he responded with a frown. Cynthia winced. Sorry about that. Simon, why don't you introduce me to your siblings? Serena, Sarah, Sean, and Serenity is the baby. He pushed his glasses up his nose. And I'm Simon. Thank you, Cynthia said. Who is he? Sarah asked curiously. Cynthia looked to see she was pointing at Derek. This is Derek Kramer. He's my assistant. Paralegal, thought Derek ruefully. Not that any of the kids would probably know what that meant. Hi, nice to meet you. Hi, they chorused back with varying degrees of enthusiasm. Allison stepped forward, clearing her throat to get everyone's attention. Your aunt will be taking care of you. She will be your primary caregiver and guardian. I'll continue to visit you to see how you are all progressing together as a family. Does it have to be her? Serena asked with a pout. Couldn't the Devons keep us? Your parents have entrusted you to the care of your aunt Cynthia, Allison said. It was their wish that she look after you. I'm sure you're in very good hands, John Devont commented to Serena. As much as we have enjoyed taking care of you, it's time for your Aunt Cynthia to look after you. I'm sure she will do an excellent job. Thank you. Cynthia gave him a grateful smile. Just then, a parrot swooped into the room, flapping its wings and diving at random people. Why is Peanuts loose? yelled Simon as he jumped up from the couch, chasing after the bird. Allison shrieked as it tried to land on her head. Serena laughed. Boomer and Digger barked in excitement. Sarah jumped up and down on the sofa. Bad bird! Bad peanuts! 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 The bird squawked. Get it away from me! Allison screeched. Cynthia didn't much like the bird either, but she was starting to like it more since it was attacking Allison. He likes your perfume, John Devon said, trying to catch the parrot, but the bird swooped away from him. Derek tried to duck out of Peanut's path, putting up his hands to shield himself from the creature. However, Peanut took that as an invitation to land, and perched himself on one of Derek's outstretched hands. He stared at the parrot, a little afraid of it. What do I do with it? Cynthia grabbed a throw blanket and quickly covered the bird like she'd seen Alicia do numerous times. Plucking it off of Derek's hand, she offered the bundle to Simon. Would you like to put him away? Please, lock his cage so we know he won't get out. Thanks, Aunt Cynthia. Simon said with relief as he grabbed Peanuts. I don't know how he got out. I suppose we'll have to open some of the cans of food for the cats and tempt them back out of their hiding places. Cynthia sighed. Cat food smelled, in her opinion. However, every time Peanut was loose and on the rampage, the cats dove for cover. It took hours for them to come out again. Someone should let the dogs out into the backyard until they've calmed down. I'll go do that, Sarah volunteered as she jumped off the couch. Don't jump off the furniture. It's not good for it. She stopped talking as she realized everyone was staring at her. What? I guess you might just get the hang of this after all, Allison said grudgingly. I'm just saying what Alicia would if she were here, Cynthia shrugged. By the way, your hair is a mess. You should comb it. Allison glared at her and patted her head. Thanks. Alicia would have said that too, Cynthia responded. Maybe Alicia wouldn't have, but... How would Allison know? Plus, it felt so good to say the words. Petty, but good. Mrs. Greenwell, I'd like to thank you for coming over, but I think we can manage from here. Allison gave an unhappy smile at the dismissal. I'll be back on Thursday at five to see how you cope with dinner time. I'm sure we'll be fine, Cynthia gritted her teeth in a smile.
Truth was, she didn't cook. Not really. She warmed things up in the microwave. Cynthia would have to figure something out. If Mr. Kramer's going to be in the habit of being around the children, I'll need a vulnerable person's check from him, Allison said sweetly. One can never be too careful. I can provide that, Derek said coolly. He'd never been in any trouble with the law, so he was confident he could get the documentation without any hassle. Good, Allison nodded. Children, if you need to contact me, my office number is on the fridge. I have a question, Derek looked to Allison. Are there any allergies? Are there any medications the children are on? Any medical conditions we need to be aware of? Any special appointments? How about their schedule for school and other activities? Lucy Devant held out a group of paperwork. I wrote everything down that wasn't on Alicia's mom's calendar. There's no allergies. Serenity just went for a yearly checkup, so she's good to go for a little while. The pediatrician's number and address is there. So is the school's information. Derek automatically took the paperwork. Thank you. This will be very helpful. You should give that to Miss Stone, Allison stated smugly. After all, until your vulnerable check comes into my office, I'd rather not have you around the children. We can't be too careful these days. You understand. Cynthia knew Allison was just trying to press a point, leaving her alone with the kids, hoping she'd give up or fail. I've known Mr. Kramer for years. He's been above reproach. That may be, but this is about the children, Allison insisted. I entirely understand, Derek said smoothly. He handed the paperwork to Cynthia. I would expect no less. Derek wasn't going to get into this power struggle between the two women. It would only take a few days for the vulnerable person's check to come through the local police office, and he'd be happy to hand it to Allison personally, perhaps with a friendly reminder that Allison was going against the wrong woman. One did not go up against a dragon without being properly armed and Allison certainly wasn't carrying the right weapon or shields. Derek's money was on Cynthia, even if she was out of her depths. Cynthia frowned at him. "'It was great to meet you all,' Derek said to the kids, Mr. and Mrs. Devon. He exited gracefully, with the Devons not too far on his heels. "'I hope we'll see Cynthia and the children at church,' Lucy commented. "'You're more than welcome to join us.' "'That's kind of you.' Derek got the details of where the church was and when the service was. He'd have to put it into Cynthia's planner so she remembered to take the kids. Do the ROMs regularly attend? Yes, John answered. Guy was a volunteer usher on occasion. They were very involved in the church then. Derek wondered how Cynthia was going to take that. I'll talk to Cynthia about it. They said their goodbyes, and Derek took out his phone to call cab when Allison came up to him. I hope there are no hard feelings about that, my asking for a police check to clear you, Allison said. Nope, none at all, Derek gave her a friendly smile. It's your job to protect the kids. I wish all caseworkers were as conscientious. Thanks, Allison sighed. How do you work for her? She's so... She's efficient, and sometimes ruthless in the courtroom, Derek shrugged. She likes to win. Yeah, I know that, Allison said ruefully. Hey, do you need a ride back into the city? Sure. Derek thought the irony was funny. She didn't want him around the kids without a police check, but she was willing to let him in her car without one. For all she knew, he had a criminal record or a habit of assaulting women. He didn't. However, she didn't know that for certain. Then again, he wasn't about to pass up a free ride rather than pay cab fare. Plus, he wanted to see just how she was going to pump him for information to use against Cynthia. No doubt, that was her ulterior motive. Derek wasn't disappointed. A few streets into their journey, Allison casually asked, How long have you worked for Miss Stone? Eight years, Derek told the truth. It was easy enough to check to see by simply calling the firm. Other than disliking Allison, there was no reason to lie anyway. That's quite a long time. I guess you'd say that you know her pretty well, she commented with an assumed air of innocence. I guess so. Derek didn't give much away. He wanted Allison to work for it. He watched the city pass them by. She's a piece of work, isn't she? Allison prodded. Derek decided to agree. Cynthia can be demanding and driven, especially at her job. I'm just going to say it. Allison decided to get to the point. We both know Cynthia isn't the best choice for these kids. 
She's not exactly parenting material. She's too selfish and self-absorbed to take care of the children properly. I would appreciate it if you could assist me with any tips or testimony that will get these kids into a better situation. Derek almost smiled. At least she was being honest. You want me to spy on Cynthia and let you know when she messes up. Essentially, yes. Allison gave him a glance, trying to gauge his reaction. That would mean you'd have to waive the need for a vulnerable person's check, Derek shrugged. Otherwise, you're going to miss the prime time for her to mess up while we wait for the paperwork to come through. Right now, she's inexperienced and most likely to have errors, especially with the stress from the funerals. Allison nodded. I see your point. I suppose I could excuse the need for a police check. That's very kind of you, Derek remarked. Personally, he would have preferred that she stuck to her guns and made him get the vulnerable person's check. He would have respected her more for it. I'm going to need something that will stand up in court, Allison made a turn. We both know that she likes to win and she'll contest any custody decisions I make. She'll say it was prejudiced on our previous court encounters. And you aren't? Derek said mildly. Inside, he was disappointed in Allison. It appeared she was going to put her personal agenda ahead of the good of the Rom's kids. That's neither here nor there, she replied curtly. Who gets the kids if Miss Stone is found unfit to be their guardian? he inquired. They'll get put into the system. I'll find them a good foster family, Allison said confidently. The youngest might even get adopted. They'd get split up. Derek knew they would. It happened to a lot of larger families. Probably. It would be better than being under Cynthia's care, Allison stated firmly. I don't see how, Derek pointed to the curb. You can let me out here. What? Allison slowed down, trying to pull over in heavy traffic. I said, I don't see how it would be better for the kids to be split up from each other, especially since they've just lost their parents. In fact, I think it would be detrimental to them to lose each other as well. Derek opened the door of the car. As a previous occupant of the foster care system, I have to say there are a lot of foster parents who would be worse choice than Miss Stone. I'll have to respectfully decline your offer to spy on her and report back to you. Allison glared at him. You'll regret this. You'll see how she treats those kids and will come to regret your choice today. Derek pulled out his phone. I don't think so, Miss Greenwell. In fact, I've been recording this little conversation of ours and intend to give it to your supervisor so that we can get a caseworker that actually cares about these kids. It will be a refreshing change from our current caseworker, who seems to just be furthering her own agenda of revenge. Get out of my car, she hissed. Gladly. Derek got out and resisted the urge to slam the door. He shut off the voice recording feature on his phone, then called Cynthia. How's it going? Great, she said. A few moments later, she said hushed into the phone. It's the most awkward thing ever. They aren't adults. I can't speak to them like adults. But I'm not going to do that gooey voice junk either. What am I supposed to do? Talk to them like adults, he advised. It's easier for you and them. Where did you go hide? The laundry room, she sighed. What's up? I solved the Allison Greenwald problem. Or at least I will once we visit her supervisor tomorrow. Derek smiled. He was very pleased for himself. You owe me. I owe you, she readily agreed. If he had actually solved the Alice and Greenwald problem, Cynthia was ready to do cartwheels. How did you do it? I think I'll let you be surprised. Derek waved down a taxi. Gotta go. What? Wait, she protested. Derek ended the call and shut off his phone. Let her stew in curiosity. He had work to get done while she was distracted with the kids. He whistled merrily. "'Good day today?' the cabbie asked. "'Excellent day,' Derek replied with a smile. The next day at social services went really well. Cynthia and Derek reported their concern to Mrs. Greenwell's supervisor, Mr. Davidson. Her supervisor defended her. Derek pulled out the phone and let him listen to what Allison had to say. Mr. Davidson was not impressed. He immediately apologized. He offered to oversee their case personally. Cynthia gratefully agreed. Derek gave her suit jacket a little tug when her Mr. Davidson couldn't see it. 
He had already gotten her promise not to press for any punishment for Allison. It would suit her purposes better to be the bigger person in this case. He tugged on the suit to remind her of her promise, because Derek knew it was just killing her not to ask for some sort of reprimand. Cynthia scowled at him as she kept her word to him. He knew that she thought it was worth it as long as Allison Greenwald was permanently off their case. Derek exited the building with a huge smile on his face. "'Okay, I owe you,' Cynthia grudgingly admitted. "'That was genius.' "'That was what?' he cupped a hand to his ear, leaning toward her. "'You heard me the first time,' Cynthia sniffed, even though she was very grateful to him. "'How did this morning go?' Derek asked. "'Did you know that matching socks are no longer a thing?' Now it's cool not to match socks. Cynthia frowned as she complained. When I was a kid, I would have been caught with dead with two different types of socks on. I think you'll find that a lot of things have changed since you were a kid, Derek said dryly. He knew that things had changed somewhat since he was a kid. I guess it went okay overall. Everyone ate and got to school. She shrugged. I didn't know if I was supposed to send them to school or not. I mean, the funeral hasn't happened. Don't people usually stay home until the funeral is over? Then what? Do I stay home from work as well? And now there's family counseling sessions that we'll need to go to, as a family and independently, so the kids can work through their grief. Then there's appointments, kids' clubs. It's crazy. Their lives are more organized than mine. Somehow, Derek doubted that. Cynthia was organized to the minute of each day. They managed to get halfway through the day before Cynthia's phone rang with the secretary from the school on the other end. Simon wasn't feeling very well and had requested to go home. Cynthia insisted that Derek come with them so that they could work in the car during the drive to the school and at her place. Derek grabbed his laptop. "'Why are we getting out here?' Derek asked as they exited the elevators on the ground floor. "'Didn't you order the car service?' Cynthia frowned at him. "'No.' Derek stated calmly. You can't use the company car service to pick up a kid from school. That's not a business use, and the accountants tend to frown on those sorts of things. We use the minivan you rented. Cynthia huffed. We'll be talking business the whole time. I think that's a perfectly acceptable use of the company car service. We're going to be talking business when we're on the drive to the Rom's house after we pick up Simon, who happens to be sick? I highly doubt that. Derek punched the elevator button to go to the parking garage. You did drive in this morning, right? I had to, Cynthia shrugged. No one ordered me the car service to pick me up at the house. Speaking of car services, I need a moving company. You'll have to hire one for me. Miss Stone, that's a personal matter, Derek protested lightly. He had a feeling he was going to be talked into it anyway, but he had to try. That is for you to get set up. You're my P.A., Cynthia countered. I'm your paralegal. I'm just filling in for your PA while she's on vacation, Derek clarified. Your business PA, not your personal one. If you want someone to handle all of your personal schedule items, you should hire one. Missy always did all of my personal stuff. Cynthia hit the panic button on her key fob and followed the amplified sound in the underground parking garage to find the van. She was excellent at what she did. I suppose you're merely mediocre. Still not my job. Derek had to raise his voice to be heard over the car alarm. He put a hand to his ear. It was quite loud with the echoing acoustics. Actually, it is your job right now. Cynthia clicked the alarm off as she unlocked the vehicle. Put it on your to-do list and make it happen. I want a moving company at my condo next weekend so I can put my stuff at Alicia's house. Derek rolled his eyes as he got into the van put it on his list of things to manage. He hoped she didn't expect him to personally oversee the packing and unpacking. When are you getting the new minivan delivered to you? Next week, I get it from the dealership. Cynthia swung out into traffic. At least she'd managed to get that one detail done on her own, Derek thought gratefully. He had enough to do. They talked about cases and technicalities while she drove. Finally, she pulled up in front of the school. Cynthia unclicked her seatbelt and hopped out. Aren't you coming in? Um, no. Derek raised an eyebrow. Why would I? I need a second person on file who is okay to pick up the kids, Cynthia stated. I figured that would be you. Excuse me? Derek frowned. 
These kids are your responsibility. Don't you have other relatives or friends for this? No, Cynthia waited patiently. I can stand here all day, and poor Simon will be missing out on the comfort of his own bed, or you can just come in and get registered. I know what this means, Derek growled. He didn't like being pushed into a corner. It means you're going to expect me to ferry these kids to and from school, that you're going to dump even more responsibilities on me. Cynthia shrugged innocently. The thought did cross my mind. What about your uncle? Derek asked a little desperately. He has Parkinson's and can't drive, she said sweetly. You can order up a car service or a taxi, Derek offered a solution. She rolled her eyes. Do you really see my uncle dealing with children? He's a curmudgeonly old bachelor. You said it yourself when we were talking to Sally Winthrop. He's not fit to raise kids. I meant he shouldn't be anyone's guardian. I didn't mean that he couldn't babysit for a couple of hours for you or be an emergency contact, Derek defended himself. Well, I'm not going to subject the kids to him, Cynthia replied. She knew what he was like since she had to work with him at the firm. Get out of the car and get registered. It'll only take a minute. Is there no one else? Derek didn't want to be responsible for these kids. He didn't even know them. Nope, she answered. You're it. You know as well as I do, I have no personal life. That means I'm choosing you. Great. Derek pulled off his seatbelt reluctantly. Just great. You'll love it. It'll be fun. Cynthia tried to think of what other enthusiastic things she could say to needle him a little bit more. Giving is caring. You can make a difference in these kids' lives. Give it up. A scowling Derek obediently walked beside Cynthia into the school. You're supposed to be their sole guardian, not co-guardianing with me. Sorry about your luck, but you're stuck with me, Cynthia said happily, and by extension, with the kids. Fantastic. Derek didn't muster up any enthusiasm. His fate was sealed. There was no arguing with a dragon. Mrs. Spells, Cynthia greeted the secretary at the school. I've brought along my... Derek waited diligently to see what she'd call him next. He knew it wasn't going to be paralegal. No one let their paralegal pick up their kids from school. My significant other... Derek Kramer, to get registered as a second adult able to intercede on the children's behalf as necessary. Cynthia smiled at the secretary and refused to look at Derek over her big whopper. Derek tried not to choke on his surprise. He didn't quite succeed. Mr. Kramer, are you doing all right? The secretary asked in concern. Fine. <clears throat> Derek cleared his throat and wrapped an arm around Cynthia's waist, pulling her against him. We're great, aren't we, honey? She elbowed him and smiled. Fantastic. Mrs. Spells gave them a funny look, but found the required paperwork to allow the school to release the kids to Derek when necessary. How is Simon? Cynthia asked as Derek began filling out the pages. He's resting in the nurse's office. Simon claims to have a stomachache. The secretary sighed. Poor guy. I think it's just him missing his parents. Cynthia nodded. We all miss Alicia and Guy. We certainly do. Derek had never met them, but he missed them already. Cynthia darted him a look, wondering if he was being sarcastic. However, she smiled at the secretary. Could you give me directions to the nurse's office? I'll go get Simon while Derek finishes here. The secretary happily complied. Derek looked at the paperwork. How long had he known Cynthia? Eight years. How long had they been in a relationship? Eight years. He filled in the information and added his signature with a flourish to the bottom. "'You have a separate address?' the secretary inquired quizzically. "'Yes,' Derek said with sincerely serious expression. Cynthia snores. Loudly. "'We find it easier right now to keep separate residences.' "'Oh!' Mrs. Spell's eyes became round with wonder. "'Has she tried any of those sleep aids?' Derek leaned on the counter and nodded solemnly. Yes, that little nasal strip and the tooth guard thingy. We even tried essential oils. Her doctor is thinking surgery might be her only option, but we're going to give the sleep clinic a try first. That's a good idea, Mrs. Spells responded. I've heard some sleep clinics have had success with certain people. They think she might have sleep apnea and need a CPAP machine, 
Derek invented on the fly. We'll see what the results are after we join the next clinical trial. In the meanwhile, I feel for those poor kids sleeping in the same house. You did seem a little tired today, Mrs. Spell frowned in concern. Derek sighed dramatically. The windows sometimes vibrate when she snores. Wow, Mrs. Spells blinked. Derek nodded, much maligned. He decided to leave off any mentioning of howling dogs or neighbors yelling. He didn't want to overplay the role. It's been a wedge in our relationship. Otherwise, I'm deeply in love with her and find her compatible in every way. Mrs. Spells patted his hand in a motherly fashion. I'm sure you'll figure out a way to get through this. I hope so. Derek gave a small smile. The sleep clinic is giving us hope. The what? Cynthia asked him curiously as she came back into the office, Simon in tow. Darling. Derek wrapped an arm around Cynthia's waist. We should get Simon home. He'd probably like to rest. Cynthia looked a bit confused, but allowed him to steer her and the boy toward the office exit. I'll be praying for you, Mrs. Spells called after them. Thank you. Derek gave the woman a wave as he pressed Simon and Cynthia out into the hallway. Praying for us? Cynthia frowned suspiciously. She's really concerned over Simon, Derek improvised. How are you feeling? Simon shrugged. I just want to go home. We can do that. Cynthia gave Simon a pat on the shoulder. Thank you for listening. Chapter 4 Derek frowned as he looked at the text Cynthia had just sent him. He double-checked the date. It was Sunday. He put the phone up to his ear and waited for Cynthia to pick up. What? Is there a problem? Cynthia asked of him. Kid number four put kid number five down. Derek snorted. They have names. I'll figure that out at some point, Cynthia groused. Why are you calling? I thought I was pretty direct with the text. You were? However, it's Sunday, he reminded her. And? She obviously didn't get what he was trying to point out. Well, I'm guessing the kids usually go to church, Derek said reasonably. Remember what the caseworker said about continuity in their lives? Cynthia sighed. Fine, I'll see you here in a half hour. Whoa, Derek laughed. I'm your paralegal and temporary PA. I have work to do. Recall the text that you just sent me, reminding of all sorts of little tasks that need to get done? I'll pay you time and a half, Cynthia offered conjolingly. You're already paying me time and a half since I've long gone over the 40 hours per week in my contract, he mentioned. I've been meaning to revamp your contract, she said casually, then switched her tone to the negotiator that Derek knew so well. Fine, double time. Just help me with the kids. Done. Derek hung up. It was a no-brainer. More pay, no work. All he had to do was sit through a church sermon. Piece of cake. Forty minutes later, he was ringing the doorbell to the Rom's residence. Simon pulled open the door. She needs help. Oh? Derek raised an eyebrow. She can't even remember our names, Simon complained. It was cereal for breakfast, but then we ran out of milk, so she let Sarah use juice. It was so gross. Did Sarah like it? Derek asked in idle curiosity. Simon wrinkled his nose. I don't think so. She ate it, though. Derek followed Simon to the kitchen and had a look in the cupboards in the fridge. What are you doing? Cynthia asked as she carried Serenity into the kitchen. You're late and now you're looking to mooch breakfast? Derek pulled his head out of the fridge. You do realize that food doesn't just appear. You actually have to go out, buy it, and return it to the kitchen? Of course I know that. Cynthia scowled as she put Serenity down. I'm not entirely undomestic. Just haven't had time. Derek raised an eyebrow as Serenity's diaper drooped down to her ankles. Cynthia cursed. I'm going to duct tape that thing on. Language, Auntie Cynthia, Derek said sweetly. She shot him a glare before scooping up the baby in diaper. Like you could do any better. Derek shrugged. I'm not their uncle. I'm making you their honorary uncle, she shot back grumpily. Wait a minute, didn't I already do that, along with giving you a ten percent raise? As their honorary uncle, I'm reminding you to make these kids a priority and get some groceries to feed them before they rebel. He called after her as she went back to Serenity's room to try to fix the diaper. Simon shared a look with Derek. See what I mean? 
She's in over her head. I totally agree. Derek began to pick up the mess of breakfast, putting dishes in the dishwasher. Help me out here. Simon shrugged and started to clear at the table. Sarah slid into the kitchen on socked feet, a dog chasing after her. Hi, Derek. Look what I get to wear to church today. She had a multicolored rings on her tights, bright bedazzled shoes, a frothy tutu, a hand-drawn unicorn on a tee, and a tiara topping her head. Sarah pushed her hair out of her face and grinned. Wow, Derek's eyes hurt just from looking at her. Did Aunt Cynthia say that was okay, an outfit? Serena says we don't have to listen to Aunt Cynthia since she's not our mom, Sarah informed him. Really? Derek blinked. Cynthia was not going to appreciate that. Yep, the little girl said proudly. While Derek didn't want to squelch on her individuality, he also didn't want her to get made fun of for dressing differently than the other church girls. Plus, it was hard on the eyes to look at her with all the bright neon colors and rhinestone bedazzling. How about a compromise? he asked tentatively. You choose the most favorite thing you're wearing right now, and you can wear that to church with something a little more appropriate. Sarah thought about it. Okay. Hey, Simon, would you mind helping Sean get ready? Derek questioned. Simon seemed the best helper in the house. Derek planned on taking advantage of that when he could. Simon shrugged. Sure. Derek was glad Sarah was such an easygoing, happy kid. He followed her bouncing form back to her room to choose something that would work better for church. Simon was more than helpful, and Sean was okay, too. The problem, at this point, was Serena. For her to encourage active disobedience, that wasn't okay. He wondered how Cynthia was going to handle her. Unicorn shirt on an appropriate dress with tights, cute shoes and a sweater later, Derek finished Sarah off with a quick brush of the hair and a headband. The girl giggled, twirled, and approved of the outfit. Derek checked Simon and Sean, who were ready and playing with Legos while they waited. Since he wondered what was taking Cynthia so long, he wandered over to Serenity's room to find Cynthia dithering over an open diaper bag, packing and repacking. "'What's the holdup?' he asked her. Cynthia gave him a startled look. She sighed in frustration. "'I don't know what to bring. How many diapers will she need? Should she have snacks? Another outfit? A blanket? I have no idea.' Ask me what to bring to court or on a travel business weekend, I'm gold. This? I have no clue. It's only for a couple of hours? Derek peered into the bag. She doesn't need twenty diapers. How can you be sure? She frowned. No way does anyone go to the bathroom twenty times in two hours unless they're super sick. He grabbed out a handful of diapers, setting them aside. Two bottles. One container of something easy like Cheerios. One blanket. One toy so we don't lose any more. And make it a quiet toy because it's church. He pulled other stuff out. One spare outfit should be fine. Again, it's just a couple of hours, not a whole weekend. Are you sure? Cynthia asked. Yeah. Derek put wipes and diaper cream into the bag. These always go in. Oh. Cynthia sighed a little forlornly. I think I need a list. I'll make you one, he promised. He was good at making lists and making sure things got done. Where's Serena? She's not going, Cynthia picked up Serenity, who now sported a secure diaper with tights. She said you gave her permission not to go. No way, Derek shook his head. I did not. That sneaky little liar, she huffed. That's not all, he informed her. Serena apparently told Sarah that they didn't need to listen to you because you're not their mom. Cynthia blinked. Well, I'm not. No, you're not. However, you are in charge. Derek said firmly. They need to listen to you. If they don't, it'll be pure chaos here. Cynthia sat down in the rocking chair, holding tightly onto Serenity. I'm not a mom. I suck at it. I don't even know what to put in a diaper bag. I didn't even think about church. I let Sarah put juice in her cereal this morning for pity's sake. Hey, Derek leaned back against the change table. You're doing fine. No, I'm not. I'm terrible. She unhappily looked up at him. What was Alicia thinking? I shouldn't be raising her kids. Your sister was thinking that even though you would have doubts, even though you'd have a steep learning curve, that you would be a good mom because you care about her kids, Derek said quietly. The fact that you have doubts and want to do better means you can do this. Are you sure? Because I'm not sure at all, Cynthia said uncertainly. 
You can't give them back, he smiled ruefully. Nor are they better off without you, so don't even think that. What about what the caseworker said? She asked dryly. Allison Greenwald is an angry person who likes to put other people down, Derek stated resolutely. Don't you dare let her opinions influence you. Cynthia nodded. Thank you, Derek. He shrugged. Shouldn't we confront Serena and then get everyone loaded? She checked her watch. We're going to be late. So what? Derek questions. We're trying. That's what matters. Next week, maybe we won't be late. Plus, I'm sure the kids will enjoy seeing their friends. Does that mean you're going to be here to help me next week? She inquired. I guess so. Derek said the words without any rancor. She obviously needed the help. Plus, since she was paying him, it was fun diversion. Derek entered Serena's room with a knock. Hey, slowpoke, time for church. Serena popped an earbud out of her ear. Aunt Cynthia said I didn't have to go. Really? Derek looked at her. Do you want to revise that story or get caught in a lie? What? Serena sat up. She stubbornly stuck to her tail. She said I could stay home. Cynthia stepped into the room. Again, would you like to tell the truth now? Serena sighed dramatically. I don't feel well, and I don't want it to go. Derek stuck a hand on her forehead. Did she throw up this morning? Nope, Cynthia said without sympathy. Is she screaming in pain? he asked. Nope, Cynthia looked dispassionately at Serena. Does she need a doctor? he questioned. Maybe a therapist, Cynthia allowed. But we have appointments for grief counseling, so that must count for something. She doesn't have a fever, Derek said. I now pronounce you fit for church. Get dressed or I'll haul you there in your jammies. You can't do that, Serena exclaimed in horror. Watch me, Derek grinned as he left the room. Ten minutes! Oh, and the next time you want to lie, Cynthia happily informed Serena, don't try to use us against each other. We text and message each other. A lot. Cynthia growled and threw her pillow as Cynthia left the room. Church was about the same as Derek remembered. The pastor was a little less boring than the one he had been dragged to see week after week. They had been late, but the usher had gotten them seated without too much fuss. It reminded him of a couple of good years he'd had during his teens. The whole thing made him feel a little nostalgic. Cynthia was fidgety. He'd have to have a word with her later, because if he didn't, he knew that sooner or later one of the parishioners would. Church folk might be forgiving, but they were also paying attention, especially to newcomers, and fidgeting wasn't going to earn Cynthia any respect. They finished the Bible reading, and Simon looked expectantly at Derek. What? Derek whispered to him. Didn't you bring the candies? the boy asked. Confused, Derek looked around to find that while the pastor was opening the sermon— the congregation were opening rolls of all sorts of candies, passing them to their neighbors. They do that? Derek was confused. It was a church. People didn't eat in church. At least that was his experience from the limited exposure he had belonging to a church. Simon sighed in disappointment. You forgot the candies. I didn't know it was a thing, Derek defended himself. I'll make sure that we have candies next week. Did you know about this? Cynthia mouthed the words after she got Derek's attention by tugging on his sleeve over Sean's head. Derek shook his head in the negative and shrugged. Anything in your purse? She gave him a look. Do I look like a woman who regularly hides candies in my purse? He shrugged. She was a fiend for donuts. Who knew if she liked candies? He searched his pockets but came up with antacids, lint, and Tic Tacs. Derek handed out the Tic Tacs to the kids. If nothing else, they'd all have fresh breath. What are these? Sean whispered too loudly. Tic Tacs. Like a mint, Derek said quietly in return. The boy wrinkled his nose but tried one. Ew. Sean spit the Tic Tac into his hand, gave it back to Derek, who had to admit, as it sat in his palm, that he was the silly one who accepted the gooey mint back from the little boy. It was gross. Got a tissue? Derek asked Cynthia. Shh! Someone behind them whispered crossly. Cynthia rolled her eyes and rifled through her purse. It was a big purse. You would think there would be some tissues in there. Finally, she found a wadded-up napkin and gave it to him. He put the little mitten in it and wiped his hand. Derek didn't like to think if the napkin was even clean. They were not prepared today. All the jostling woke up Serenity, who promptly announced her displeasure with a loud cry. 
Cynthia looked a little panicked and started trying to offer various solutions. The cereal was dismissed, the bottle unwanted, the toy rejected. The soother, Derek suggested. The what? Cynthia looked at him in confusion. The pacifier, he clarified. That thing that goes in her mouth that she sucks on? Cynthia rummaged through the diaper bag and came up empty. Did we forget to pack it? He sincerely hoped not. Serenity's wails grew louder. In desperation, Cynthia took the crying child out of church. She was getting glares of disapproval from the bench behind them anyways. Others gave her looks of sympathy, knowing what crying babies were like. She paced the foyer, patting Serenity on the back, and hoped that the little girl would quiet down. A matronly woman approached her. "'Dear, you look a little frazzled. Why don't you give her to me?' Cynthia gratefully handed over the baby. She was napping, and now she won't stop crying. The woman clucked to Serenity. Had a bad dream? Or did you just wake up too fast? Woke up too fast, I think. Cynthia shifted the diaper bag on her shoulder. For a moment, she felt a little panic. Was she supposed to just hand over the baby? She didn't know this woman at all. She could abduct Serenity. I'm Cynthia Stone. Marcia Ruthers, the woman introduced herself. She swayed slightly and rubbed Serenity's back. The baby did seem to be slowly winding down. The trick is to stay calm. Babies can sense how you feel. If you're anxious, it makes them anxious. Cynthia was always a little anxious. It was part of her personality. I'm afraid I'm not the calmest of people. Marcia gave her a look of sympathy. You've now got five little ones to care for. You're going to have to learn calm. I was so sorry to hear about Alicia and Guy. They were such nice people. Cynthia tried to swallow past the lump in her throat. Thank you. Serenity let out a watery sigh and relaxed, trying to go back to sleep. If you need anything, you just let us know. We take care of our church members, Marcia says. She carefully handed a sleeping baby back to Cynthia. I'd better get back. Cynthia gave a quick smile as she snuggled Serenity back onto her shoulder. We'll get the hang of it in no time, Marcia encouraged her. Cynthia gave the woman a tight nod. She fell close to crying. For the first time, it began to sink in what she'd gotten herself into. She was responsible for the care of five kids. Her sister and brother-in-law weren't ever coming home. Cynthia took a deep breath as she headed back into the sanctuary. She didn't want people's concern or sympathy at the moment. All it would do was break down the few walls that were keeping her from throwing a cry-fest like Serenity had just indulged in. She slipped into their bench, just at the end of the sermon. A few songs later, and they were being invited to linger over coffee as the kids went to play with other children they knew. Cynthia and Derek were somehow split up as well-meaning people came over to offer condolences, to discuss the funeral lunch, ask personal questions about them, and to find out where to bring by meals for the family to help support them during this difficult time. It exhausted Cynthia. She wasn't a people person to begin with. She knew that wasn't one of her strengths. So to continually immerse herself in a pleasant conversation was difficult. She hoped she handled it well. She didn't want to offend anyone who was willing to give a free meal. Cynthia knew she didn't cook. These people on takeout might be all that stood between her little family and starvation. Her little family. Cynthia tried not to tear up at the thought. She'd often thought about having kids. Two, probably. One, more likely. Now she had five. They had a long way to go, but they were going to become a family. Finally, people seemed to slowly drift away, and Cynthia was able to find Derek, who disengaged himself from a group of men. "'Did you know anything about a funeral lunch?' she asked quietly. "'No.' Derek pulled out his phone and added a note about it. "'Is there supposed to be one?' "'Apparently.' Cynthia shrugged, careful not to shift serenity too much. Suppose we can ask the pastor to, to contact about that. Simon dragged a reluctant Sean over to them. There you are. Sean put a stone in his ear. He what? Derek and Cynthia said in unison, staring down at the little boy. He put a stone in his ear. Simon repeated himself with a tolerant sigh. Buddy, Derek crouched down. Why would you put a stone in your ear? Sean shrugged. Derek turned on the flashlight app for his phone and looked at Sean's ears. Yep, there's a stone in his left ear. 
We tried tilting his head to get it out with our fingers, but it won't come out, Simon interjected. Do you have a set of tweezers? Derek asked Cynthia. Sure, in my purse. Cynthia handed the purse over to Derek. She couldn't believe it. What kid put a stone in their ear? Could have been worse, Simon said. He could have put up his nose. Sarah put a bean up there once. Here, hold my phone so I can see. Derek handed the phone to Simon. What happened to Sarah? Cynthia asked in horrified curiosity. What was wrong with the kids these days? Simon held the phone where Derek wanted it. He watched as Derek tilted Sean's head and tried to get the little rock out. They brought her to the doctor, and he made her sneeze really hard. It popped out with a bunch of goo. Cynthia wrinkled her nose and wished she hadn't asked. It stuck, Derek said grimly. I think we'll be making a hospital visit today. Do we need to? Cynthia asked. She didn't want to have to tell Mr. Davison that they couldn't solve this on their own. She knew the kids would tell the caseworker all about it. It needs to come out, Derek said dryly. Simon, if you could round up the other two kids, then we can get going. Cynthia tossed the tweezers back into her purse with a sigh. She fished out the keys to the van. It didn't take long for Simon to return with Sarah. Where's Serena? Cynthia asked. The teen was nowhere to be seen. Toby's mom says she went to her friend Izzy for lunch, Simon reported back to them. Derek frowned. Shouldn't she ask permission first? We should know where she is at all times. Simon shrugged. We always have to ask. It's a rule from Mum and Dad. Let's just deal with Sean now, and then we'll talk to Serena when we pick her up at second service, Cynthia said tiredly. Wait, Derek responded. We don't know these people. We don't even know for certain that she went with them. We need to find out before we leave for the hospital. They snagged the pastor to find out Izzy's parents' names and phone number. The pastor gave them a good recommendation, so Derek felt a little better about her staying for lunch with these people. A phone call later, and Cynthia knew that Izzy had indeed invited Serena for lunch and that she was there with the family. They agreed to meet for second service. Second service? Derek frowned. The church he had gone to only had one service per Sunday. Isn't one enough? Uh, apparently not. Cynthia put away her phone and led the way to the van. We're going to have to have a talk with her. Do parents ground children over things like this? What even is grounding? That's when you get no television, no phone, no computer or tablet, Simon had said helpfully. Usually it's for a week or two. Did you ever get grounded? Cynthia asked as she strapped in serenity. Not really. Mostly I got the, we're very disappointed in you speech, Simon responded. Didn't happen too often. What about you? Cynthia asked Derek as he finished buckling up Sean. Me? Derek was surprised. No, I was never grounded. Derek didn't think his parents knew how to ground a kid. They were into other forms of punishment. Well, what happened when you disobeyed or were dishonest with your parents? Cynthia frowned as she started the vehicle. Nothing much good, Derek muttered. Cynthia gave him an odd look but resumed concentrating on her driving. A short time later, they were all sitting in the waiting room of the hospital. It wasn't overly crowded, and Derek spotted someone he knew at the vending machine. Hey, Kelly. Derek was a little surprised to see her. Thought you weren't working here anymore. Derek! Kelly gave him a big smile, and Cynthia felt a twinge of jealousy by the other woman's obvious affection for her paralegal. I'm not. Avery has a stomach flu virus, and Dylan likes to overreact, so we're here, waiting for some test results. What are you up to? Oh, Derek gestured to the little boy. Sean has a rock stuck in his ear. Apparently, it was the thing to do today. Kelly laughed. That's what little boys do. Have you seen the doctor yet? No, they said it could be a while. Cynthia stood, extending her hand in greeting. She noticed that Derek hadn't introduced her. Cynthia Stone. Oh. Kelly blinked in surprise at Cynthia. Kelly Islington. I mean, Kelly Ramsley. I just got married. Speaking of which, Dylan and I are having a vow renewal service and reception for family and friends. Derek, you should come. Maybe you could bring... Cynthia? We'll have to talk about it, Derek said. No way was he bringing his boss. It was kind of Kelly to invite the dragon, but Derek would like to keep his personal life separate. Not that he had much of a personal life. Good. I'll send you the details. Kelly nodded to Sean. Do you mind if I take a look? I was a nurse before I got married. To Mr. Dylan Ramsley, Cynthia felt the names click. He's one of the Ramsleys who are in the insurance industry. 
That's right. Dylan is the head of the Northeastern Division of Ramsley Insurance Company. Kelly shrugged. At Cynthia's consent, she looked at Sean's ear. I think I can get it out if you wait a moment. That would be great, Kelly. Derek was relieved. The kids' insurance was up to date, yet waiting to be seen by a doctor was wearing on them all. The kids were starting to get impatient. Cynthia watched Kelly leave to get something, and then turned to Derek. How do you know her? We went to camp together as kids, Derek answered, a little amused. She's a friend. One of the crew that I go camping with each Thanksgiving. Cynthia wasn't sure that she liked that. Despite Kelly being recently married, it was obvious that the two had a friendly affection going on. What did you tell her about me? Derek frowned. What do you mean? It's obvious that you've said something. The way she said, oh, when I introduced myself. Cynthia laid the emphasis on the oh. So what did you tell her? That you're my boss? Derek tried to evade the question. What had he said all about her to his friends? Mostly he complained that she made him work too much and called her a dragon. Thank goodness Kelly had the presence of mind not to repeat the nickname to Cynthia. I don't know. Cynthia frowned, but couldn't say anything, as a happy Kelly returned. Let's see if this works. Kelly had Sean tilt his head again, and Derek shined the phone app flashlight in the boy's ear. She had a piece of tape and carefully adhered it to the stone before pulling it out. It's out! She was so bubbly happy, Cynthia could just kill her. Why hadn't they thought about that simple solution? It seemed so obvious now that she had seen Kelly do it. Thanks, Kelly. Derek turned off the flashlight. No problem. Kelly ruffled Sean's hair. No more putting things in your ears or up your nose, okay? The little boy nodded. Thank you, Kelly. Cynthia hoped she conveyed some sincerity with her voice. She wasn't certain she succeeded. I really appreciate you helping us out like that. You're welcome. It was nice to meet you, Kelly smiled. Derek, when you're not busy, come over to supper sometime soon, okay? Sure, Derek replied easily as Kelly left their group. He knew that Kelly would be texting him later to find out more about why he'd been at the hospital with Cynthia. Derek hadn't bothered to tell any of his friends about the changes going on in his boss's life. I guess we're all set then. I guess so, Cynthia replied as she gathered the diaper bag and purse. She hefted a now awake serenity onto her hip. Cynthia eyed Derek. She needed to keep Derek busy. Very busy so that there would be no time for him to have supper with this Kelly woman. Married or not, Cynthia was going to make sure he didn't have any time to share a meal with her. With that plan in mind, Cynthia felt marginally better. They managed egg sandwiches and juice for lunch before heading back to church. Serena came forward to their bench, heels dragging, muttering apology for her behavior. It wasn't perfect, but Cynthia would take it. She would thank Izzy's parents later for talking to Serena about her behavior. This time, Derek had candies for the kids since he'd searched the house while they were having lunch. Socializing after the service was less time-consuming since coffee wasn't served, and people drifted away to have their evening together at home. Cynthia was glad. It had been a tiring day. The amount of people offering their condolences was staggering. She knew she wouldn't recognize hardly any of these people once she saw them again. She was glad to get home. Derek managed some sort of miracle with supper, dredging up all sorts of odds and ends for them to eat. It worked okay. Afterward, they cleaned up and Cynthia went to change Serenity and put her down to sleep. While she was gone, Sarah handed Derek a sheet of paper. What's this? Derek frowned as he looked at it. It's a list of what I need for Sunday school, she giggled. It's not very big, but that's okay, because I'm not a very big girl yet. Simon's list is bigger. Does Simon go to Sunday school? Derek asked the little girl. No, she giggled again delightedly. He's a cadet. I'm not sure that I want to go. Simon handed Derek the list. I've got everything on the list already. Why don't you want to go? Derek was curious. Since the Roms had been active church members, it made sense that their children were enrolled in the church's programs. Because God took Mom and Dad away? Simon's glasses fogged up as he struggled to try to contain his tears. Derek sighed and hoped that he would say the right things. He reached out a hand and placed it on Simon's shoulder. Buddy, God didn't take your mom and dad away. A drunk driver did. But he let it happen. Simon sniffed and wiped his nose on his sleeve. Derek wrapped an arm around the boy. Sarah was starting to cry too, so he offered her a hug as well and she grabbed onto both of them tightly. 
God gives all of us free will to do what we want. Sometimes we do stupid things, like driving drunk. God doesn't like it when we do stupid things, but he won't stop us because we need to learn from making mistakes. If we never make a mistake, we don't learn and grow. God didn't want that to happen to your mom and dad. He's just as sad as you are. He cries when you cry. He's mad when you're mad. He's sad when you're sad. And it's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad and cry or not cry. Just remember there comes a point where you have to let it go. Not yet, but when you're ready. Don't keep your sadness or anger in, holding it to you as long as you can because that's unhealthy. If you need to punch a pillow, do it. If you need to walk, grab a leash and we'll go walk the dogs. If you need to just be in bed for an hour, that's okay too. But remember, God loves you. Why did they have to go? Simon wiped his face. I don't know, Derek said honestly. He rubbed Simon's back. I do know that you can ask God that very question and he'll give you an answer. Maybe not today or tomorrow. Maybe not even five years from now. But someday, when you're ready to hear the answer, he'll tell you why. I miss Mommy and Daddy, Sarah sniffled, tears running down her cheeks. I know, Derek responded gently. Even though they are in heaven, your mom and dad still love you very much. They always love you and will never forget you. Remember that, okay? Sarah nodded solemnly. Derek looked up to see Cynthia watching them. She was near enough that she must have heard every word. He hoped she didn't mind his interfering. Cynthia turned abruptly and walked away. Crud, he'd made her mad. Derek sighed and leaned down. Hey guys, I need to go see your aunt. Are you going to be okay for now? Yep. Simon pulled off his glasses. They are wet and useless. I need to clean these. I'm going to tell Dolly what you said, Sarah announced as she wiped her cheeks with the back of her hands. She gets sad, too. That's a good idea. Derek smiled at the little girl before she ran away. Thanks, Derek, Simon quietly said. Any time. Derek offered Simon the list back. Are you going to go to cadets, then? He shrugged. Might as well. Some of my friends go. I think that's a good idea, Derek responded. He gave Simon a pat on the shoulder. I'm going to talk to your aunt. She didn't look too happy. Do you think Aunt Cynthia gets sad, too? Simon frowned. Derek paused. I'm sure she does. Your mom was her sister. She must miss her, too. Simon nodded. I'll try to be a little nicer to her. That would be good. I'm sure she'd appreciate that. Derek gave Simon a final pat and went to Cynthia's room. He knocked on the door. When she didn't answer, he tried the door. It was unlocked. Derek entered the room to see Cynthia standing by the window. She was hugging herself and looking out at the street. Go away. She wasn't mad. Derek gently closed the door and came to stand beside her, looking out the window as well. Do I need to give you the it's okay to be sad too speech? Cynthia took a shaky breath and pressed a tissue to her eyes. Where did you learn that stuff you said? He shrugged. I had the good fortune to live with a lady who insisted that in return for food, clothing, and shelter, I would allow myself to be dragged to church every week and join in any activities she saw fit. It was a free place to live, so I went with it. She gave me that speech at one point. I guess it stuck. Cynthia sniffed, wiping her eyes again. She tried to say something, but couldn't, too overcome to speak. Hey, Derek reached out to put a hand on her shoulder. You don't have to be the strong boss, you know. It's okay to let it out. In a moment, Cynthia was crying on him. Derek carefully held her, a little surprised and a little uncertain. He felt for her. She'd just lost someone she loved. Even if Cynthia didn't seem capable of stronger emotions as always, it was obvious that she had them. Derek pulled her a little closer, holding her and waiting for her tears to be spent. Who knew dragons could cry? She finally pulled away and used a hand to wipe the remaining effects of her crying jag from her cheeks. Cynthia sniffed. We should go over the evidence on the Underhill case again. There's got to be an angle that we can use. Why don't you take a shower, get dressed in something comfortable, and then we can go over the case in the dining room after the kids are in bed, he suggested. I'll brew you some cinnamon tea. Derek, you don't need to treat me like I'm fragile. She sniffed again, blowing her nose into the wet tissue. She was embarrassed that he had seen her this way. I'll be fine. 
Might be easier than getting interrupted by the bedtime routine. Derek checked his watch, which starts in about twenty minutes anyway. She sighed. He was right. It would be easier. Okay. Good, Derek nodded. After we get the troops to bed, we'll get to work. Chapter 5 The funeral was a long affair. Too long for a bunch of kids. Fortunately, after the first rounds of visitation, Sean and Serenity went to the church as babysit so they could be less constrained by the expectation of adults. Unfortunately, Sarah wasn't so lucky. The little girl's natural exuberance and gaiety didn't do well at a funeral. Several times Cynthia found herself wondering if she should confine the six-year-old to the nursery as well. Simon and Serena were giving Sarah constant reminders to behave, even as they tried to keep on brave faces. Cynthia was trying to keep on a brave face for herself. Listening to the pastor discuss all the good qualities of Leisha and Guy made her miss them more. The irony of it was she only saw them once a year. Sure, Cynthia and Alicia phoned each other regularly, mainly because Alicia demanded it. If Alicia hadn't been so pushy to keep in contact with Cynthia, she probably would have let the relationship falter a lot more than it had. It made Cynthia feel guilty. She didn't like that feeling at all. She wondered what people might say at her funeral if she were to die today. She imagined her uncle would come. Derek would have to handle all the details. There was no one else. The thought scared her. Cynthia really was alone in this world. She had no close relationships. She had no friends. She worked and worked, keeping herself busy to climb to the top. Yet if she died, would her clients care? Would anyone from the fern come? No. If they even bothered to do anything, it would be send flowers. Cynthia glanced around the church. It was hard since they had been seated right at the front. The sanctuary was packed. People had shown up to show their respect to the Roms family, their love for Alicia and Guy. Maybe her sister had been on to something after all. Every time Alicia had commented that Cynthia wasn't living a full life, Cynthia had just scoffed at her. She'd said she was doing great, serving people through the law. Alicia had said that she personally served people through her faith, through her kindness, through her humility. Cynthia never really understood that. She still didn't. Yet she did understand that it had made a couple hundred people show up to honor Alicia and Guy. They were much loved. Probably, just as much as she loved them, these people did too. Alicia and Guy had belonged to an entire community of people. Sarah began to cry. Not just sniffling like Simon or Serenity were, but full-on crying. Cynthia sighed and held out a hand. Why don't we visit Sean and Serenity? The little girl gulped and nodded, latching on to Cynthia's outstretched palm. They walked down the aisle and headed for the nursery. I tried to be good. I did. Sarah wiped her face with a hand. What do you mean? Cynthia paused in the hallway and rooted around in her purse for a small packet of tissues. She handed them to Sarah. I know I don't sit still very well, Sarah complained as the tears dripped down her face. Serena hissed at me. She what? Cynthia frowned. She told me to stop being a baby and sit still. Sarah blew her nose, hiccuping. I tried to sit still. It's just so hard. Oh, Sarah. Cynthia knelt and gave the girl a little hug. You were doing the best you could, right? Yes. She nodded against Cynthia's shoulder, hugging her back. Then no one can ask any more than that. Cynthia rubbed her back. You did just fine. Do you want to go back and sit with me instead? Or do you want to go with Sean and Serenity where you won't be expected to try to sit still? I want to sit with you, Sarah decided. She gave Cynthia her used tissue. Cynthia debated what to do with the gooey mess before shrugging and sticking it in her purse. She put a hand on Sarah's shoulder, and they re-entered the church, this time Sarah sitting away from Serena. Cynthia wrapped her arm around the little girl's shoulder, and Sarah snuggled into her as they listened to the pastor. Cynthia didn't have any problems with the normally boisterous youngster after that, since Sarah fell asleep, drooling on Cynthia's dress. Strangely enough, Cynthia found she didn't mind. After the sermon ended, Derek ended up carrying the sleepy girl to the car that they had hired for the day. Cynthia wondered if they should take Sean 
or serenity to the graveside, but Derek vetoed that idea. They're comfortable enough in the nursery, he said. Plus, we don't need to give Sean nightmares. Perhaps we should leave Sarah in the nursery, Cynthia frowned. The other kids will wake her up. Let her sleep. If she's still snoozing by the time we hit the cemetery, I'll just carry her again. Derek shrugged, the little girl sleeping on him. Thank you, Cynthia said quietly. He looked at her a little startled. Cynthia hardly ever said those words, even to him. I mean it, she clarified. Thank you for everything you've done today, for helping to set all this up, for being here. I really appreciate it. Cynthia grabbed a tissue and blotted her eyes for a moment. She knew that she took him for granted. Today was especially trying, and he'd been there the entire time for her and the kids. Derek cleared his throat. You're welcome. She nodded. Simon reached out and took her hand. Thank you, Aunt Cynthia. She gave his hand a squeeze. For what? For looking after us, he said simply. For not putting us in foster care? Oh, Simon. Cynthia tried to hold back more tears, blinking rapidly. I know we'll have our good times and bad times, but I will never put any of you in foster care. She was so glad that she hadn't turned her back on this little family. It might not have been what she wanted. However, Cynthia was determined to try and make it work. She was glad that Elisha and Guy had given her the opportunity, rather than grant guardianship to someone else. Cynthia reached out her other hand to Serena, and was surprised when the girl actually let her take it. Serena didn't look at her, just used her own tissue to wipe her eyes as she stared out at the scenery. However, Cynthia thought it was progress since Serena didn't take her hand away from the small comfort that Cynthia offered. The graveside was very emotional. It was hard to comprehend that the two caskets were there to be lowered into the ground, held the remains of Alicia and Guy. Derek held the sleeping Sarah. He laid his free hand on Cynthia's back in sympathy, letting her lean on him while the pastor continued to talk. Cynthia wouldn't remember a single word of what he said. Finally, they returned to the church for the funeral luncheon. Cynthia could understand why people put the luncheons on. While she wasn't particularly hungry, everyone else seemed to be. They retrieved Sean and Serenity from the nursery, roused a sleepy Sarah, and sat down to partake of the ham and cheese buns offered. Cynthia sipped her coffee. It wasn't gourmet, but it was needed caffeine. Her nerves were nearly shot for the day. She eyed Sarah a little enviously. Cynthia could use a nap herself. Instead, she concentrated on making sure Sean ate his bun rather than leaving the majority of it on the floor. He was a very messy eater, she'd discovered. She didn't know how he managed to stay alive, since it seemed like all the food that was given to him to ingest invariably ended up in his hair, on his face, hands and clothes, or the furniture in the floor. His little church clothes were going to need dry cleaning. Did one dry clean children's clothing? Cynthia didn't know. She supposed she'd have to find out. They endured the constant stream of condolences that people gave as they dropped in to introduce themselves during the little meal. Cynthia wondered if her face was about to crack from so much smiling. Finally, Derek grabbed the boys to wash up. Mainly, Simon and Derek would just wash Sean up. Cynthia passed Sarah a wet wipe. She cleaned off Serenity herself, even though the baby had remained clean while eating her cereal and drinking her bottle. "'Dear, I forgot your name,' a little old lady crept forward to shake Cynthia's hand. "'You're Alicia's sister.' Cynthia Stone. Cynthia supplied as she took the gnarled fingers and gave the elderly woman a handshake. Cynthia dredged up another weary smile. "'My daughter works at the school the children go to,' the woman supplied without introducing herself. Obviously, she thought that Cynthia should know who she was. Cynthia didn't have a clue and wasn't about to ask. She couldn't remember any names today anyways, so it was pointless. That's nice, Cynthia replied neutrally. Honey, you need to take a spoon of honey before you go to sleep at night. Just a teaspoon, the lady said sagely. That'll do the trick. My mother swore by it. Cynthia blinked. She was obviously very tired. Cynthia couldn't even follow the woman's conversation. Honey? That's right. Soothe the throat. She nodded wisely and winked. The old remedies are the best. And I need to soothe my throat because... Cynthia asked curiously. 
for the snoring. It's one thing if a man snores. Us women are expected to put up with it. However, if a woman snores, raise the roof. The marriage is on the rocks. The old woman chuckled, amused at her own little joke. When my Margaret said that you and your mister were living in separate houses because of your snoring, I just had to let you know there are better ways than what those doctors always say. Thank you, Cynthia said faintly. You're very welcome, dearie. She patted Cynthia on the shoulder. Then she made comments as to Serenity's cuteness and left. I don't think you snore, Sarah scrunched up her little face. How would you know? Serena asked her sister. You're asleep by the time Aunt Cynthia goes to bed. Cynthia thought back to Derek hustling her and Simon out of the school office. She had a suspicion she knew exactly what had been going on. Derek returned with the boys. All clean and past inspection. Cynthia cocked her head to the side. I'm sorry to hear that my snoring bothers you. Derek flushed a little. Perhaps he'd gone a little too far. Then again... Well, darling, he put some emphasis on the word, reminding her that she'd labeled him as her significant other at the school office. It came as quite a surprise to me as well. I hadn't really thought about it until we clarified the terms of our relationship. Cynthia blinked. He'd been upset because she'd said they were in a relationship? She hadn't exactly lied, just overstated the exact circumstances so they wouldn't have as many issues with signing Derek on as the next person with permissions to pick up the kids. Maybe she should have asked his permission instead of just bullying him into doing what she wanted. Then again, Cynthia had always found that bending someone to her will was just more expedient. Touché, she raised an eyebrow. She'd let him win this round. However, next time one of the kids were sick... Cynthia was going to let him pick them up. He smiled. She smiled back, and Derek began to worry. He knew at some point Cynthia would return the favor. Chapter 6 The phone was ringing. Not even looking at the screen, Derek lifted up to his ear automatically. Yes? You have to come now, Cynthia demanded in his ear. Derek ran a hand over his face and stared at the ceiling. Well, he would be staring at the ceiling, except that it was the wee hours of the morning and everything in his room was dark, except for the cell phone which he could cheerfully toss away right now. Why? Just come. It's an emergency. Cynthia's voice was panicked. Derek groaned and sat up. Is anyone bleeding? No, she sniffed a little pathetically. Great. The dragon was sniffling. He bet it was just allergies. Derek put his head in his available hand. Does anyone need to go to the hospital? No, her voice was a little whiny. Derek, just get here. Is anyone missing? He asked in a reasonable voice, including the pets. No. Then why do you need me there? He bit out. He had been up until one in the morning, and now it wasn't even four. Nothing about what I'm hearing constitutes an emergency. I still have to go through the specifics of the Underhill case, and I'd love to get more than two hours of sleep in a row. There was another sniffle. It was louder this time and more pronounced. What is it? He sighed and asked more patiently. The little monsters put gum in my hair, she whispered. Right at the front, down to the roots. I can't get it out. I'm going to have to be shaved bald. Derek couldn't help but laugh. He fell back on the bed laughing long and hard. It's not funny, she wailed over the phone. That's the funniest thing I've heard all week, he gasped, trying to drag in air. Derek wiped his eyes. That's easy for a guy to say. Guys don't care if they have to shave their heads. Cynthia was miserable, her voice coming out all wobbly. I'm going to look just awful. You're going to look fine, Derek got up, grabbing his clothes. I know how to fix this. By fixing it, you mean something that doesn't involve scissors and a shaver? She asked hopefully. I promise you will keep your hair and I will get the gum out. He had a tired chuckle as he dressed. I'll see you in a bit. He ended the call, ordered a cab, and headed toward the kitchen. Derek was startled to see roomie number two, Nick, or Ned, eating cereal at the table. Hungry? Derek asked as he grabbed a jar out of the cupboard. Has she got you hopping again? Nick or Ned raised an eyebrow. Yep, 
Derek fished out his keys and grabbed his shoes. You might as well live out of a box for all the time you spend here. Why do you even have a room? He was curious. I ask that every time I hand over the rent money. Derek shrugged and headed out the door. He supposed he could have clarified just what the roommate's name actually was, but he just didn't care. Not at four in the morning. A long cab ride later, he stood outside Cynthia's new abode. Derek called her on his phone, and she ripped open the door when he told her he was waiting outside. "'Why didn't you just ring the doorbell?' she demanded impatiently. "'I didn't want to wake the kids,' Derek replied. He smirked as he saw the gum. The kids had used a pretty big wad. Cynthia must be a heavy sleeper not to have noticed them putting it in. Nice hair. She grabbed his arm and dragged him inside. "'Please tell me you weren't joking when you said you could fix this.' Derek held up the jar of peanut butter. "'I got this.' "'What?' She looked at him like he had lost his mind. "'Get me a comb and a couple of towels.' Derek was confident. "'I've done this before.' "'Someone put gum in your hair?' Cynthia questioned. "'No.' He tossed off his shoes and coat in the mudroom. "'But I knew a couple girls in foster care who got gum in their hair from some other nasty kids. This was their remedy.' "'You were in foster care?' She was surprised. He'd never mentioned that before. Derek froze for a moment, then shrugged, heading to the bathroom. He really must be tired. Usually he never talked about his past. It was better that way. It was a long time ago. "'Why were you in foster care?' Cynthia persisted as she followed him. "'Why are most kids in foster care? Either their parents or relatives can't take care of them, or there's no one at all.' Derek said the words as a matter of fact, without any emotion or infliction. He scooped a comb out of a drawer and grabbed a towel. You should probably sit down. She flipped the seat on the toilet down and sat. So, which were you? What do you mean? He pretended to deliberately misunderstand. Using two hair clips from the girl's drawer of hair items, he clipped the towel to her shoulders to form sort of a cape to protect her silk pajamas, just in case he dropped any peanut butter. It wasn't the easiest, since it was a little more than a slip with spaghetti straps that ended up mid-thigh. It said something as to how tired Derek was because he couldn't even appreciate the view that was in front of him. Why she would answer the door in that, then cover up with a robe, he didn't know. Derek dipped two fingers in the jar and enjoyed plopping the glob onto the crown of Cynthia's head. That almost made up for her waking him up. Did you have people who wouldn't take care of you, or no one at all? She persisted, scrunching up her face as she tried to watch what he was doing in the mirror. How old were you? He massaged the peanut butter around the gum. Ten. There was no one worth remembering. What happened? Cynthia persisted in asking questions. Derek clenched his jaw against any memories intruding. He worked so hard that he rarely ever had nightmares anymore. He preferred it that way. I don't talk about it. Why not? She was curious. Of course she was curious. This was Cynthia, who was used to having her questions answered. No doubt she'd keep worrying at this like a dog with a bone. Too bad she was going to be disappointed. Just drop it. Derek tried to keep his tone neutral. He didn't succeed since some bitterness crept in. Finally, the gum started moving, and he was able to slowly make progress on slipping it through the strands of hair. You might as well just tell me, Cynthia huffed. I'm going to find out. I sincerely hope not. He spread a little more peanut butter in her hair. Some because she needed it to glide the gum out. Some more, just because he could. I'm a lawyer. I can go to social services and request information about you, she said as a matter of fact. She knew a good number of caseworkers and social workers. Some of them owed her favors. Cynthia had no doubt that she could uncover his case file. Derek realized where her thoughts were headed. If she found out the truth, she'd never look at him the same. No one ever did. There were days where he couldn't look at himself normally. He pulled the gum from her hair and dropped it in the trash. Grabbing the comb, he pulled out as much of the peanut butter as he could, wiping it on some toilet paper. "'Aren't you going to say anything?' Cynthia looked up at him. "'What is there to say?' Derek could feel the old desolation creeping in. He washed the comb, put it, the towel, and the clips away. He didn't look at her. "'You'll do what you want to do anyways. Nothing I say is going to convince you to stop, even though I told you to drop it. Some things are better off not knowing sin.' If you have any respect for me, you won't go there. It can't be that bad, she scoffed. Wait, what did you just call me? 
You want to wash your hair. Peanut butter is oily, he advised, ignoring her question. Derek left the washroom, grabbing his coat. He paused to put on his shoes. I'm still your boss, you know, Cynthia insisted as she followed him. Just because you're fishing gum out of my hair doesn't mean you get to call me by my first name. How could I forget? Derek said dryly. Where are you going? Cynthia trailed him. Aren't you going to stay and help me with the terrors in the morning? Seriously? He cocked his head and looked at her. Why? I'm sure you're more than capable of handling it. It's only an hour until they start getting up. You might as well just stay and we can go over some of the specifics of the Underhill case, she said. Plus, I need to know the going rate on the Tooth Fairy. Goodbye sleep, Derek thought to himself with a small pain. How much did you give, Sarah? Twenty. But I'm wondering if that isn't a bit too much, Cynthia frowned. Twenty? Dollars? Derek laughed. That's a serious accounting error. You know she's got lots more loose teeth coming, right? Give her a dollar each. Well, I didn't know. Cynthia felt a little defensive. I've never done this whole momming thing. Haven't you ever been around, kids? Can't you remember being one? Or was that too long ago? Derek knew the minutes the word inferring her to be old had left his mouth. It was a mistake. Thanks, she said dryly, her mouth drawn in a thin line of unamusement. Crud. He ran a hand down his face. I'm sorry. I'm tired and it just came out. I didn't mean it. Whatever, Cynthia said crisply. I know I'm clueless when it comes to kids. I just figured when I had my own I would know what to do. Then I got too old and now I've got five dumped on me and I don't know what to do. First of all, Derek eyed her body with the silky nightgown. You're not too old. What are you, thirty-five? Second, these kids weren't dumped on you. They're given to you with the firm belief that you're more than capable of taking care of them. I'm forty-two, she said shortly. I just gave a seven-year-old twenty bucks for one tooth. All parents make mistakes, he shrugged. As long as the kids haven't died, needed a hospital visit, aren't abused and are fed, I'd say it's a successful day. We better exchange the cash before she wakes up, otherwise you'll have set a precedent. I suppose so, she frowned in annoyance. It was such a pain to make sure she didn't wake up the first time I snuck in her room, though. Derek put off his shoes and stood. If you want me to hang around, then you need to put a robe on or some clothes. What? She looked at him, surprised. I'm covered. That is not covered. He gave her another long look, liking what he saw and knowing that he shouldn't be looking. You're supposed to be an example to these kids? She rolled her eyes. Like it makes any difference. I don't exactly scream sexy to anyone. You of all people know my love life is as dry as the desert. Was he really going to do this? Was he stupid and tired enough to lack judgment? Apparently, yes, Derek thought to himself as he crowded her space. Is that what you really think? She didn't back away. Cynthia tilted her head up to look at him. Except for Carl, there's been nothing happening. Guys don't like me. Carl was an idiot. He trailed a finger down her cheek and watched her eyes darken. Good. She wasn't the only one feeling this way. Men send you signals that they're interested all the time. You just don't seem to realize it. What kind of signals? She asked a little breathlessly. He ignored the question. Leaning down and slanting his mouth over hers, it was like a spark that ignited a raging bonfire. She tasted too good, like that cinnamon herbal tea she liked so much. It didn't take much to back her up against all the coats hanging on the wall. She was exactly the right size against him, and he just knew that she'd be a perfect fit. Cynthia had complained about being a dry desert when it came to her love life. Well, he'd been trapped there the entire time with her in that arid place, and now the two of them were threatening to set the whole thing alight. Derek reached for the edge of the warm silk nighty. He'd been wanting to pull it off ever since he'd stepped in the door. Just as his hands met the material, he heard a noise and lifted his head. "'Aunt Cynthia! Look what the Tooth Fairy brought me!' Sarah shrieked, gap-tooth, waving the twenty-dollar bill around as she danced in her onesie. "'Stupid, stupid, stupid, stupid!' Derek released Cynthia and stepped back, putting distance between himself and her. He ran a hand through his hair and tried to find some equilibrium back. She was his boss. What had he been thinking? "'Wow, Sarah, that's great,' Cynthia said with fake enthusiasm. "'What were you two doing?' Sarah asked a little suspiciously. Dancing, Derek responded. Checking his fillings, Cynthia said at the same time. Ew. Sarah wrinkled her nose. Don't ever check my fillings that way. 
"'We won't,' Derek promised, shooting Cynthia a look. Even with peanut butter in her hair, she still looked delicious. He checked his watch. "'Sweetie, it's only five. You could get another hour of sleep, or play with your toys until you need to get up for school.' "'I'm hungry,' she announced gleefully. "'Pancakes it is.' Derek offered her his hand, and Sarah took it. Part of him was grateful for the escape the little girl was offering him. He had no idea what to say to Cynthia. "'Do you have any blueberries?' "'I don't know. We can check the fridge,' Sarah happily replied. Cynthia watched Derek and Sarah walk away. She was still leaning against the coats hooked into the wall. She used a hand to fan her face. "'Wow. Just wow.' She'd always known Derek had potential. Frankly, it was the reason she'd hired him. Eye candy walking through her door. Back then, eight years ago, Cynthia had thought she'd have a fling with him, then send him packing for a real paralegal to help her with her work. Two weeks in, she'd realized, as good as eye candy Derek was, he was the best paralegal she'd ever met. He could also put up with her, which she acknowledged was a rare gift. So she'd knocked off any thought of flirting and had gone all in with business. Derek had matched her step for step, even though she knew that over the years he'd come to hate his job. He had staying power and determination. Cynthia admired him for that, even if she didn't know why he stayed working for her. Now they'd just changed the entire dynamic of their relationship. Her body felt flushed. Double wow. Cynthia pulled away from the wall to find a robe. She had delicate little minds to protect, as Derek had reminded her. Plus, what she'd just seen as a nightgown, Derek had made her feel sexy, and Cynthia hadn't felt sexy in a long time. Even on that day with Carl, she'd felt like she was trying too hard. It was part of her problem. She tended to try too hard. That was why she'd been passed over for senior partner at the firm. Or at least, that was what her uncle had told her. Cynthia was disappointed. She'd been striving for that job for years. Could she still work so hard when she had five kids to take care of? Cynthia knew that something was going to have to give. She just didn't know what. She decided to leave Derek in charge and have a shower to wash the peanut butter out of her hair. What sort of guy found a woman kissable when her hair was an oily mess? As she stepped under the hot water, her mind focused on the enigma that was Derek Kramer. Even though he spent as much as twenty hours a day with him, Cynthia found that she didn't know him particularly well. She knew what food he liked to eat. She knew what sort of work he was most proficient at. She knew he could have a dark sense of humor. Cynthia didn't know anything about his childhood, except that he'd been in foster care and didn't want her prying into it. Let's be honest, she reflected. She was going to find out what happened. It was just a matter of time. Cynthia hadn't known that he would be good with kids. Everything about his manner had suggested he would just find them annoying little things. Yet here he was, making pancakes and telling bedtime stories. He would make an excellent dad some day. For some reason, the thought did not appeal to her. Not him being a dad, that was fine. More like that he'd have to have a relationship with a woman to be a dad. Cynthia frowned. Okay, she admitted to herself. She'd been deliberately keeping him busy so that he wouldn't have time to go on dates and have relationships. He was hers. Not in a relationship way, but Cynthia had jealousy issues, and she'd never shared her toys. Alicia and she had argued over this facet of her personality all the time. They'd argued a lot. Alicia had been a homemaker, a housewife, a mother. She loved what she did and tried constantly to mother Cynthia, who had only been three years her junior. Cynthia had rebelled against all the mothering and had gone on to the business world where she was determined to prove herself. Only, who exactly was she proving herself to? Cynthia turned off the shower, wrapped a towel around herself, and went in search of clothes. Lately, she'd been discovering that, while she had Derek at her beck and call, business-wise, she was lonely. Her condo was beautiful, but empty. She wasn't going to make senior partner. The next opening wouldn't be for another twenty years unless one of the other partners became ill and needed to retire early. That was a long time in a career for nothing to happen. She'd gone on the date with Carl, even as she'd felt something was off about him, because she was lonely. Cynthia admitted that Alicia might have been right. Life alone was no life at all. So what did she want? What could she do now that she had five kids in her life? She had at least seventeen years of caregiving to give to them if she made the commitment to keep them. How did single moms find guys willing to take on not one, but five children who weren't theirs? 
Cynthia thought about Derek. He was younger than her. She wasn't exactly sure how young, but he was definitely fine. The question was, what did she want from him? Moreover, what did she want for herself? Her life had changed, and she wasn't certain how she was going to cope with it. Derek raided the fridge with Sarah. By the time the other kids were up, he was ready with pancakes and fruit. The table had been set, and everyone had a chance at a decent breakfast. He was mildly proud of himself, even if it was only breakfast. He rarely cooked since his college days. Then that had been his chick magnet, being a guy who cooked and did dishes. Nowadays, he just didn't have time. "'Are you her boyfriend?' Simon asked Derek curiously. "'What?' Derek paused, feeling a bit like a deer in headlights. "'No, I'm her paralegal.' "'What's a paralegal?' He poked at the berries in his pancake. It was Simon's fifth one, so Derek didn't feel bad. "'I do lots of lawyer stuff without being a lawyer.' Derek really didn't know how else to explain it. "'Help your aunt do her job well.' "'So you're basically her minion,' Simon stated as he pushed up his glasses. "'Something like that,' Derek said wryly. "'Does that include housework?' Simon chewed a piece of pancake, blinking at Derek. "'No.' Derek frowned. He sensed a trap was coming. I hope not. Why? Because laundry is piling up, Simon informed Derek. I'm pretty sure I heard Serena yelling about clean underwear this morning. Doesn't she know how to run a washing machine? Derek looked at Simon in confusion. She's fourteen and you're twelve. You should both know how. Nope. Simon fed the last of the pancake to Boomer, who was waiting patiently, panting beside the boy. Mom always did it. Great. Derek sighed. Well, today after school you're both getting a crash course. Does that mean you're going to be around after school? I would think so. Derek didn't think that Cynthia felt comfortable alone with the kids yet. It meant that she would likely want him to bring work here to the house so that she wouldn't have to deal with them alone. Not that they tended to get a lot of work finished with five kids demanding time. Derek wondered that he hadn't been repeating his mantra of needing a new job very much lately. Probably because he was entertained to see how Cynthia was coping with the new challenges in her life. Cool. Simon grabbed one of the bagged lunches off the counter and headed toward his room to get ready for school. Derek popped another bologna sandwich into a brown sack. Since Cynthia had disappeared, he decided to make lunches for the kids as well. He hoped no one had any preferences or allergies, especially since the fridge was starting to get low on necessities. Some shopping needed to get done. Derek eyed the living room. Some cleaning needed to happen as well. Sean's Lego creations were everywhere, creating a stepping hazard, not to mention all of Serenity's baby toys. Frowning, Derek grabbed a tub and started gathering up the stuff. "'Hey, Mr. Mom,' Serena said. "'Can I get a twenty for lunch?' Twenty For lunch?' Derek raised an eyebrow. "'I'm pretty sure cafeteria food doesn't cost that much. Besides, I made lunches.' You can grab one of the brown bags from the kitchen. Serena wrinkled her nose. She looked a lot like her aunt when she was displeased. I want to go downtown with my friends for lunch. Still isn't going to cost you twenty bucks. Derek scooped up a couple of dolls, adding them to his pile. Are you a little young to be going downtown? Mom let me do it all the time, she protested with a pout. Derek narrowed his eyes and looked at her. Really? Yeah. Serena said sullenly. Try again. Derek sensed she was lying. No, not happening. That's so unfair. Serena stamped her foot. Grab the bag. He pointed to the neat row of lunches on the counter. Don't even think of going to your aunt over this. Serena snapped up a bag and groused as she looked inside. Really? Bologna? Isn't there anything else? You could look in the fridge and make your own lunch, Derek suggested. It didn't hurt his feelings any if she did. He wouldn't mind a bologna sandwich for lunch. She cracked open the fridge door. There's nothing to eat. I don't know. Derek folded a blanket that had been discarded on the floor. If you're really inventive, olives and peanut butter sandwiches aren't bad. Ah! Oh! Serena shut the fridge and stomped away, taking the bagged lunch with her. Derek quickly pulled out his cell phone and speed dialed Cynthia. You're in the same house as me? You could just knock on the bedroom door. Cynthia drawled as she answered his call. Serena's coming to ask for cash for lunch. She doesn't need it. Derek went straight to the point. 
One, because twenty dollars is extortion for a simple lunch. Two, because she's too young to be heading downtown with her girlfriends for lunch period. If she says her mom used to let her, she's lying. How do you know? Cynthia asked curiously. Trust me, Derek responded confidently. I had a childhood full of lying kids. Excuse me, I'm on the phone, Serena. Cynthia's voice became muffled. I have to go. Remember, Derek said firmly, no cash unless cafeteria, which should cost ten. No downtown. Gotcha. Cynthia hung up. Derek hoped she wouldn't let herself get wheedled out of the money or talked into allowing Serena to do things she shouldn't. He caught sight of Sean. Pants, little dude. You need to wear pants. I'm hot, Sean responded plaintively. Derek shook his head. I'm wearing pants. You get to wear pants, too. Sean sighed. He narrowed his eyes at Derek as if deciding if he should try to defy him. Let's go pick out some pants. Derek held out a hand and waited. After a moment, Sean's shoulders drooped, and he grabbed Derek's hand. A successful five minutes later, they had chosen green pants with a dinosaur on it. Derek got Serenity up and ready for the day. Soon, she and Sean were happily eating breakfast. He rapped on Sarah's door. Hey, Toothless, you ready for school yet? A giggle greeted him as she swung open her door. I'm not toothless. I'm just missing one. What are you going to do with your newfound wealth? he asked. I'm going to buy a pony, Sarah said happily. Wow, Derek nodded. Good luck with that. Ready for final inspection? I need you to do my hair. She held out her arms and twirled. Otherwise, I'm all dressed and have my backpack. Cool. Get me a brush and meet me in the kitchen. Derek wondered why it seemed like the kids were always coming to him rather than Cynthia. She was their aunt. He shrugged and went back to the kitchen to supervise the smaller two. Ready for a big day at daycare? Sean nodded. Blueberry smeared on his face. I'm going to play trucks today. That is a good idea. Derek agreed easily with the little boy. Trucks are fun. Yeah, trucks are fun. Sean stuffed another piece of pancake into his tiny body. How do you do it? Cynthia looked at the mess in the kitchen. It's like a bomb went off in here. <laughs> Don't worry. Five kids, one adult, and one dog got fed. Derek frowned. Have you seen the other dog? Isn't it called Digger? No, I haven't seen it. Cynthia sat down. She looked perfect as usual. Would you be offended if I don't eat? He set a cup of coffee in front of her. One less set of dishes. I'm here, Sarah screeched to a halt, holding out the brush. What are we doing today, Sprite? Derek took the brush and pulled out a kitchen chair. Sarah hopped up onto the chair, holding out a scrunchie. Ponytail! Ponytail it is, he began confidently brushing her hair. Where did you even learn that? Cynthia frowned as she watched him. This was a whole new side of Derek that she'd never seen before. It's not hard to brush hair. As long as she doesn't ask for anything fancy, I'm sure we'll be fine, Derek smirked. While I'm taking care of your kids, want to load the dishwasher? Cynthia gave a shudder. Let the maid do it. Um, Sin, in case you haven't noticed, there is no maid, no cook, no housekeeper, no laundry service, or pet walkers. Derek said wryly as he twisted back Sarah's hair, capturing it in the hideously bright pink scrunchie. That's something you either need to hire or learn to do yourself. Thanks, Sarah sang in her high little voice, jumping off the chair and running away. Why would I learn to do it? Cynthia smiled sweetly. She kind of liked the way he called her sin. I have you. No. Derek said this firmly. He started putting dirty dishes into the dishwasher, pans going into the sink. What do you mean, no? Cynthia asked with a frown. I cannot be your paralegal, P.A., cook, and bottle washer. He shrugged, popping a blueberry into his mouth. I won't. I'll never sleep. I barely function and sleep as it is. Thankfully, Missy is back Monday. Missy quit. Cynthia lobbed that little bit of truth out to see how he'd react. She'd been hiding that fact for the past two weeks. What? Derek stopped and looked at her gobsmacked. What did you just say? She quit, she repeated. She absently took a pancake and started cutting it delicately. She hated working for me. So do you, but you happen to stay. You said I hate working for you. He frowned. He couldn't believe that Missy wasn't coming back. It was tantamount to treason in his books. I sent birthday flowers to that ungrateful wretch. wonder if I can cancel that yet. You say it every day, multiple times a day. Cynthia arched an eyebrow. 
Don't think I haven't noticed you muttering about how you need another job as you work around the office. Derek shrugged, feeling a little defensive. He had no idea that she knew his feelings on the subject. Lots of people hate their job, but stick with it. However, you need to hire a new PA immediately. You should have been trying to hire one the moment she quit, instead of logging me down with all her work as well. <laughs> You'll get around to it. She munched on the pancake. There is are quite good. No, he pointed a spatula at her before putting in the dishwasher and running a washcloth under the tap. You will hire your PA. It's your responsibility. I choose to delegate. Cynthia took a sip of coffee and enjoyed another bite. No, Derek said again, wiping Sean's mouth with the damp cloth. I don't have time. Then I guess you'll just have to keep doing PA duty since I'm not going to lift a finger. Cynthia pointed at the pancakes as she took another. What do you put in these? Derek looked up and prayed for a bit of patience. A wicked thought came to him, and he smiled. Okay, fine. I'll hire your PA. Cynthia frowned in concern. She didn't like his sudden about face on the subject. What is that little smile about? What are you planning? You'll see. He wiped Serenity's face and hands. He was going to find the most annoying PA possible. One that was good at the job, but had an impressively bad habit. Or bad personal hygiene. Or maybe a weird laugh. The possibilities were endless. Interviews were going to be such fun. I don't think I like this turn of attitude. Cynthia contemplated as she watched Derek a little suspiciously. He ignored her and yelled up the stairs. Van is leaving in five. If you don't make it to the van, you get to come to the office with me where you'll be impressively bored and the only thing I'll let you do is staple papers. Get a move on. Staple papers? Sean said with some interest. Not you, buddy, Derek replied. You might staple your pants. Besides, you said it was truck day. He nodded solemnly. Truck day. Stapling papers? That's your threat? A smile tugged at Cynthia's mouth as she sipped the last of her coffee. A single sheet of paper and a stapler for eight hours. It's the most boring thing anyone can do, and some people in the office can't even handle that. Derek wiped down the counter and table with a clean cloth. Who can't handle stapling papers? Cynthia rolled her eyes in disbelief. Bob the pygmy goat? Derek stopped abruptly and put a hand to his face. I shouldn't have said that. He's an okay guy. I'm just sleep-deprived. Who is Bob? she asked, suddenly interested. Bob, who works at the office? He looked at her with some surprise. You know, the building that you work in as well? He lives in the cubicle farm with me and all the other cubicle people. Cynthia got up and put her cup in the sink. I like it when you're sleep-deprived. You say the most interesting things. She deliberately brushed her arm along his as she passed him in the narrow space between the island and the counter of the kitchen. Do you do that deliberately? Derek leaned against the counter and watched her. Cynthia tried to look innocent. What? Think of ways to deprive me of sleep to see what I'll say and do next? He frowned. Like, do you set an alarm and then call me just to make sure I'm still up and working? She laughed. If I really wanted to deprive you of your sleep, I'd let you into my... Cynthia stopped abruptly as Serena and Simon thundered down the stairs. Ready, Simon announced. You're what? Derek asked Cynthia curiously, wondering where she had been going with the conversation. She walked up to him, laid a hand on his chest, went on her tippy toes and whispered in his ear, Bed. Derek's jaw dropped as he stared at her. Having accomplished that, Cynthia gave him a little pat on the chest before walking away to get her purse and shoes. She made sure she put a little swing in her hips just in case he was watching her leave. I'll take the school route if you take daycare. Meet you back at the office. Derek swallowed hard. Sure thing. Chapter 7 She'd flirted with him. Derek still couldn't believe it. He was back in the cubicle farm, pretending to type, since he couldn't wrap his head around much of anything right now after Cynthia had said such a suggestive comment, patting him on the chest. He was still having trouble breathing. After she had left, Derek had managed to find the other dog locked in Sarah's closet with a tutu on the poor thing. He'd let the dogs do their business, cleaned out the cat litter, which hadn't been touched in who knew how long, gag, and put the trash out. Fortunately, someone was feeding the bird and taking Peanut's newspapers out, so he didn't have to. Sean and Serenity were safely dropped off at daycare. 
Now his mind kept going back to the kiss and her response. Derek, I know you've got an answer. Minnie appeared out of nowhere and draped her plump arms over the cubicle wall. Derek pressed a hand to his chest to still his racing heart. He took a deep breath. This was what he got for not paying attention. Can I help you, Minnie? You definitely can. Minnie leaned forward. How do we get Lonnie fired? Derek laughed. Are you serious? Hey, Derek. Bob stepped out from behind Minnie. Hey, I'm serious. Deadly serious. What did he do now? Derek leaned back in his chair, glad for the distraction. It wasn't like he was being productive mooning over his boss. He made fun of my boy Bob here. Minnie was indignant. Hey, he said that I was so short I would need a stool to reach my lady if I ever got one. Bob waved his spindly little arms in agitation. Not cool, Derek agreed. He rubbed his face with a hand, thinking. We all know Lonnie isn't exactly nice. Minnie snorted. If you want to get him fired, you're going to have to prove to Pete that he's incompetent. Derek shook his head at the futility of that course of action. Let's face it. Lonnie's been incompetent since before he got hired by the firm, and Pete hasn't noticed it yet. I don't know what else you could do. Hey, could we make him want to quit? Bob narrowed his eyes. Harass him? Derek frowned. As much as I don't like the guy, I'm not going to start bullying him. Shame, Bob sighed. Well, I'm going to tell him he can't treat his fellow employees like this, Minnie said resolutely. It's rude, that's what it is. It is, but do you think Lonnie will change his behavior if you confront him? Derek asked. He hated to mention the obvious, but many had to be realistic. Minnie sighed. You've got a point, Derek. What are we going to do? Let me think about it, Derek frowned, like he needed this on his plate as well. However, he actually liked most of the people in his cubicle farm. Weird, but true. I'll get back to you. Hey, thanks, man. Bob gave Derek a short nod of respect before going back to his own tiny space. I knew you were the one to go to, Minnie said with a firm conviction. You're a good guy, Derek. He watched her leave and then grabbed his phone. Immediately, Derek called for delivery of five boxes of donuts. He needed to get the animals in the farm fed so they wouldn't be so unhappy. Plus, eating a donut might help him think about what to do. Merle popped her head up over in the next cubicle, causing Derek to jump in surprise. He really wasn't paying attention today. Word on the street is that you're going to get Lonnie fired. No. Derek slowly released the death grip his fingers had taken on the arms of his office chair. I'm not. That's disappointing. Merle snapped off the end of a carrot with her teeth and chewed rapidly, crunching through the vegetable, her round cheeks rotating with the effort. And just like that, it came to him, sweet and beautiful. Derek smiled as a plan formed in his mind. Merle, you're a genius. I am? She paused, blinking at him through her glasses, a carrot stick halfway to her mouth. How? Staff meeting at the water cooler at eleven. Derek grinned confidently. Spread the word. Sure thing. Merle was intrigued. She descended from view, still crunching. Derek returned to work a smile still tugging on his mouth as he sorted through papers. Kissing and flirting in the morning, then donuts and sweet revenge. It was going to be a great day. The donuts arrived at the same time as the morning meeting Derek had scheduled via word of mouth amongst the cumicle farm. Everyone gathered for water and the sweet confections. Derek hung back a moment to snag Lonnie. Hey, Lonnie, I heard your boss Pete was looking for you. He didn't sound too happy, so if I were you, I might get him a coffee or something before finding him, Derek advised, a hand on Lonnie's shoulder. Lonnie's eyes widened. Do you think it was about the Lester case? I think I may have made a mistake, and I haven't been able to swipe the file back to fix it without him noticing. Wow, I really don't know, Lonnie. He was muttering a lot, Derek improvised quickly. Whatever gourmet coffee he takes, I'd get it to soften him up before you face the music. Thanks, Derek. You're a friend, Lonnie hurried away. Not really, Derek muttered. He joined the rest of the herd in the staff room, shutting the door. Okay, consensus is that we want to get rid of Lonnie, but it's just not feasible right now. There were some groans. Derek raised his hands to quiet them. However, we can distract Lonnie for a while. I'm thinking he'll be a little less annoying to us if we can turn his attention elsewhere. 
more specifically to someone else. What do you mean? Henny asked around a powdered donut. Who is the most annoying woman in the firm? Derek asked with a grin, feeling certain they would feel as he did. Cynthia Stone, Roger said darkly. That wiped the grin right off of Derek's face. No, try again. They looked at him blankly. Jill? Jill Greenberg? The copy room queen? Derek suggested. Ah! Minnie nodded in agreement. I hate how she thinks she's better than us just because she's in charge of some people. Hey, she wouldn't let me grab a piece of paper to jot a note down, Bob scowled. Hey, we all know the copy room has plenty of paper. She's mean, Merle crunched another carrot stick. I don't like her. Here's the plan, Derek smiled again. We drop nice big fat hints to Lonnie that dear Jill thinks he's hot, that she wants him to ask her out, that she has a thing for him but is shy and will likely deny it. Tell him he'll need to pursue her, be romantic, all of that. Ooh, Henny's eyes got wide. That's evil. I love it. Hey, do you think it will get him off her backs? Bob asked. He really wanted solution to the Lonnie problem. I think Lonnie is looking for love and Jill is lonely, Derek shrugged. Maybe there'll be a match made in heaven. Maybe she'll file harassment charges against him. Either way is a win. Everybody in? Roger asked, looking over the group. The general consensus was that this was the new plan. Excellent. Derek grabbed a sprinkled donut. If Lonnie starts annoying you, start directing his attention to Jill. He exited the staff room, pleased with himself. Crisis on the farm had been averted. Derek had been impressed by how quickly the three employment agencies had filled his request to interview people for the available position at his firm. He may have exaggerated a few things to speed up the process, but the fifty hopeful strangers looking at him from the lounge was excellent in his opinion. He picked another applicant at random and asked him to follow Derek to a small office. Derek looked at the teenager in front of him. Do you have any experience being a PA? No. The dude has to start somewhere, right? The pimpled youth blinked at him. True. However, we are looking for someone to start immediately and hit the ground running with little need for supervision. Derek sighed. I'm afraid you aren't going to fit that need. I learn fast, he insisted. Okay, Derek handed him a thick file. I need 17 copies collated, in order, and on my desk in 20 minutes or less. I also need you to order more staples, type up a media release for the journal, call and cancel that appointment with Barney today. Don't forget to get a triple latte mocha, heavy on the whipped cream, one shot of caramel, on Ms. Stone's desk in exactly 15 minutes. What? The youth blinked. I have to fetch coffee? That's what a PA does. Derek struck the kid's name off the list. I don't think we're going to work out. Thank you for coming in to the interview. Derek watched the kid leave, then went to the waiting room, where a handful of people were waiting to be interviewed. Anyone else here under 20? No? Good. Next. How do we know who's next? A woman asked. She checked her watch. My interview was for one, and now it's one fifteen. You're not next. Derek had slotted everyone in for one in the afternoon. It made more fun to see who would be patient enough to get the job. He pointed to a larger framed, sweating woman. You're next. The woman heaved herself out of the low couch. Derek could sympathize. He was tall, and when he sat on those couches, he felt like his knees were by his ears. This woman was an Amazon. She looked down on him because she had Derek beat by an inch. Probably by forty pounds, too. None of it appeared to be fat. She looked like she could arm-wrestle anyone and win. He liked that. She would be very intimidating. Derek held out his hand and introduced himself. Derek Kramer, why don't you have a seat and tell me about yourself? I'm Elaine. I'm fifty years old. I'm a grandmother. I recently graduated from college and would love the opportunity to become your P.A., Mr. Kramer. Elaine said, squeezing his hand. Derek was glad to get it back. Second career? Derek asked, not bothering to inform her that he wasn't the one getting a P.A. Yes. Originally I was a wrestler, but I decided to retire from that line of work. She smiled. That's interesting. He noticed there was a bit of an odor coming from her. He did want the new P.A. to be annoying to Cynthia, but not annoying to him. Derek felt a little let down. 
So you are inexperienced. Perhaps, but I received excellent marks in my program, Elaine stated confidently. You can see that by my resume. I included my average. Derek flipped the pages to have a look. Impressive. Do you have benefits here? she inquired. Derek abruptly stood and offered his hand. He liked the wrestler part. He couldn't take the odor part. He wondered if she used that particular natural feat to win her matches. Thank you, Elaine, for the resume and interview. We'll be in touch. That's it? She looked confused as he ushered her out the door. That's it? Derek smiled. He pointed at random to the room. You, sir, you're next. The man pushed his glasses up and came forward, hugging his briefcase. I'm Nelson. Welcome, Nelson. Right this way. Derek ushered him into the small office. He commandeered it from Dave, who was on vacation. Nelson, why don't you tell me why you would like the job? Nelson pushed his glasses up again. My wife kicked me out, and I need to pay the rent on my new place. I've been a virtual PA for seventeen years, but I need something full-time with a steady income, now that I'm no longer in a combined income household. Excellent. Derek liked the noisel tone on this man. What would you do with a demanding boss? I've been married to one for twenty-five years, Nelson said blankly. If I can put up with her, I can put up with anyone. Points for honesty. Derek watched him adjust his glasses again. That would drive Cynthia up the wall. How are you with multitasking? I used to assist many clients at the same time. Nelson shrugged and hugged the briefcase like it contained national secrets. I do fine multitasking. My references are impeccable. Derek skimmed the name of references. You worked for Sally Winthrop? I'm sorry I had to stop working for her. She's a great person, but can only give me fifteen hours a week. Like I said, I need something steadier. Nelson looked a little mournful. How's your health? Derek asked. Some of the job will be very physical. You may have to walk down to the copy room numerous times a day carrying files. Will you be able to manage that? I'm healthier since I had the heart attack. Say again? Abruptly, Derek looked up from the resume with real concern. Pardon? I've been on blood thinners, exercising, been on a new diet. I'm much healthier now, Nelson explained. That's why the wife and I are on the outs. She's on that Cato diet, and the doctor has me on a different one. Low fat and low sodium. She hates cooking twice. That must be difficult. Derek eyed the briefcase, which Nelson was still guarding against his chest. You have no idea, Nelson replied. That briefcase was going to drive him crazy. It would make the dragon go positively insane. Provided Nelson's recommendations turned out, he was perfect. Derek stood up. Thank you for your time, Nelson. I'll get in contact with you very soon. Oh. Nelson shook Derek's hand. I look forward to it. Derek escorted Nelson out and looked at the rest of the interviewees still waiting. I have time for one more. You. A pretty young blonde stood up with a nervous smile to the groans of the rest of those waiting. Some grumbled as they gathered their stuff to leave. Derek ignored them and escorted the girl to the office he was using for interviews. Your name? Derek set down his interview checklist. He didn't need it for this girl. Hi, I'm Sue Ellen. She gave him a shy but perfect smile. I'm Derek Kramer. What made you apply for the position? Derek sat down and enjoyed just looking at her. She was the picture of young innocence. Well, I'm just out of school, and I'd rather not wait tables. Sue Ellen sat down across from him, crossing her legs and leaning forward slightly. She looked like she was positively interested in anything he had to say. I'm going to be a big film star some day. Really? Derek nodded his head like he cared. Oh, yes, she breathed happily. I'd like to launch my career here, then head to Hollywood. Some day soon, you'll be seeing me getting my own star on the sidewalk with, like, the other famous people. Wow, he commented. Sue Ellen was pretty to look at. She didn't have very good legs, though. They were too thin, like the fashion these days. Then again, she really didn't do anything for Derek besides a pretty face. Probably because she was young and silly. A lot of guys like young and silly. 
Derek didn't have much patience for it. Right now, he could enjoy it for fifteen minutes. Then he'd had scored her out of his life. It was perfect. Sue Ellen droned on about how she was going to jump from some obscure independent film that hadn't even been made yet to become a superstar, in constant demand by directors everywhere. Derek listened and basked in her beauty. His phone chirped. He ignored it. A moment later, it started ringing again. With a sigh, he answered it. Kramer. Not her, Cynthia said adamantly. What? Why not? Derek tried to keep the smirk off his face. He had no intention of hiring Miss Hollywood here, but it was fun to poke Cynthia once in a while. I'd like you to pay attention to your work rather than drool over the bimbo, she replied curtly. Derek sat up a little straighter, amused. I'd like to think I'm more professional than that. Really? What are you doing right now? Cynthia questioned a little sharply. You've been in that office with her the longest. Tell me she's not your primary candidate. Okay, Derek said easily. He wasn't lying. She's not my primary candidate. Are you just pulling my leg or are you serious? Cynthia asked. I don't want her. Why? She comes highly recommended with great experience. He pretended to look at her resume, certain that Cynthia was watching through the glass walls. In fact, she beats the rest hands down. She's too... Cynthia stopped abruptly. To what? Derek prodded happily. Never mind, she growled. You're not hiring her as my PA, and that's final. Wait a moment. Are you threatened by her? Derek eyed Sue Ellen. She was younger. Some people might think she was prettier than Cynthia, although in his opinion that wasn't true. Was Cynthia a little jealous? Did she think the girl would get more attention? Well, to be fair, she probably would, simply because she was much more approachable than his boss. I'm not, Cynthia groused in protest. Now send her on her way and find someone appropriate. Miss Stone, Derek kindly reminded her, enjoying playing devil's advocate. You entrusted me to find you the perfect PA. I believe that I have. He ended the call on her protests and gave Sue Ellen a blinding smile as he rose from his seat and extended a hand to her. I'm so glad you've dropped by. I really enjoyed hearing about how you're going to be a star. Thank you, Sue Ellen popped up, smiling with enthusiasm as she took his hand. Are you going to answer your phone? No. Derek continued to smile as he ignored the ringing. He escorted her out of the room, making sure to put a hand in the small of Sue Ellen's back. He thought he could feel her backbone. Ugh, not a turn-on. Do you think you'll live in Beverly Hills? Malibu, she nodded very seriously. I hear the beaches are the best there. He could feel Cynthia approaching. Derek gave Sue Ellen a last handshake. I'll be in touch. Great, she smiled as she headed for the elevators. Not a moment too soon as Cynthia charged up to him. Not her. Derek shrugged nonchalantly. I thought you wanted the best. I do. She grimaced as she glanced at the elevators where Sue Ellen stepped into one heading for the ground floor. Just not her. And what was that? What was what? He asked innocently. The hand on her back? Cynthia narrowed her eyes. Was that really necessary? I was just being polite, escorting her to the elevators, he explained with an innocent shrug. You didn't do that to the guy before her, Cynthia growled. Oh, she was definitely jealous. Derek found that a great ego boost. He made sure not to smile. Come with me. What? She was thrown off by his request. Where? Just come with me. Derek hit the service elevator button and hoped that the car would be empty when it arrived. The door slid open, and he was in luck. He walked in and waited for Cynthia to follow before hitting the button to the ground floor. Where are we going? Cynthia suspiciously watched him. Derek let himself grin and tapped the button to make the elevator car stop. He reached out and pulled Cynthia into his arms, kissing her. She tasted like a triple latte mocha, heavy on the whipped cream with one shot of caramel. While he didn't like the girly coffee, he liked it on her lips. Derek lifted his head a moment. I'm not hiring that girl. Good. Cynthia was a little flushed as she leaned against him. She reached up to kiss him again when a voice came over the speakers. Is everything all right in there? Derek reluctantly let go of her and pushed the button to connect them to the speaker. We're good. I'm going to set the elevator back into motion, the disembodied voice from security said. Thanks. Derek stepped back. 
where are we going cynthia straightened her blouse running a hand over her skirt as her heart hammered in her chest i'm going to the copy room to pick up some files derrick straightened his tie as the elevator doors opened he had a self-satisfied smile i'm not sure where you're going cynthia watched him step out the elevator doors closed after him and she leaned back against the wall fanning herself with one hand she was going crazy and he was driving her there After the whites, darks, and colors are separated, you can stuff some of it into the machine. Don't overfill it, or nothing will move. Don't underfill it, because that's just wasteful, Derek explained. He watched Simon grab an armful of whites and pop them into the machine. Do we really have to do this? Serena asked in an annoyed voice. Mom always did laundry. Things have changed, Derek responded. Your mom chose to stay home and take care of you, so she had time to do these chores. Your aunt works, and so do I. It's also good for you to know how to do things when all of you go off to college, so you're not completely ignorant of simple life skills. It's not hard, Simon added as he put another armful into the machine. You don't have to do it, Derek shrugged. Great. Serena headed for the laundry room door. You don't have to have clean clothes, either, Derek mentioned casually. I mean, it's nice to have fresh, clean clothes, but if you don't want to learn how to properly run the washer and dryer... She sighed dramatically. I'll pay Simon to do laundry for me. With what money? Derek asked in some amusement. My allowance, Serena replied smugly. Aunt Cynthia is giving us an allowance, right? Simon, did Aunt Cynthia mention anything about that idea? Derek frowned as he looked at the boy. Not to me. Simon pushed his glasses up. Derek fished his phone out of his pocket. He dialed Cynthia and put her on speaker. Yes, Cynthia inquired. Allowances? Derek asked. You're on speaker. We talked about the possibility of allowances. I've made no commitment, she responded. I wanted to do a little research first. Excellent. Derek nodded. I'm of the opinion the people should earn their money, not have it given to them unless it's a special occasion like a birthday or graduation. I go to work every day to earn my money. It's not realistic for kids to think that money just gets handed to them. You make a good point. Plus, it will be easier on my wallet, Cynthia agreed. Serena groaned. What about when I need cash for personal stuff? Get a casual job, Derek offered. Cut grass, babysit, pull weeds out of flower beds, do house cleaning. The possibilities are endless. You said you won't pay me for doing chores around the house, she accused him. You live here, you eat here, you don't have to pay the utilities or any rent, Derek shrugged. Go ask the grandma next door if she needs help with anything. This is so unfair, Serena huffed. No one said life was fair. Derek shrugged again. Now, to continue our lesson, this is the soap dispenser where you can put in detergent, bleach, and fabric softener. Cynthia hung up the phone. She should probably be taking lessons right with the kids on how to do laundry. Since she mostly had her suits dry cleaned and a cleaning service at her condo once a week, she hadn't bothered to learn how to do laundry. Alicia or their mother had always done the laundry when she lived at home. Her thoughts were cut off as the doorbell rang. Cynthia put down the case file she'd been reviewing and got up to answer the door, but she was too slow. I got it! Sarah slid past in her socks at a rate of high speed. Slow down! Cynthia called after the little girl. Some day, Sarah was going to have hit something and lose one of her permanent teeth. Cynthia hurried after her. Hi! Sarah flung the door wide open. Another church couple held up a frozen casserole dish. Cynthia mustered up a smile. Oh, how nice. And you are? The Suttons. I'm Mary, and this is Joe. The woman introduced them. We brought a bean casserole. It's always good to eat healthy. Cynthia struggled to keep the smile on her face. Really? What kid wanted to eat a bean casserole? She didn't want to eat a bean casserole. However, she was grateful for the thought that Mary had put behind the gesture. You are so right. I appreciate this. Mary offered the dish to Cynthia. Our name is on the dish, so you know who to return it to. Don't forget to remove that before you put it in the oven. 400 degrees for 30 minutes, then 300 for 20. After that, it's perfect to eat. Wonderful. Cynthia would stuff it in the freezer with the other 40 casseroles that generous church members had stocked her house with. Thank you. At least they wouldn't starve. 
You're very welcome. Our church takes care of our members. Mary smiled. Take care. Cynthia watched as Mary and Joe walked to their car. She frowned as she looked at the dish in her hand. Would she be expected to bring a casserole to some other family when the next church funeral happened? Sarah, please shut the door. Cynthia went to the nearly full freezer and looked at the pile of casseroles. She moved some around. Every single one of them was in a glass container. These were all homemade. No way was she going to get away with buying a casserole from the store and sticking it in some Pyrex. Forget laundry, Cynthia groaned. She was going to have to learn to cook. Chapter 8 Explain Bob, the pygmy goat, to me. Cynthia looked out through her glass office wall at the sea of cubicles in the center of the floor. She recalled his comment about Bob not being able to handle a stapler and wanted to know the whole story. Derek sighed and stood beside her. I shouldn't have said that. I hoped you would have forgotten it by now. Which one is he? she asked. The little guy walking with a stack of files by the potted plants? Derek didn't point. He didn't want anyone to know that they were talking about them. He's got a goatee. Other than the goatee and he's small, I don't get it. Cynthia slanted a glance at Derek. He's a really nice guy. However, he has a bad habit of saying, hey, all the time. It sounds a little bit like a goat. He felt ashamed. Don't ever tell Bob that. Like I said, he's a nice guy. Do you have nicknames for the rest of them? Cynthia was curious. Derek sighed. Okay, if I tell you, I want you to promise you will never, ever bring this up again. You will never call any of them by their nicknames or infer anything. I like most of these people and would hate to see them unhappy with something I started. Cross my heart, pinky swear, Cynthia said solemnly. I'm serious? Derek tried to judge her response. So am I. Cynthia was a little put out by his reluctance. I promise I will never say a single word about it, except to you in private. I'll treat it as confidential. Derek knew that Cynthia took confidentiality very seriously. Okay, ever watch National Geographic? Cynthia smiled in anticipation as Derek leaned a little closer. When I was a lot younger. Derek spoke in a voice much like the narrator of the series. The pygmy goat, in his natural farm environment, interacts with many other animals. His spindly form and tiny stature makes him vulnerable. However, there are few predators in a domesticated environment. She snorted in amusement. Cynthia couldn't help herself. It was silly. The pygmy goat crosses paths with the local chicken. A female known as a hen, she likes to cluck and squawk at times. This hen is particularly mothering and tries to adopt as many of the other farm animals as she can manage to. She also will not keep all of her eggs in one basket, scattering her progeny all over the farmyard. Derek continued. They watched as Henny left a file on a nearby table, chatting to Bob, and then walked away, forgetting her file. The brain of the average chicken is reported to be the size of a green pea. The hen's forgetfulness may be attributed to this. However, the goodwill she has distributed throughout the farm amongst the other animals through her mothering actions will assist her. Minnie grabbed the file and waddled after Henny, waving it in the air. Cynthia stared, enthralled at the show going on before her. The black Angus gives a warning as she approaches, Derek commented. Hey! Cynthia cut him off with a look of warning. Isn't that a cow? Let me finish, he watched Minnie. Her glossy coat shows her prime of health. Her beautiful lines proclaimed her heritage. Mild-mannered and curious, the Angus is a queen of her farm, a gathering for other benign and curious animals. Hmm. Cynthia wasn't sure if she should be angry or not at his description. It was such a male thing to do, comparing a woman to a cow. She was a beautiful specimen. However, like her species, she tended to chew. A lot. Derek said dryly as Minnie popped a piece of granola bar into her mouth. They both watched her chew and chew. Doesn't she ever swallow? Cynthia cocked her head to the side, studying her. Fifty chews minimum. It used to drive me crazy. Now I've gotten over it. Derek shrugged. Ah, 
The groundhog pops her head up to see if she's missing out on anything. Note the rounded cheeks, poor eyesight, and tan coloring of the hair. She is simply a regular specimen of groundhog. She chews rapidly on a piece of cauliflower as her brain processes what dangers may lurk in the field. Satisfied, she descends back to her hole. Oh, my! Cynthia's shoulders shook as she clamped a hand over her mouth. She spotted Roger. Who is that? The weasel. With beady eyes and a furry twitching mustache, the weasel is generally known to be a poor guest at the farm. Usually, he steals the eggs of hens or can even harm hens. While he does have a habit of taking any offerings the hens may give him, the weasel tends to avoid her, despite her ignorance of the laws of animal nature and the danger he is supposed to present to her, the hen chases after him. Henny came forward to talk to Roger. He responded to her, but they were interrupted by Lonnie, who jumped between them, smiling. Henny and Roger abruptly left. Ah, uh, the farm dog. A dumb and silly animal, it enthusiastically jumps in where unwanted, sniffing, licking, and smiling. It generally annoys the other farm animals, Derek repressively muttered. No one likes him? Cynthia asked, sensing a dislike for Lonnie. You'd have to interact with him to understand why, Derek said repressively. If you don't have to subject yourself to that experience, I wouldn't. They watched Lonnie skitter away as Mr. Stone Sr. walked by. Who is he? Cynthia drew Derek a sly look, daring him to impugn her uncle. Farmer Stone. His presence drives all of the farm animals to behave. Derek didn't think it would offend her at all. See them scatter and be busy? She laughed. And who are you? I haven't figured that out yet. He shrugged. When I do, I'll let you know. Okay. She looked at him amused. Who am I? My boss? Derek grinned at her. But you've given me an animal nickname. Cynthia was certain of it. What is it? You are a dragon, he admitted. You swoop around the farm once in a while, terrifying all the little animals in your glory as you make your demands. You're sleek, impressive, and nearly immortal. Wow, she blinked. I'm not sure I live up to that. Well, I'm finding that you've got a softer side lately, Derek mentioned. I might have to revise your status. And what is Jameson? Cynthia had to know. A pig? Derek said promptly. I was pretty accurate on most accounts. Yet you say you haven't named yourself. She didn't believe him. Derek rolled his eyes. I'd like to be a fox, but I'm afraid I'm just not that cunning. Oh, I don't know. Cynthia looked him over. I think there may be much more to you than meets the eye. She was giving him all sorts of sexy signals, but Derek knew they were on display since the walls of her office were made of glass. As much as he might want to make a move, he shouldn't. Bob timidly knocked on Cynthia's door. Derek was glad for the interruption. The more time he and Cynthia were spending together lately, the harder it was to keep his hands to himself. It didn't help that she was actively encouraging him. Derek opened the door. Hey, Bob. Hey. Bob looked from Derek to Cynthia. Hey. Mr. Jameson wants to see you about a case, Miss Stone. Hey. An appeal has been filed against his clients, and you've been involved in the case before acting against them. I hope he isn't going up against any of my clients, Cynthia frowned. I'd be in violation of the rules of the firm. Hey, no, ma'am. Bob shook his head. I believe the appeal is in regards to another child. Oh, Cynthia was mollified by his response. Lead the way. Hey, Bob retreated. Cynthia paused by Derek for just a moment and ran a hand along his arm before following Bob. Derek took a deep breath to steady himself. Instead, he caught a whiff of Cynthia's perfume. This was not good. They couldn't continue like this at work and not expect someone to notice. It was his job on the line. Not that he particularly loved his job, but it was the only one he had. Derek rejoined the cubicle farm and Minnie immediately came over to him. Operation Jill and Lonnie is a huge success, she whispered excitedly. Lonnie has just gotten tips to woo her from Roger. He's going to chat her up in the copy room. Roger giving out advice on dating? Probably not Lonnie's ticket to success, Derek mused. He shrugged internally. It really wasn't his problem. 
Cool. Just remember, we want to be a little subtle. Encourage him, but don't let him think we're all conspiring against him. Right, Minnie nodded seriously. Absolutely. This is exciting. Derek had to smile as she went back to her own tasks. Who knew everyone could pull together like this? Merle popped up, scanning the room with a militant gleam in her eye. Seeing nothing important, she descended into her cubicle again. Derek briefly wondered what was going on. Merle seemed a little more purposeful than her regular scattered self. With a sigh, he dismissed it. He had work to do. A half an hour later, he was deep into revising a document when the atmosphere in the room changed. Derek? Merle's voice quaked with determination as she announced too loudly, "'Could I use your stapler? Mine is broken.' "'Sure,' Derek frowned as he handed her his stapler. She was peering past him as she accepted it. Derek sat down and leaned back so he could see out of his cubicle opening. Sure enough, there was Lonnie coming back from the elevators. Did Merle just warn the group that Lonnie was approaching? Minnie had called it Operation Jill and Lonnie.' Were things getting out of hand? Derek hoped not. He didn't want to have to put an end to their fun. Lonnie approached Roger in his cubicle, and everyone in the farm cocked their ear to try to overhear what was being said. Derek shook his head. If Lonnie were bright enough, he'd realize what they were doing. Derek would have to take the group to task and tell them to mask their interest in Lonnie's love life a little better. Disappointingly, Derek was too far away to hear what Roger and Lonnie were talking about but he could see Bob making little nods as the conversation continued. He tore his attention away from the spectacle and got back to work. Lonnie left to get some water from the water cooler. Not able to take it any more, Derek got up and followed him. He slapped Lonnie on the shoulder. Hey, Lonnie, how are things going? Derek grabbed a paper cup and waited as Lonnie got his water. Great, Lonnie nodded enthusiastically. Do you happen to know anything about Jill from the copy room? Jill? Derek pretended to think. Is she one of the new interns? Nah, she runs the place, Lonnie said. She's kind of cute. Really? Derek shrugged like it made no difference to him. I'll have to take your word for it, because I barely see anyone when I go down there. Usually, Missy would take care of getting copies, but until I get the new PA situated, I've been doing it. Oh, yeah... Lonnie waved his water around, splashing Derek with it. Did you get someone? Derek smiled and ignored the drips on his suit jacket. Finally, yes. Hopefully it will make life a little easier. Cool. Lonnie waited as Derek got his drink of water. A guy like you. You would have some good tips on how to get the girl, right? A guy like me? Derek gave Lonnie a puzzled look. You know. Lonnie gave Derek a fake punch on the shoulder. A player? A player? Derek almost snorted. He hadn't dated anyone in eight years. He'd barely had two dates before college. He had nightmares that made his college girlfriends dump him and call him a freak. The only woman he'd made any moves on lately was his boss. Well, Derek said slowly, you need to find out what she likes. Ask the ladies she works with. Find out more about her, and then you can suggest you do those activities with her. Maybe you'll find out she likes to do something that you like to do, or at least pretend to like to do. It gives you something in common to talk about. That's a good tip, Lonnie nodded, thinking about it. I never thought of it that way. Which was probably why he was such a loser extraordinaire. Lonnie didn't much think about anyone except himself. If he were left to his own devices, he'd say something crude to Jill and it would be all over in ten seconds flat. Just treat her like a lady. Derek gave Lonnie a pat on the shoulder. I need to get back to work. Thanks for the advice, Lonnie said as he went back to his cubicle. Lonnie thanking him in a sincere manner? This day was getting more interesting by the minute, Derek thought. Triple Latte Mocha, heavy on the whipped cream, with one shot of caramel and a German eclair. Nelson sat the food down on Cynthia's desk. What? Cynthia frowned as she looked at him. Who are you? Nelson? He frowned back at her and pushed up his glasses. Cynthia stared at him. I don't understand. I'm your new PA, 
He held out a hand in greeting. I didn't order a new PA, Cynthia scowled. She had ordered a new PA. She just hadn't expected Derek to get her one so soon. Nor had she expected her PA to look like this. Nelson scratched his head. Well, Derek hired me for you. She wondered if he had head lice. If he did, he would have to go. Cynthia was not going to go through her children's hair with lice comb and mayonnaise. Get Derek for me. Yes, boss. Nelson nodded and exited the office. Cynthia wondered if he was serious or if he'd been flippant with the yes boss. With his nasal tone and deadpan expression, it was hard to tell. A few minutes later, Derek entered. She offered the chair across her desk with a gesture. I see you met your new PA. Derek grinned. He's got loads of experience, has great recommendations, and I like his personality. Cynthia raised an eyebrow. Derek sighed in disappointment. What's wrong with him? He got the order correct, right? He did, she allowed. He's just... What? Derek frowned at her. He's a neat guy. He needs the work. Did you take the time to get to know him, or just judged him right away? I'm not sure I like him. Cynthia fiddled with her pen, leaning back in her comfortable chair. You just sprung him on me, and I don't think I like that sort of surprise. Well, you could have gone through the effort to hire your own PA, Derek pointed out. He's right here now. Give him a chance. Fine, she growled, but you owe me. How can I possibly owe you? I hired the guy for you, Derek groused back. If anything, I should be getting my own PA for everything I do. Cynthia rolled her eyes. You're not that busy. We didn't even take the last three cases that were offered to us. Daycare runs to pick up and drop off the two sprites? Dinner and homework duties? Cleaning, since the concept seems to be foreign to you? Have you learned any cooking yet? He asked pointedly. I just started the class. Cynthia glared at him. We haven't gotten very far. Make sure you actually learn something to impress Mr. Davidson, our caseworker, with. Derek sighed. We still need to cut back on work. How? asked Cynthia a little sarcastically. Pretty soon we'll be doing the bare minimum that the firm allows for junior partner. Maybe you need to step down. Derek threw the idea out. I am not stepping down, Cynthia said firmly. She drew in a sharp breath at the thought. I work too hard to get to where I am. Well, we can't cut back on time with the kids, Derek responded and I need to sleep before I crack. You could sleep over, she made her new favorite suggestion. It would save you at least an hour's commute. In which I work. Derek rubbed his face with a hand. I get maybe three to four hours of sleep a night. I need to figure out a way to get two to four more hours free so I can finally sleep like a normal person. Maybe you need to organize yourself better, Cynthia shrugged. She felt like she was getting enough sleep. Although, she would get less if Derek would just take her up on her offer. Not helpful, he glared at her. She sighed. He was looking more frazzled lately. Not that he wasn't still performing well work-wise and doing good with the kids, but she could see that the lack of rest was wearing on him. We will figure something out. You're keeping the PA, Derek said. I can't keep doing my work, a PA's work, and help with the kids. You need a PA, and I need to lighten my workload. Fine, Cynthia rolled her eyes. I'll keep the PA. Good, Derek stood up. He's a nice guy. Give him a chance. I said okay, she repeated with a pout. Send him in and I'll put him to work. Derek gave her a tired smile. Thanks. She watched him leave. He looked so good in that suit. She wondered what he would look out of it. The idea was replaced as Nelson came in. You wanted to see me? He adjusted his glasses. Cynthia sighed. Enough daydreaming. Yes, why don't we have a seat and we'll get started. A full day of Nelson later, Cynthia had to admit he knew how to do his job. Nelson was just a little odd, in her opinion. Perhaps it was because she was used to cowing most people into doing her bidding, and it didn't work with him. He just didn't seem afraid of her at all. He was just efficient in a nasally, glasses-adjusting, holding onto his briefcase like the world might end if it wasn't in his possession sort of way. 
She didn't know where Derek had found this guy, but he had certainly gotten his revenge over Cynthia making Derek hire a PA. The briefcase thing was driving her batty. Cynthia looked for a way to get Derek to herself without drawing too much attention. He deserved a little reciprocation for hiring Nelson. It took nearly an hour between working to figure out and lay her trap. As soon as she saw him leave the cubicle farm, she nonchalantly headed out to ambush Minnie. "'Have you seen Mr. Kramer?' Minnie blinked at being addressed by Cynthia. Usually, Ms. Stone never spoke to anyone in the cubicle farm except for Derek. "'He just went down to the copy room.' "'Thanks.' Cynthia gave her a thin smile before heading to the elevators. Perfect. The copy room was en route to where she needed Derek to be. She couldn't have set this up better if she'd sent him there herself. On the copy room floor, she talked nicely to the maintenance staff supervisor and received a key. It was all too easy. Cynthia grabbed Derek on his way back from the copy room and hauled him into a janitor's closet. Derek stared at her in open-mouthed surprise as she shut the door behind her, locking it, showing off the key. Do you know how difficult it is to get a key to the janitor's closet? Derek snapped his mouth shut. No idea. It's very easy. She grinned, then pulled on his tie, looping an arm around his neck to kiss him. She melted into him, enjoying the sensations of what his touch brought to her. He was a fine kisser. He tasted like a sprinkled donut. Not that she was particularly partial to those, but he was tasty. Maybe she could get him to switch to German eclairs. He lifted his head and looked at her. This is a bit of a surprise. A nicer surprise than my new PA, she responded. Ah, so this is what it's all about. Well, partly about. Cynthia trailed a finger down his shirt. I have to say, the nasal voice, the deadpan expression, the constant adjusting of the glasses. Nelson is very interesting. Derek grinned. He's slightly annoying, you mean. However, he's good at his job. Good enough that you can probably overlook those idiosyncrasies. He is good at his job, Cynthia allowed. So far, he had excelled at everything she'd given him for tasks. However, there is one thing that is killing me about Nelson. What's that? Derek asked curiously, enjoying holding her close. The briefcase, Cynthia huffed. He holds onto it like it has national secrets in it. Derek couldn't stop himself from grinning. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Cynthia gave him a small slap on the chest. You hired him because of it. Hey, I want to know what's in the briefcase, Derek explained. If I didn't hire him, we would never find out. She sighed. This should not be a priority. It isn't, Derek shrugged and smiled. Yet if we happen to find out... What harm could there be? Cynthia leaned up a little. Exactly. Derek said before he kissed her again. There was a noise behind her which had Cynthia quickly jumping out of his arms. Derek cleared his throat. We could probably use these sides of bags. That'll be fine. Cynthia watched him grab a handful as the janitor looked at them suspiciously. Yes, that would work. She stepped past the janitor, head held high. Derek gave the man a nod. Dude, the janitor said quietly as he tugged on Derek's suit. Might want to wipe the lipstick off. Derek could feel himself flush. Thanks. Any time. The janitor gave him a wink and pushed his cart into the room. Derek ran a hand over his face, hoping to remove the worst of the lipstick. He'd have to see himself in a mirror to be sure he got all of it off. He still had the silly bags in his hand. Derek ducked into the first floor washrooms to check himself out in the mirror. He threw the bags into the trash. There was a smudge of pink. Derek quickly wiped it off. Either Cynthia had to get a different makeup, or they had to stop doing this. Who was he kidding? They had to stop. At least at work. Maybe altogether. Derek ran a hand through his hair and debated what he was going to do. Deciding that delaying the inevitable was a bad idea, he made his way to Cynthia's office where she had just already reapplied a generous measure of lipstick and looked entirely calm at her desk. It irked him a little. She should feel as off-kilter as he did. He plopped into a chair without an invite. We need to stop doing this. Doing what? Cynthia ignored him as she signed forms. Ducking into elevators and janitor's closets, Derek said firmly. At some point, we are going to get caught. 
I think it's fun, Cynthia gave him a saucy smile. Is it going to be as much fun when I get fired and you get a discipline hearing? Derek asked dryly. You're such a spoil sport. Cynthia sighed and set down her pen. What do you propose? As much as we both enjoy these little interludes, we need to stop it at work. He hesitated before adding, We probably shouldn't do them in front of the kids, either. Well, that pretty much covers 90% of our day except for our sleeping moments, Cynthia frowned at him. Unless you want to sleep with me. Derek swallowed hard. I do, but that's not going to happen just yet. Again, you need to set example for the kids. Plus, I don't think Mr. Davison would like us cohabitating. Cohabitating? She liked the idea. You're much better with the kids than I am. If anything, this ought to be considered a brilliant idea. It benefits us all. Do you really think your caseworker is going to see it that way? Derek pointed out. Fine, Cynthia growled. However, what does that mean for us? Is there an us? he asked. For some reason, her answer seemed very important to him at the moment. There'd better be. Cynthia leaned back in her chair, playing with her pen. I don't know about you, but now that this thing between us has started, I have no intention of stopping it. She had a lot of intentions, mostly to snag Derek and make him hers, and when Cynthia wanted something, she generally got it. You know what this means, don't you? he asked quietly. What? Cynthia tilted her head and enjoyed just looking at him. She'd always been a little attracted to him. Lately, as much more than a little, she was falling for the person she was learning about, the Derek that she had never known, the man who was always there for her and now for her nieces and nephews as well. If neither of us intends to stop, then I need to find another job, Derek said logically. Hold on a moment, Cynthia scowled. She didn't like this idea one bit. I like you working for me. The firm has strict policies, Derek reminded her. We signed agreements. We're lawyers, Cynthia pouted. We can find a loophole and exploit it. Derek had a rueful chuckle. She was worried about losing him, so she'd finally promoted him to something she didn't even have the power to promote him to. It was better than her saying he was only her assistant, he supposed. A whole team of lawyers put the agreement together. I'm sure it's infallible. Nothing is infallible, she stated stoutly. I'll find a solution. The solution is to have me work somewhere else. Your entire career is here, he said reasonably. Then I can take you out to dinner and other public functions without worrying about running into any of the office staff. I want that too, she admitted. Derek got up. I'll go brush off the resume. Don't worry, I'll find an appropriate replacement before I go. It won't be the same, Cynthia said somberly. No, he agreed. It will be better. She would hold him to that promise, she thought as she watched Derek leave her office. Derek sat down at his desk. For the first time in a long time, he didn't want to quit. He was enjoying working for Cynthia. He enjoyed kissing her more. That meant if they were going to give this a shot at a real relationship, he was going to have to find a new job. He put job search on his already overloaded list of things to do. He would never find anything with as good a pay as this. Derek sighed. Well, maybe he'd get better hours and vacation days that he was actually allowed to use. There was something to be said for having time to relax and have a personal life. Especially when his personal life was about to include Cynthia. Derek. Lonnie hung his arms over Derek's cubicle, flashing him a crooked smile. I was thinking for Valentine's Day of maybe asking Jill for a double date. Would you be interested? In a double date? With Lonnie as one of the participants? And Jill, queen of the copy room? He'd rather dip himself in acid. Derek shook his head regretfully. Lonnie, I'd love to, but you know, Miss Stone, I never have any time off. First in the office, last out, always got the nose to the grindstone. Lonnie laughed and winked. We all know how she keeps you busy, Derek. Derek paused and looked at Lonnie. Did Lonnie mean what Derek thought he meant? Our relationship is purely professional. Yeah, right. Lonnie winked again. Don't worry, I'll keep it under wraps. Great. That meant he'd be spreading it far and wide. Hopefully, no one would pay any mind to Lonnie and his lewd tongue. 
You've been having luck with Jill, then? Not really. Lonnie frowned in contemplation. She's a prickly one. Bob said she turned down her last boyfriend for three months until she went out with him. Bob said that, according to the last guy, she was worth the wait. I heard that, Derek nodded sagely. He said she was amazing. Really? Lonnie smirked. I'm surprised you haven't tried. Then again, you've been busy. Oh, no. Derek shook his head with an innocent expression. I think Jill is just too much woman for me. Maybe you should think twice on what you might be getting yourself into, Lonnie. Too much woman? Lonnie scoffed. There's no such thing for me. I don't know, Derek shrugged. I heard the last guy. What? Lonnie leaned forward, entranced. It really wasn't a nice thing to say. Nor was it fair to Jill. However, it might keep Lonnie from spreading rumors about Derek and Cynthia, which Derek wanted to protect her from any disciplinary action. He leaned over to Lonnie and whispered, Expired in bed. Lonnie's eyes bugged out. She's that good? Derek shrugged and let Lonnie think whatever he would. Whoa, Lonnie breathed. I'm going to order up one of those big chocolate heart packages. I hear women like those things. That's an idea, Derek remarked mildly. Lonnie nodded and headed off on a mission. Derek leaned back in his chair and struggled with his conscience. He was probably a bad guy for leading Lonnie down this road. He rubbed his tired eyes and sighed. Minnie knocked on his cubicle to get his attention. Decorating committee! Huh? Derek looked at her blankly. To boost company morale in the lower orders, it has been decreed that we shall decorate all non-senior staff workplaces for each major holiday. Minnie held out a glittery streamer of red hearts. I give you decorations for Valentine's Day and tape. Derek blinked. Isn't that depressing for everyone who's single? Or anyone that is forced to work through the holiday due to the work schedule of their boss? Stop that nonsense. Minnie scowled at him. Get cozy with the romantic holiday and put up some sparkle. You just want to bedazzle my cubicle, he accused her. And everybody else's, she readily agreed. It took me two weeks of petitioning to get the higher-ups to agree to this, so don't be a spoil sport. Derek sighed. He didn't want to ruin her fun. Fine, glitter away. Minnie gave a little excited squeal. She shoved her way into the cubicle. I think over here I'll put the hearts. Old Cupid himself, he should go over in this corner. Derek was squashed into a corner. He couldn't move as Minnie pressed up against him to tape another piece of decoration to his cubicle wall. I could do errands and let you at it. Don't worry, I'll be done in just a moment, she said as she turned. Derek pushed his face against the cubicle to avoid having it right in her posterior. I just have one more... He sincerely hoped it was only one more. Derek was starting to feel claustrophobic. There. Minnie smiled happily and squeezed her way out of the cubicle. All done. Isn't it great? Derek looked around his previously bare and utilitarian cubicle. It had been transformed with dancing cupids, glittering hearts, and a small vase of fake red roses. It was an assault on the eyes. Yeah, great. What am I supposed to do with the pack of cards you left on my desk? Those are for you to write nice messages on and hand out to your co-workers, Minnie proudly answered. We're going to give valentines just like we did when we were kids. I never gave valentines as a kid. Derek eyed the pack of cards. The box had a goofy-looking mouse holding up a heart. You must have broken a lot of girls' hearts, Minnie tutted. They were waiting on a valentine from you and were disappointed. I highly doubt that. Derek didn't believe it for a second. He'd been a miserable child. The girls had probably been relieved that he had stayed far away from them. Speaking of love, Minnie drew out the word with relish. Lonnie got Jill to agree to go out on a double date with him. I don't know if his constant attention wore her down, or if she thinks she's being set up to go out with Roger. And Lonnie is bringing Henny, but they're all going to a restaurant and then to see a movie. You're kidding me. Derek couldn't believe it. He stared at Minnie. For real? For real, she giggled delightedly. Love is in the office. Watch out, Derek. You might catch the bug next. 
Derek leaned back in his chair to ponder that bit of gossip as Minnie waltzed away to bedazzle and glitter the next unfortunate soul's cubicle. Well, I'll be. Derek allowed a smile to creep across his face. Chapter 9 Derek grabbed the ringing cell phone and put it to his ear as he typed furiously on his laptop. Derek Kramer. Derek, is that really you? A female voice came over the line. Derek abruptly stopped typing, grabbing the phone firmly. Jenny? Hi, Jenny said in relief. I have been trying to get a hold of you for weeks now. Wow, we haven't talked in ages. Derek leaned back in his chair. What's going on? She gave a sad laugh. That's the thing. I've got bad news. Your dad has a parole hearing tomorrow. What? The word was dragged leaden out of him. All his pleasure at hearing from Jenny evaporated, replaced by a dull weight that made it hard to breathe. Yeah, apparently he applied for parole. She had a bitter laugh. I'm trying to find anyone to testify against him at the hearing so that he stays in jail where he belongs. I thought he wasn't supposed to be able to get out, Derek said woodenly. Overcrowding and good behavior, Jenny growled. So far, the only one doing anything about it is me. I'm trying to find more of us, but most just aren't functioning adults. Mary's in rehab again. So's Johnny. Dave overdosed a few years ago. I can't find Nate or Georgie or any of the others. I'm amazed I finally tracked you down. It was hard since you changed your last name. He swallowed thickly. So it's just you and me to testify. Actually, it's just you. Jenny sounded apologetic. I was in a car crash and I'm still recovering. I'm not cleared to fly, so I can't make it out. Me. Alone. At his hearing. Derek closed his eyes and rubbed his forehead. I'm so sorry to put this all on you, Derek, but you know what he did. You know that we can't let him out of jail, Jenny persisted. I signed an affidavit. I think that's what it's called. It'll be read at the hearing, but someone else needs to stand up and testify, to hold the parole board to account. Please say you'll do it. Tomorrow, Derek muttered. He tried to ignore the dark hole that was the memories from his childhood. At one in the afternoon, she confirmed. Promise me, Derek, that you'll go. You always kept your promises. Tell me you turned out okay, Derek asked, trying to deflect her, that you aren't like how most of us turned out. I'm a mom. I have two beautiful girls and a great husband, she sniffed a little. I take a lot of antidepressants and still go to therapy. How about you? Derek had a bitter laugh. I just work until I'm too tired to have nightmares. I stopped therapy a few years ago. There just wasn't time. No substance abuse? No medications? She questioned. No, he assured her. That's good. Jenny sounded a little wistful. I'm glad. We're lucky. We're lucky that we had Louisa as a foster mom, Derek replied shortly. Without her, I would be right alongside Johnny, Dave, and Mary. Maybe, Jenny allowed. She waited for a moment before asking again. Are you going to go? Promise me you'll go and stop him from doing this to someone else. Derek put his head in his hands. He tried to ignore the sinking turmoil in his stomach. All the antacids in the world wouldn't fix this. He set the phone back to his ear. Tomorrow at one. Yes. Okay, I promise. Jenny had thanked him. Derek had finally gotten off the phone with any promises to keep in touch. Neither of them wanted reminders of the past. He'd spent the next hour in the washroom watching his just-eaten lunch go down the toilet. Stomach empty, he popped a mint and decided to talk to Cynthia. He would need to get the time off. Not that he wouldn't skip work if necessary. He'd given his word that he would go. But it would be easier if she just approved him to get away for the hearing. Which meant he was going to have to tell her why. That was something he was not looking forward to doing. Derek knocked on the doorframe of Cynthia's office. He waited for her to look up from her work before shutting the door behind him and taking a seat. "'You look like death warmed over,' she observed. For a moment he toyed with the idea of playing the sick card, but knew that wouldn't evoke an ounce of sympathy from her. Unless he had a terminal disease, she'd expect him to work. 
It was the sort of relationship they had which had worked so well throughout the past eight years. Derek fiddled with his phone, turning it over and over in his hands. I need an afternoon off. When? Cynthia inquired. Tomorrow? No way. She shook her head. We have interviews tomorrow with Mr. Clover. He says he has evidence of Mrs. Clover's infidelities, which would go a long way in court to help us. I need you there. I can't. Derek looked at her in the eye. I need to be at a parole board meeting. A what? Cynthia looked up from her paperwork and gave him her full attention. Did I just hear you right? My dad has a parole board hearing, Derek admitted. His fingers continued to play with the phone, turning it over and over just to have something to do to expend his nervous energy. I need to be there. So that you can help him make parole? Cynthia studied him. I admit, I never would have thought if one of your parents was in jail. They both are. Prison, actually, Derek clarified, and I'd much rather he stayed there. I plan on testifying against him. Oh. Cynthia was a little shocked. After learning he had been in foster care, she'd asked some of her social worker contacts about his information. No one had gotten back to her just yet. Derek was such a well-functioning adult that she would never have thought he would have two parents in jail. I have to go do this, Derek said calmly, despite the swirl of emotions that were inside of him. I can't be here tomorrow afternoon. Okay, she found herself agreeing. Now she was more curious than ever about his past. Leave at noon or whenever you need to go, and come back the next morning. You're sure? I can have the evening off as well? He wanted to make sure she understood. You won't be calling me in with some emergency or questions about a case? I'll be fine, Cynthia shrugged, unless you want to help me sew up a costume for Sarah's play. Derek froze. You? Sewing? It'll be fine, she mustered up some confidence. I'll watch a few YouTube videos, grab some fabric and thread, then create a masterpiece for the kid to wear on Thursday. This Thursday? Derek asked in disbelief. He ran a hand over his face. Do you even have a sewing machine? Like, have you ever sewn anything in your life? It's just a costume, Cynthia frowned at him. It's not rocket science. I'm sure it'll be fine. When you run your finger through the needle, don't forget to cut the threads before you hit the hospital, Derek advised as he got up from the chair. What sort of costume? A duck. It's the old MacDonald had a farm play or something like that, Cynthia waved a hand dismissively. I wasn't really listening. It may have been Red Riding Hood, but I don't recall a chicken being involved in that story. You are so screwed. Derek couldn't help a small smile from creeping across his lips. You should have a little faith in me, she protested defensively. Derek shook his head. Nope, not after the burnt sacrifice. Hey, that wasn't my fault, Cynthia glared at him. How was I supposed to know to put water in with the noodles? Maybe if he'd read the instructions that mac and cheese so thoughtfully provided on the box, he smirked. Get back to work, Cynthia demanded. I need as much done on the clover case as possible before you leave. Yes, boss. Derek shot her sloppy salute and left the office. Cynthia leaned back in her chair and was thankful that she'd already lined up a seamstress and given her instructions. All she had to do was take Sarah for a fitting and then somehow bribe the little girl not to disclose the facts of who really made the costume to him. Taking a ribbing from Derek had been worth getting a look of determined terror off his face for the parole board hearing. Now she was even more curious as to what had happened in his life. Picking up her phone, she dialed a case manager that owed her a favor. Jolinda, Cynthia greeted the woman. Did you happen to get any information on Derek Kramer yet? Cynthia, direct as always, Jolinda greeted her. It wasn't easy since he changed his name, but after some digging, I got it. He changed his name? Cynthia frowned. What was it before? Google the Auckland child prostitution case from 21 years ago, she advised. It'll be quicker than my putting together the file. The Aucklands and three other sick people were running a ring of about 12 or so kids. Derek Auckland was 10 when the feds broke it up, putting his parents in jail. Being their kid didn't save him, he was just as bad off as the others. Like feral cats, these kids. No schooling. They passed from foster home to foster home, most of them running away or turning to drugs. Don't know where they all are now. Why do you want to know? It's a case I'm looking into, Cynthia lied. She felt sick. Well, if any of your clients are linked to this, you could probably put them before a judge as being unfit parenting material. 
They lived half their childhoods in a hostile environment. I doubt a single one of them would function well as an adult. Jolinda sighed. It's a sad world we live in. Are you sure there isn't a mistake? That you've got the right Derek Kramer? She asked. Yep. Jolinda was confident. At age 20, Derek took on the name of one of his foster mothers, an old lady named Louisa Kramer. She had him the longest from age 15 through 17, according to the records. What happened? Or was he from age 17 to 18? questioned Cynthia. She died. Had a stroke and that was it. He lived in four more foster homes that year and then graduated out of the system. No other notes on what happened to him, Jolinda replied. Did you need anything else? No, that's it. Thanks. Cynthia hung up the phone and felt extremely perturbed. She googled the incident and was sickened by what she found on the internet. Turning off her browser, Cynthia got up and stared out the window. How dare they? How dare his own parents do that to a little boy? Cynthia felt outraged. It would be like someone hurting her nieces and nephews. How dare Jolinda malign Derek saying he wouldn't be a good father? He was excellent with the kids, better than Cynthia was. He practically deserved a Dad of the Year award just for cooking and helping with all the issues her new little family was going through. He was funny, he was helpful, he was gentle, he was incredibly smart, he worked tirelessly for her, he put up with her, and he took over Missy's duties. Derek was also good to look at, Cynthia reflected ruefully. She respected him. She liked him. She might even be falling for him. Where had that come from? Cynthia supposed after eight years of working nearly every single waking moment together, they were bound to respect and like each other. However, she was thinking of liking in more than just a professional relationship, more than just a friendship, even. She didn't have many friends. A month ago, she wouldn't even have considered Derek a friend. Then again, a month ago, he hadn't been using peanut butter to get gum out of her hair, or offering advice on what to do with the kids, or laughing at her when she asked him how to shut off a smoke detector, thinking she could feed five kids with five boxes of mac and cheese burning in a microwave. Cynthia felt a little flutter. A month ago, they weren't kissing in the mudroom or the elevator. He was an excellent kisser. She wanted to repeat the experience. Cynthia wanted to create a lot of experiences with Derek. Everything from simple dating and hand-holding to full out making him hers. Twenty-one years ago, he'd been ten. That made him thirty-one. He was eleven years younger than her. It was a large age gap. Then again, men had been dating women younger than them for centuries. Why couldn't a woman date a younger guy? Cynthia turned the thought over in her mind. Did she want to date Derek? Could she see herself with him, short or long term? She really liked him. Cynthia tried not to smile at the thought. He obviously found her attractive, otherwise he never would have kissed her. Was she willing to complicate her work life in the quest to make her personal life happier? It wasn't like she was going to get senior partner any time soon. Maybe she could just relax a little bit. She had five kids to think of now. That meant she was bound to lower her workload since the kids would require a lot of her time. It also meant that maybe she'd take some time for dating. She wondered what Derek would think about that. "'Where's Derek?' Sarah asked as she scribbled on her homework. "'He's busy tonight,' Cynthia said as she rinsed off some glasses and put them in the dishwasher. She looked at the machine. Where did one put the soap? "'Doing what?' the little girl doodled on her paper. She was supposed to be copying words. Instead, she made pretty flowers. "'Not sure,' Cynthia shrugged. She grabbed the liquid dish soap and poured a generous amount on the inside of the dishwasher door, then shut it firmly. She squinted at all the buttons. You need a degree in engineering to run this thing. Do you want me to turn it on? Sarah asked as she grabbed a green marker. I've seen Derek do it lots. I know how. Let me give this a try. Cynthia punched a button and the machine started. Yes. See, that wasn't hard. Sarah kept making flowers. Cynthia looked around the kitchen and living room. Sean was playing with his Legos, but otherwise the space was clean. Serenity was safe in her playpen, gnawing on a toy. Simon and Serena were doing homework in their rooms. She had the hang of this, Cynthia thought proudly. 
All she had to do was pop in a casserole from the church ladies and the evening would be set. What's for supper? Sarah questioned. Casserole, Cynthia replied. She went to the freezer and picked two out at random. That way, if they didn't like one, they could eat the other. Those were the simple choices tonight. She shoved them into the stove and read the instructions Derek had posted on the fridge for her to follow. She stared at the stove. It had a lot of buttons on it. Ten minutes of YouTube videos, Cynthia set the timer and the temperature. She could do this mom thing. She checked on Simon and Serena just to verify they were actually doing their homework, then returned to the kitchen to hear Sarah giggling hysterically. What is going on? Cynthia stopped and stared in shock. The dishwasher was spewing out a gigantic mass of shiny bubbles, as tall as the six-year-old who was playing in them. Sarah shrieked with laughter, throwing a large fluff of bubble suds into the air. Isn't it awesome? Awesome! Sean yelled as he stomped out of the cloud of bubbles, suds clinging all over him. Oh boy, Cynthia blinked. She quickly pressed all sorts of buttons on the machine, desperately hoping to get it to stop. How does this thing work? The doorbell rang. I'll get it! Sarah screeched and lunged for the door, but Cynthia managed to get a hand on the girl's collar. No, Cynthia responded. You will get Serena to help clean up the bubbles. I will get the door. Sarah pouted as Cynthia left the kitchen to answer the door. Ms. Stone? Mr. Davidson, their caseworker, stood on the threshold. I hope this is a good time. Cynthia tried to wipe a stray hair out of her face. She stopped as she saw her hand was covered in bubbles. She quickly put it behind her back and smiled. Mr. Davidson, what a surprise! He smiled back. I imagine it is. That's how surprise visits go. They are a surprise. Why don't you come in? Cynthia stepped back to allow the man to enter. He looked around the foyer. Should I take off my shoes? Please leave them on. Cynthia decided she might as well come clean. He was going to see the kitchen anyways. We've had a bit of an issue with the dishwasher. Oh? She led the way to the kitchen. Thankfully, Sarah had obeyed and gotten her sister. Now the three children were capturing bubbles with towels while Simon mopped the floor. How much soap did you put in there? Simon pushed his glasses up. Cynthia sighed. Too much. Mr. Davidson's mouth twitched. You did this? It was my first time running the dishwasher, Cynthia admitted a little sheepishly. I'm learning. I don't think you should run the dishwasher anymore, Sarah wrinkled her nose, even if it was fun to play in all the bubbles. If I don't try, then how will I learn to do it properly? Cynthia asked the little girl. Maybe one of us could teach you? Sarah replied. Do any of you know how to run the dishwasher? Cynthia questioned. I know you've learned how to do the laundry. The instructions for heating casseroles on the fridge. We've all figured out how to clean up after ourselves, yet I'm not sure anyone knows how to run the dishwasher. I know how to load it, Simon volunteered. I told you, Sarah said matter-of-fact with her little voice. I watched Derek do it lots. You have to put in one of the pods in, then shut the door and press the orange button. It's easy. A pod? Cynthia frowned. Sarah opened a cupboard door and showed the container of dishwashing detergent. One of these, just one. Oh, Cynthia felt a little silly. Who would have thought that dish soap wasn't for a dishwasher? Mr. Davidson cleared his throat. While you children are helping your aunt to clean this up, why don't I talk with each of you in turn and you can show me your pets and rooms? Who wants to go first? He had a brief five-minute private conversation with each child, inspected the house, petted the cats and dogs. By the time he was done, the kitchen was clean and the dishes were rinsed off. Cynthia would run them through the dishwasher again, without soap. Miss Stone, did Mr. Davidson smiled happily, I'm pleased to say that everything looks good. The children appear to be adjusting nicely. Cynthia breathed a sigh of relief. She smiled. She didn't know why she had felt so nervous. Thank you. It's been new to all of us, but I'm enjoying taking care of them. Keep up the good work. I expect I'll have one or two more visits, then I'll be able to sign off on your case, Mr. Davidson replied. Cynthia saw the caseworker out and leaned against the door. What did he say? Serena and the kids were gathered, watching her. Cynthia smiled at them. We're all good. Derek laid on his bed. 
pressing the heels of his hands into his eyes as he tried to process the entire afternoon. What a waste. A waste of time, a waste of money, a waste of the justice system in general. Certain people who had done certain crimes just shouldn't be allowed out, in Derek's opinion. He wasn't a fan of the death penalty, but he was a definite fan of life imprisonment if the crime was big enough. Derek sighed. He was probably not going to sleep tonight, or end up having nightmares. He debated briefly using some sleep medications, but decided against it. He didn't want to become addicted to anything, use anything as a crutch. Besides, it wouldn't be good to be sleepy when Cynthia called him with another two-in-the-morning emergency. His dad had aged. Or maybe it was that Derek's memories were fuzzy. He hadn't seen Auckland since he'd testified at the age of twelve against him and his mother during court cases. Derek hadn't wanted to see them ever again. His father had testified that he was a changed man, that he was ready to return to society, that he would never harm another soul. Derek didn't believe Auckland for a second. However, he couldn't really count himself as objective, nor did he know the man well enough to discern his actual intentions. He did know who his father had been, and Derek had told the judge exactly that. He was the man who had ruined the lives of at least sixteen children, maybe more. He was a man who had no conscience. He was the man who haunted Derek's nightmares when he had them. Auckland didn't deserve to be free. Derek wasn't sure why he called that man his father. He wasn't, really. Auckland may have given him the DNA that produced Derek, but truth was neither his dad nor his mom had been real parents. they just created him. Real parents cared about their kids. Real parents helped their kids, protected them, worried about them. Derek thought about Jenny's letter, read by a court-appointed lawyer to argue against Auckland. It had been a moving testimony of a woman who had deep, lasting issues from the childhood trauma subjected to her from Auckland. When they were graduating from the foster care system together, Derek and Jenny had been mutually attracted to one another. Derek had always wondered what might have been. Now he knew. Jenny, though she liked him, would never have been with Derek because the memories he stirred up from their past. The fact that he was Auckland's son, that he'd shared her shame— had made her turn down any idea of a relationship with him. At the time, he'd been confused. Now he understood. It was for the best, anyways. The two of them in a relationship, neither of them understanding how to be around a normal person, would likely have ended up in disaster. Jenny was far better off with her husband and two kids. Today had been horrendous, and he was glad not to have to talk to anyone or do anything for the rest of the evening. The good news was that the parole had been denied. The bad news was that Auckland was eligible to repeal. Derek would likely have to continue to testify over and over in hopes of keeping the man in jail. He would keep his promise to Jenny, to do what he could to make sure Auckland wasn't released. Derek sighed and looked up at the ceiling. It wasn't doing him any good to stay here for the evening with nothing to do. He could try to get some work done, which he didn't feel like doing. Or he could find out what roommate number two's name really was. It wasn't particularly appealing, however, the fridge was calling. There had to be something edible in this apartment. Derek slowly pulled himself up from the bed. He hadn't eaten properly since learning the parole hearing was happening. Now he was starving. In the kitchen, roommate number one, Duane, was pulling a bottle of soda out of the fridge. He blinked in Derek at surprise. I've heard the rumors that a third person lived in this apartment, but until this moment I hadn't thought them to be true. Very funny. Derek looked through the cupboards. Wait. Duane cocked his head to the side. Do you pay for groceries? Considering there aren't any groceries here? Derek shrugged after a quick peek inside the fridge. I don't think you need to be worried about that. Duane gave him a perplexed look. Why aren't you at work? I got the evening off. Derek responded as he punched in the number of the local pizza place that delivered. I'm ordering pizza. What do you guys want? Meat lovers, Dwayne immediately replied. Is it on you? Yep. Derek called to the living room. Hey, other guy, what do you want for pizza? I have a name. Nick, or Ned, responded. Hawaiian. 
Derek shrugged, asking Dwayne, What is his name? Dwayne laughed. You serious? He's been our roomie for the past eight months or so. That probably says something about me, Derek said wryly. I have no idea even what his name is. He's Norbert. Everybody calls him Bert, Dwayne answered. I guess I was way off. Derek put in their orders, giving the address. What are you guys up to tonight? Video games. Dwayne grabbed an extra glass for Derek. Join us. Find out who we really are. Derek shrugged. He had nothing better to do. I have zero talent or practice at video games. Then we'll enjoy laughing long and hard at you, Dwayne said easily. That's pretty much my life anyways, Derek agreed as he followed Dwayne to the living room. Taking a seat on the couch, game to try and learn more about the two guys he'd been cohabitating with. Chapter 10 It was true. They had gone on a double date, and all four participants had survived. Derek counted it as a minor miracle. Maybe it should be upgraded to major miracle. Roger and Henny had been making eyes at each other all morning. He didn't know exactly what had happened, but apparently the two had connected over the ravioli. Minnie thought it was because they'd had too much wine. Merle thought it was because she'd lent Henny some of her special perfume. She swore it was a man magnet, and that's why she could no longer wear it herself anymore. As much as he liked Merle, Derek seriously doubted that theory. Jill and Lonnie appeared on the outs. Not that Lonnie was giving up. Not by a long shot. She says she's not into me, Lonnie frowned. Yet I was getting signals all night that she thought I was the man. Hey, you should listen to your gut, Bob advised as he snatched a donut. Hey, intuition, man. Hey, it'll never leave you wrong. Lonnie nodded. I'm going to pull out all the stops. I've hired her band. I've got an enormous chocolate heart made. I'm going to win her. Wow, Derek commented as he filled his mug with coffee. She's really something special. She is, Lonnie agreed. The big show is going to happen just before lunch in the copy room. I'll sweep her off her feet. Good luck. Derek took his coffee and went to his desk to work. He was still tired after last night. He'd stayed up way too late, bonding with his roommates. Derek stifled a yawn. Rough night. Nelson asked as he gave Derek a small stack of files. Yes, Derek didn't choose to elaborate. The evening had been okay. He'd actually enjoyed it, playing games and just hanging out. Too bad it had been preceded by putting his dad back in jail. What's up? Nelson hesitated. Our boss is a little different. Oh? Derek thought it was a little funny that Nelson had just noticed this. What'd she do? She keeps trying to get me to open my briefcase. Nelson shoved his glasses up. Once, when I went to the copy room, I returned early because she'd forgotten a file and was trying to unlock it. Really? Derek blinked in surprise. He looked at Nelson, who had the briefcase in hand even now. He was surprised the guy hadn't handcuffed himself to it. That is odd. She's really great to work with otherwise, but that... I don't know... Nelson frowned. A man has a right to privacy, even at work. That's true, Derek agreed. He'd have to have a talk with Cynthia about this. As much as they both wanted to find out what was in the briefcase, it wouldn't do to get Nelson too worked up about it. She was going to have to be much more subtle in the future with her campaign to open the case. A briefcase should be off limits. I knew you'd agree with me, Nelson said, relieved. Would you mind talking to her about it? I'll do that, Derek answered. Don't worry about it, Nelson. It's taken care of. You're a great guy. Nelson nodded, and taking his briefcase, he left to go back to his work area. Man, Derek wanted to know more than ever what was in that case. Everyone began filing out about twenty minutes to lunch. Derek leaned back in his chair and snagged Minnie on the way out. Hey, Minnie. Derek, she came over to him impatiently. Can this wait? I want to go see the show. Are you sure you should? If everyone off the floor leaves, the senior staff are bound to notice, Derek cautioned. 
He didn't want anyone to get in trouble for leaving early. Everyone's going, Minnie shrugged. What are they gonna do? Fire us all? Good point. Derek got up. However, maybe we should make sure our group comes back from lunch a little early so no one gets upset. I suppose, if we have to, Minnie grumbled. I think we should. Derek followed along with the crowd. Where's everyone going? To the copy room to see the disaster Lonnie's been bragging about, Minnie informed him. It'll be interesting to see the look on poor Jill's face once she sees what he does. Poor Jill? Derek raised an eyebrow. She'd gone from second most disliked woman in the firm to poor Jill now? Well, we all feel bad for her now that we pushed Lonnie on her, Minnie remarked. No one really deserves that. True, Derek had to agree. What's going on? Cynthia joined them. Nothing, Minnie quickly replied. Cynthia gave her an incredulous look. There's a mass exodus for the elevators and stairs. I didn't hear the fire alarm go off. Word has it there's going to be a meeting in the copy room for junior staff, Derek said smoothly. Your eye twitched, Cynthia accused him. There's more to this than what you're telling me. Wow, you two are in sync or something, Minnie eyed them both. Derek sighed. Just come along and enjoy the show. You're not going to tell me what this is about? Cynthia asked. Nope, it's a surprise. Derek hustled both of the ladies into the next elevator. They squished in amongst others who wanted to see the odd event versus those who just wanted to use the elevator to get where they were going. Once on the copy room floor, everyone started for the copy room. Derek frowned. It was going to be more crowded than he thought. Apparently, word had traveled fast in the company because people from other floors were turning up as well. Do I hear music? Cynthia tilted her head in puzzlement. It's a band, Minnie said excitedly. He's really going to do it. Do what? Cynthia looked at them in surprise. Sure enough, there was Lonnie holding on to a huge chocolate heart and flowers, a mariachi band of three singing old love songs, and Jill glaring daggers. Lonnie was exclaiming his love to Jill. She stomped over, grabbed the ginormous heart out of his arms, threw it on the floor, and crushed it beneath her feet. She then took the flowers and pummeled Lonnie with them. What a waste of good chocolate, Minnie huffed. Wow, Cynthia stared in amazement at the petals flying through the air. Lonnie held up his hands to ineffectually defend himself. Jill marched to the band, said something rude, and exited the room to her inner office. Everyone in the room quieted, including the band. Lonnie looked down at the carnage of his Valentine's gift. You know, I think you were all wrong. I don't think she likes me at all. There were sympathetic remarks around the room. Lonnie held up his hands for silence. That's okay. Just means there's more of me to spread to the ladies. This man is not off the market. Who wants me? The women in the room made a beeline for the door as Lonnie grinned at them. I think we should get going, don't you? Minnie questioned. Absolutely, Cynthia agreed. Is it just me, or is he a little creepy? Very creepy, Minnie confirmed. Operation Jill and Lonnie was officially a bust. But it had been fun for a while, Derek reflected. He escorted Minnie and Cynthia back to the office. Minnie went to get her purse for a quick lunch, while Derek and Cynthia lingered near her office. What was that all about? Cynthia was a little confused. I'll tell you all about it later, Derek promised. His eye caught sight of something. Where's Nelson? He went for lunch. Why? Cynthia frowned and looked to see what Derek was staring at. The briefcase was on Nelson's desk, wide open. He left his briefcase? Open? Derek couldn't believe it. Do you think it's a trap? Cynthia grabbed Derek's arm. A trap? Derek scoffed. It's just a briefcase. They edged closer and peeked inside. There was a large silver frame with a photo in it. Do you think there's a secret message inside the frame? Cynthia guessed in a hushed voice. I think it's a picture. Derek lifted out the heavy frame, turning it upright. It was a picture of a much younger Nelson with his bride on their wedding day. Cynthia felt around the bottom of the briefcase. There's nothing else in here. 
All he had was a lousy picture, unless he removed whatever was important. Ha! Ah, Nelson ran forward to confront them, snooping in my personal belongings. Cynthia jumped and grabbed Derek again. Derek could understand why. Even as Nelson pushed up his glasses, his hair had become a little fly away from the quick jog, and he looked more frazzled than usual. We're sorry? Derek handed Nelson the frame. But why all the secrecy about a simple picture? It wasn't secrecy. Nelson calmed down, looking down at the photo with obvious affection. I just like having her close to me. Dude, you need to reconcile with your wife, Derek said kindly. It's almost Valentine's Day. Do something romantic to get her back. Nelson shook his head sadly. We're still on the outs over the cooking situation. Let her cook her meals for herself, Derek shrugged. There are meal services all over the city that cater to Cato or low sodium or low fat. Ask around. She can cook for one and the other person gets a meal service. Or maybe if she prefers, she doesn't cook at all. Isn't it worth spending a little money on a meal service if it saves your marriage? I never thought of that. You're right. Nelson brightened considerably and shoved his glasses up. You do understand that I can't keep working here anymore. There's no privacy. We understand. Derek held out a hand. No hard feelings? None. Nelson gave each of them a handshake, grabbed his briefcase, and left. Now you have to hire me another PA, Cynthia said mildly. Crud. Derek thought about the list of applicants. None of them had been as good as Nelson. He'd have to call the agencies again. Cynthia gave him a sympathetic pat on the arm before heading into her office. Derek was surprised that Cynthia restrained herself from immediately asking how the hearing had gone. He counted down the time, betting with himself for when she would crack. Despite how busy they were interviewing clients, they did have a few moments uninterrupted together, yet she didn't display the slightest curiosity. Part of him was proud of her. The other part wondered what was wrong with her. Then again, it had been a busy day with Lonnie and Nelson situations. It was after work when they were pulling into the parking lot to pick up the kids that she finally mentioned it. How did yesterday go? she asked. Fine. Derek didn't elaborate. Is he staying in prison? Cynthia pocketed her keys after locking the van. Yep, he responded. That's good. Cynthia decided not to push him for any more details. How's the costume coming? Derek asked as they walked into the school lobby to gather the kids. He thought it would be a good idea to direct her attention elsewhere. He didn't want to answer any questions about his dad. Cynthia surprised him and herself when she slipped her arm through his. Costume? You mean the bird? It's coming great. I'm asking because I thought you might have worked on it last night. He'd been surprised when she'd left him alone to get the clover case situated. Usually, she liked to ride him when deadlines were looming. He'd still done a little work on it after he got done playing video games with his roommates. I did, she said. It wasn't a total lie. She'd taken Sarah for a fitting and paid an exorbitant amount for a down payment on the seamstress's service. Did you get any sewing done? he asked innocently. Well, we cut material up against those paper form things. Cynthia knew enough that that was generally how things started. She also had a sneaking suspicion that Derek was trying to catch her out in her lie. There was lots of pin things to, you know, pin. Did you use the bobbins? Derek questioned seriously. There it was. The trap. She had no idea what a bobbin was and if it should be used at that stage in the project. Cynthia could admit she'd have been had or give it a 50-50 shot of getting it right. She took a deep breath. Not yet. Everyone knows you don't use the bobbins until later. When? When do you use them? Derek's mouth was twitching, and Cynthia knew he was amused. Okay, she rolled her eyes. What is a bobbin? I'll tell you if you admit to how you're really getting this costume done, he grinned. And paying someone. It would have been better than me doing it, trust me. I should have just ordered one online, but no one would guarantee that it would arrive on time, Cynthia complained. She gave him a suspicious look. What is a bobbin? It's a piece that gets thread wrapped around it. It gets inserted in the bottom of the machine. 
he hurried to add, before you ask, no, I do not sew. I just had a foster mom who was teaching the girls, and I happened to overhear that particular bit. I have no idea how it even works. Was it Louisa? Cynthia asked. Derek abruptly stopped walking. What? Cynthia winced. She hadn't meant to let him know that she'd researched him. Thanks to her stupidity, she'd let the cat out of the bag. Derek looked at her in disappointment, lead settling into his gut. You know. Yes, she admitted. I asked you not to delve into this. I asked you not to go there into my personal life. He pulled his arm away from her. His voice rang with anger and despair. I asked, and you just couldn't do it. I care about you, and I wanted to know, Cynthia protested a little defensively. No, if you cared, you would have respected my wishes. Derek ran a hand through his hair. You would have waited for me to tell you, if I chose to. Derek. She reached out to try to put a hand on his arm, but he pulled away. How can you even look at me? He let out a bitter laugh. I have trouble looking at me sometimes. You didn't do anything, Cynthia frowned. You were just a kid. I need to go, Derek muttered. Why? I don't understand. She stepped in front of him. Talk to me. Sin, you need to back off. I need space right now. His voice shook. I'm too angry right now to talk to you, so I'm just going to walk away. Don't wait for me. Derek, maybe I can help, she offered. Maybe if you talked about it, you would feel better. Talk about it? He rubbed his eyes. I want to pretend that it never happened. If I could erase the first third of my life, I would. There's no one that can help. Cynthia wanted to argue with him, to tell him that she could at the very least try to comfort him. However, he walked away, and she didn't think she should follow him. She'd messed up. Badly. It was who she was. Cynthia knew she was rough around the edges. It came from competing with men for the top spot all the time. She needed to be quicker, smarter, harder, all to try to get in the same job. Those same characteristics had made her solve her curiosity about Derek, even though she had known he didn't want her delving into his past. Yet she'd done it anyways. It hurt that she'd hurt him. Cynthia swallowed past the lump in her throat as Sarah bounded up to her. Hi, Auntie Cynthia, she said in her happy little girl voice. Where's Derek? He's away today. He'll be back tomorrow, Cynthia responded. At least she hoped so. She had never made Derek that angry before. Cynthia took Sarah's hand and asked her about her day. Derek walked. He walked until he was so tired he had to hail a taxi to get home. He had no idea what neighborhood he ended up in, and he was probably lucky that he hadn't gotten mugged by the time he'd walked his anger off. He put himself under the hot spray of the shower with his aching feet, and just felt empty. He loved her, but why did she have to be such a pain in the neck? Wait, what? Derek opened his eyes abruptly, realizing that the water had gone cold and he'd been half asleep leaning against the shower wall. There was no way he loved that woman. She was impulsive, arrogant, irritating, annoying. She had no sense of privacy, or of boundaries. She was demanding and selfish. She was beautiful. She was trying with the kids, even though she admitted she was out of her league there. She said she cared about him. She kissed like no other. Then again, he'd been through a long dry spell. Very long. Derek groaned and shut off the freezing water. He toweled off, somewhat dressed, and fell into bed. He'd gone insane. That was the only answer. It was insanity to fall for a dragon. Valentine's Day was coming up. Did he get her something? Did he not? It wasn't like they had a conventional relationship. He didn't even know what to call this thing between them. Well, she wasn't getting anything from him. He was mad at her. He intended to stay mad at her for a long while, he thought as he drifted off to sleep. Derek wasn't into work. It was five past seven in the morning, and he hadn't shown. Cynthia checked her Fitbit against her cell phone against her laptop to see if they were correct. Then she googled the time just to check again to see if they were right. They were. She looked over the farm of cubicles. Pete's paralegal was working diligently. Cynthia didn't know his name. 
You, what is the time? It's Lonnie time, he grinned up at her with his crooked teeth in need of a brushing. Whenever you want it to be, it's a good time, too. Cynthia blinked. No wonder Pete liked this guy. There are two peas in a pod. You do realize we have a strict policy on sexual relations in the workplace? Like how they aren't supposed to happen at all? Lonnie snorted. Come on. You're not that type of girl. We all know what you've been doing behind closed doors. Or should I say, who you've been doing? Excuse me? Cynthia could not have heard him correctly. Lonnie must not have heard the venom in her voice, or he was stupid enough to ignore it. We all know you're doing, Kramer. No other guy would allow himself to be dominated by a woman, unless he's dominating her in the bedroom. It's the main reason why you didn't get senior partner, besides the fact that you're a woman. Cynthia didn't bother to pardon herself as she walked away from him. Marching back to her office, she tried to ignore his words. Yet it rankled. The senior partners had chosen Jameson over her, even though she was a far better lawyer than him. She brought in more income to the firm than he did. There were constant rumors he was involved with the young female interns. It made him a lawsuit waiting to happen. She managed to work for a little less than an hour before checking the farm again. Derek wasn't in his cubicle. Cynthia tried not to worry. He would be back, wouldn't leave her stranded no matter how much he hated his job, and was mad at her. She was pretty certain of that. At least, she was kind of sure? Maybe? Cynthia wandered over to the boardroom where she could hear voices. Funny, there was no one in the room. She entered, shutting the door behind her. Sure enough, she could hear her uncle speaking clearly. Jameson replied. Cynthia scowled as she approached the conference phone at the large table. Someone had left the line open. Probably Jameson had been in the conference room and was called over to her uncle's office. Jameson was clueless when it came how to operate a regular phone. He didn't seem all that confident with a regular cell phone either. She was about to end the call when she heard Derek speak. You wanted to see me, sir? I understand you've been working for Cynthia for eight years now, Mr. Stone Sr. said. That's correct, Derek responded. How would you like a bump in position? her uncle asked. I don't know what you mean. Derek's voice was careful. He means that since I'm about to make senior partner, I could use a better paralegal than Bob. Jameson laughed heartily. Let's face it, Bob's just not making the cut, and we've seen how you've been propping Cynthia up. You've been carrying her long enough. It's time you got better pay, better hours, and a better boss. Derek took a moment to respond. Excuse me? Are you saying you want me to work for you? That's right. Cynthia could practically hear Jameson smiling his arrogant smile. It's time for you to come work with a real boss instead of a skirt. Was her uncle going to let Jameson talk about her like that? Cynthia clicked her mouth shut and glared at the phone. What happens to Miss Stone? Derek asked slowly. Cynthia has tried, but we all know she hasn't been the best fit for the firm, her uncle said. At the end of the month, we are going to make some budgetary cuts that will include Mr. Hudson and Ms. Stone. They were going to fire her. How dare they? Cynthia stuffed a hand in her mouth before she said something nasty to the phone, giving her away. I suppose Ms. Stone would have no need for a paralegal at the end of the month, Derek said quietly. Too quietly. Cynthia had heard that tone before. She leaned forward in anticipation. That's right. Here's your opportunity to work your way up with me, Jameson laughed. She could imagine him slapping Derek on the back. I'd rather not, Derek stated mildly. Excuse me? Jameson was surprised. I said I'd rather not. Derek raised the volume like Jameson was hearing impaired. Thank you for the offer, but I'll stick with Miss Stone. Mr. Stone, I don't know how Jameson here has managed to convince you of his worth, which I assure you is negligible, but you're making a huge mistake. Cynthia makes more billable hours than any other lawyer in this firm. She constantly brings in business and income. She has a near-perfect winning record in court. If you let her go, you're about to hurt the firm's bottom line. Some other firm will snap her up, and I'll go with her. She should have been made senior partner. It's your loss, not hers. 
I'm sorry you feel that way, her uncle responded. Expect you to keep this conversation confidential. Why, so you can ambush her at the end of the month? I have more loyalty to her than that. I'm just sorry I have to be the one to burst her bubble and her faith in you, Derek said coldly. If you'll excuse me, gentlemen. She could hear Derek leave. Told you he wouldn't go for it. He's too deep into her panties, Jameson said in disgust. Disgusted herself, Cynthia leaned into the phone. Hey, I guess Mr. Kramer doesn't need to tell me what happened since I heard it all right here in the conference room. Next time, you might want to learn how to properly hang up a phone, Jameson. She ended the call. Jerks. Marching to Derek's cubicle, she leaned over the side. My office. He grabbed a set of files and followed her. You're late. Cynthia leaned against her desk, folding her arms as she watched him close the door. No, Derek elongated the word as he dropped the files on her desk. I stopped by the coffee room for the clover files. Before that, I was at the courthouse filing the paperwork for the Underhill case. I already dropped off the dry cleaning, ordered the cake for Sarah's birthday party, and got you the Wednesday German eclair. He put the pastry bag on her desk. Where's my latte? Cynthia toyed with the bag. It's Wednesday. That means you get cinnamon tea from the gourmet service that comes in the firm at nine. Derek checked his watch. I have five minutes yet before I need to go downstairs to get that for you. You're not getting that for me. She stated firmly as she put the treat bag back on the desk. Excuse me? Derek frowned. Until I get your new PA, I'm back to fetch and carry. I want to apologize for the other day. You're right she admitted, ignoring his fetch-and-carry remark. I was totally out of line. I didn't respect your wishes, and I shouldn't have pried into your life without your permission. I'm sorry. Thank you, he said stiffly. And I don't look down on you for your past. Cynthia walked forward until she could straighten out his tie. She took her time. If anything, I admire you more for it. You've overcome a lot to get where you are, and I think that's amazing. He sighed. Cynthia... Stop. She put a finger to his lips in warning. Just take it for the compliment I mean it to be. He took her hand away from his mouth. I need to tell you something. What? Cynthia tilted her head back to study him. That my uncle is about to kick me out of the firm? That they tried to hire you for Jameson behind my back? Yeah. Wait, what? Derek looked at her in surprise. How did you know? Cynthia smiled. Jameson isn't exactly Mr. Technology. He left the phone in the conference room going. I heard the whole conversation. Thank you, by the way, for defending me, for choosing to stay with me. Jarek shrugged. After eight years of working together, I think we do okay. Yet yeah, you're not happy, she pointed out. What do you mean? Derek frowned. You're not happy. You haven't been happy for years working here. Cynthia smiled as she saw a little closer. I like to think it's not me, but my workaholic ways probably didn't help. It's not a big deal. Derek didn't back away. They are both losing their jobs by the end of the month, so who cared what anyone in the office happened to see? What would you do if you could work anywhere? Do anything? She asked thoughtfully. I'm not sure. Derek paused as an idea came to him. I'd like to work for a little non-profit that I keep funding, but I know they can't often afford lawyers and paralegal services. What do they do? She straightened his collar and pretended to brush imaginary lint off his shoulders. They help kids who have gone through similar situations as mine, he clarified quietly. Therapy, activities, meeting other kids, just helping. Often they look into the legal ramifications of extended family or other potential people to take custody of these kids to give them a chance at having a home life that is somewhat normal. You've given financially to them? Cynthia asked. Mostly. Sometimes I give the older kids a talk, let them know that they can have a future if they want. Derek placed his hands along her waist. Sometimes I give them free legal advice. When? I keep you pretty busy, she frowned. Not as often as I'd like, Derek shrugged. However, I guess we're about to be unemployed, unless you pick up something right away. I was thinking about taking a break, maybe, Cynthia confided in him. Trying to figure out this mom thing? Not that I don't want to work, just fewer hours. Normal hours, I suppose, for most people. Now that sounds good, Derek admitted. I miss that thing called sleep. 
Maybe we could both get jobs at that organization of yours? She ventured with a shrug. It could work, as long as we can work around the kids' school schedule. Derek shook his head. I can't afford you, Sin. I doubt I could get a job with them. They aren't going to pay much. Although I only rent a room, it's expensive enough. Then don't rent, Cynthia smiled. Move in with me. I can't, Derek said reluctantly. Why not? Cynthia frowned, feeling a pang of disappointment. She'd been getting such good signals from him again. You're supposed to be giving the kids example. I'm not going to be some random guy living with you, Derek frowned and returned. You're not some random guy, she insisted. I was thinking we could define this thing between us. Maybe call it a relationship if you'd ever asked me out on a date. It's still too much to have your barely boyfriend sleeping over, let alone living with you. Think of what the kids will think. Derek pushed back. Boyfriend? Cynthia smiled at the idea. The kids love you. You feed them. It's high on their list of priorities. Derek smiled despite himself at her little joke and leaned his head against hers. I'm not moving in. Not yet. When? she asked. When we put rings on, which could be a year from now, two years, or maybe never. Derek pulled her gently against him. It takes time to figure out if this will be what we both want. Actually, Cynthia slid her arms to loop around her neck. She was surprised that he could be so old-fashioned about moving in with her. She kind of liked it. I've already decided what I want. I think if you're smart, you'll want the same thing. And what is that? He murmured. To be my valentine. She smiled up at him. That I might manage. He kissed her. Epilogue After walking out of the law firm Yates, Kramer, and Stone, Cynthia landed a position with a much smaller firm that would give her better hours and less workload. This way, she could concentrate more on her nieces and nephews. She enjoyed the work and was slowly learning not to bring it all home with her. It was also a bit of a challenge because she no longer had a PA to assist her with everything. However, she'd found the next best thing by hiring Bob. They were slowly getting used to each other. Bob was learning not to be so timid, and Cynthia was learning to have more patience. It was good for both of them. She was starting to like the little pygmy goat. While she had enjoyed working with Derek, they had agreed if they were going to see each other personally, then a little space professionally was in order. Derek had managed to snag a job at the little not-for-profit that he liked so much. It meant fewer hours and a huge drop in pay, but it was worth it since he was a lot happier. Derek also freelanced part of his time to fill the gap. He also made a lot less in acids. He was constantly over at the house now, mornings and after school until late evening. However, Derek did not sleep over. It was his rule for their relationship to set a good example for the kids. Sometimes she felt he went a little far with this, but she had a plan in the works. Cynthia always got what she wanted. She didn't see much point in waiting once she had made up her mind about something. It was Valentine's Day, and the kids had come home with all sorts of candy, paper valentines, and artwork. Cynthia proudly put all the paper on the fridge, burying the stainless steel beneath a mountain of paper and magnets. The candy was put away so that no one would gorge themselves before supper. It was a special meal. She'd instructed everyone that they would have to stay out of the kitchen until she was ready for them. Derek was in charge of the kids. Cynthia was in charge of supper. She'd taken a class and knew exactly one dish, which is what they were getting tonight. The rest of the menu was takeout, which she was keeping warm in the oven. There was cheesecake in the fridge for the special occasion. She was getting a little domestic, Cynthia thought happily. She was also getting a little impatient which is why she was going to take matters into her own hands. Cynthia began to load the table with food. She had made spaghetti with canned sauce. It wasn't exactly fancy, but it was something she could accomplish without setting off the smoke detector. She grabbed the vegetables and garlic bread, putting them on the table. Finally, everything was ready. Cynthia called over the group. She glanced over the setting, complete with Derek's bouquet of roses that he'd given her. It was perfect, she thought proudly. Why are you so giggly? Derek asked Sarah as he slowly walked Serenity to the table. The baby had a firm grip on his hands and was happily toddling along. I don't know. Sarah giggled some more with a sing-song voice. 
She was terrible at hiding her excitement. Serena rolled her eyes as she took her seat. She was forcibly pretending not to be excited. She's just happy to watch Lady and the Tramp for the gazillionth time. All of the kids, except Sean, for fear of him saying something, were in on tonight's surprise. Sarah just giggled again and took her seat. Dinner is served, Cynthia said to distract him, putting down a pitcher of water. They had decided that this first Valentine's Day would see them together as a family, rather than just the two of them going out. Hence, Lady and the Tramp with the spaghetti dinner. The whole thing was keyed down and nice. How was school today, Serena? Any boys give you valentines? Derek asked. Serena shrugged as she passed the plate of noodles to Simon. A few. The weird ones, mostly. Not that I care. It's kind of a kid's thing. Oh, I don't know, Cynthia said as she wrapped a towel around Sean to keep him from making a mess. I'm starting to really like the holiday. Sarah giggled delightedly. What is up with you? Derek asked. You are really twitchy. Nothing, Sarah sang, biting a piece of garlic bread. She was practically dancing in her seat, and Cynthia wondered if the little girl was going to hold on for dessert until the surprise. When are we going to go see the game? Simon piped up, trying to distract Derek from Sarah's antics. What game? Derek frowned, uncertain about the sudden question. You know, go out to a game. Male bonding time, Simon said, fluffing his way through the moment. I'm partial to basketball, but I'm willing to do baseball. It would be good for our relationship to sit in a stadium and watch people play a sport. Bless his little heart. Cynthia didn't even think he liked sports. She had to give him points for trying to distract Derek. Cynthia frowned. Do you even like sports? Simon shrugged. That's not the point. It's a male bonding thing. Historically, men have been going to see men do feats of athletic activity since before the Coliseum. So we need to bond, Derek said with some amusement at the sudden turn of conversation. Why don't you just pick an activity you like and we'll do that? Simon shrugged. I suppose that would work. Trust me, it will work better, Derek said. Plus, I admit, I'm not overly into sports. Simon sighed in relief. I'm not either. It came time for dessert, so Cynthia cleared plates as Simon and Serena helped. She refused Derek's help. You've been doing most of this, and it's time we all pitched in. You didn't make this, Derek said to Cynthia as Serena distributed pieces of cheesecake. No, she replied, although some day I might learn to bake something. Going all domestic, he grinned. She shrugged and tried not to smile. Cynthia was proud of how the evening was going. A little. Hey, aren't you having any? Derek asked Sarah as she bounced in her chair. Sarah giggled. No, I'm too excited. It's only a movie, and you've seen it before. Derek assumed she must mean about the rest of the evening. It's not that special. We might have popcorn, Sarah smiled and bounced some more. You're a goof, Cynthia said with a slight look of warning. She didn't want to tip Derek off that something was going to happen. As it was, the kids were paying far too much attention to him and his dessert. Cynthia had butterflies in her stomach. What has she been thinking? Would he take this the right way, or would he be offended? Traditionally, it was a guy thing, not a woman thing to do. Plus, it was a surprise, and he was always telling her they should wait. She didn't want to wait any more. She knew what she wanted. Cynthia felt her anticipation build. Had to say yes, right? Especially in front of the kids. He wouldn't let the kids down. Cynthia was counting on that. She could barely eat her own cheesecake. Cynthia kept up an increasingly nervous chatter while she surreptitiously watched him. She had made sure to keep the slices small so that he would finish the whole thing. Cynthia watched him pop the last forkful into his mouth and chew. His plate was empty. Derek swallowed and took a sip of water. That was really good, Derek complimented her. She looked at the kids. They looked at her. Where was it? Had he swallowed it? Was that even possible? Um, Derek? Serena asked slowly. Was any of that cake a little crunchy? No. Why, was yours? Derek asked, frowning. Why are you all looking at me? Did he eat it? Sarah stared at Derek in fascination. Does that mean he's going to poop it out? Derek looked at her with a bit of revulsion. What are you talking about? Everyone, check your cheesecake. 
Cynthia smashed her fork through the remainder of the slice of cheesecake on her plate. She looked through the dessert destruction, but didn't find anything. Simon? You okay? Sean asked curiously. He's choking, Serena shrieked. Simon was making funny little noises with a hand to his mouth. Without thinking, Cynthia thwacked him hard on the back. He lurched forward in his seat, and out popped a silver ring skittering across the table. Found it, Sarah said excitedly. She clapped her hands. Simon gulped in a large breath. I think I cracked a tooth. Cynthia stared in horror as Derek slowly picked up the saliva and cake-encrusted ring. What's this? Surprise! Sarah opened her arms wide with a flourish. Cynthia snatched the ring. It was disgusting. What had she been thinking? She retreated to the kitchen to wash it off with soap. Wasn't he supposed to get the slice with the X on it? Serena followed her, speaking in a hiss. The one with a D on it, Cynthia hissed back. Oh, Serena bit her lip. Oh. Cynthia closed her eyes. I'm not mad at you. It just didn't go as planned. I'm sorry, Serena said with a small voice. Cynthia sighed and hauled the distraught girl into an embrace. It's okay. No, it's not, she sniffed. I ruined it. You did not ruin it, Cynthia reassured her. What is going on? Derek was bewildered. We're going to ask you to marry us, Sarah chimed happily. Sarah, Simon warned her, too late. You're supposed to let Aunt Cynthia ask him. Excuse me? Derek frowned. Cynthia, care to explain? Cynthia gave Serena a pat on the back, letting her niece go. It didn't go as planned. I'm kind of getting that, Derek watched her curiously. It was probably a silly idea. She sighed as she came to stand before him. If you tell me what the idea was, maybe I can answer that, he watched her. Cynthia couldn't remember anything from her carefully rehearsed speech. She decided to wing it. What was the worst that could happen? This was already a train wreck. You know how I'm impatient? I usually decide I want something and I just go for it. I'm all impulsive and all in. However, I've never regretted that. It just means I know exactly what I want. I know that I want you in our lives permanently. We love you. I love you. I know you said we should wait and be a good example, but that's a little bit overrated, don't you think? I know I'm not going to change my mind, and I don't believe that you will either. She then took a deep breath and got down on one knee, holding up the ring. Derek, the kids want to call you uncle, and I want to call you mine. Will you marry us? Don't. Derek stood and gently pulled Cynthia to her feet. Don't kneel to me. It's part of the proposal? She frowned. Is that a men's engagement ring? He looked at it, bemused. Yes, Cynthia responded. You weren't exactly in a hurry to advance our relationship, so I picked it out. You're proposing to me, he questioned. Derek didn't know quite what to think. We've barely dated. Yes, Cynthia allowed. I know, I just thought we can still date while engaged or married. Nobody says we have to stop. His mouth twitched. What exactly was the plan tonight? You were supposed to have the ring in your piece of cake. You'd find it with your fork. I had a whole speech planned that I can't remember anymore. It was supposed to be romantic. Cynthia looked up at him. I don't think this qualifies as romantic, he smiled. I do think it's something we'll tell our grandkids. Is that a yes? she asked hopefully. Yes. Derek leaned down and kissed her. Ew, gross. About time. Yay! Sarah clapped. Serenity followed her sister's example and clapped too. If you enjoyed Derek and Cynthia's story, you may enjoy Tiana's as the Broken One series continues with The Love Plan. Tiana Mitchell was tired of being poor. She'd been poor her whole life. It was time to get a plan and take a little action. So she came up with an idea to marry Rich. Thanks to some kids cherry-bombing the toilets at the public school, her son Patrick had the opportunity to go to a prestigious private academy for the rest of the year. All Tiana needs to do is find a single dad at the school, get him to marry her, and boom, she'd be set for the rest of her life. Chase Ellis was sick of women falling at his feet for his money. 
He'd come up with a scheme to work undercover at one of the grocery store chains that he owned. He'd stock shelves like a regular guy and find a lady who would love him just for himself. At least, that was the plan. Until he met Tiana, who filled him in on her plan. Then Chase thought he might just have to change both their plans altogether. And don't forget the continuing saga of the Ramsley Brothers series with Book 5, Love and Lies. We all want to know what deep, dark secret the Ramsleys have been hiding. Bethany Searson has been having nightmares from the elusive memories of her childhood. Are they real or fabricated? Undergoing a new therapy, she tries to sort out what really happened. Andrew Colburn Ramsley wants nothing to do with David Ramsley's legitimate offspring. However, after he rescues Bethany, he realizes her life is in danger, and he might need some help from an unexpected source. Can Drew save Beth from a secret that could tear an entire family apart? Thank you for listening. Please click the bell for notifications so that you don't miss any videos. This is free for you and would really help me grow my audience with the algorithms. Also, you can find Sweet Valentine and other books written by Josephine Vintema at Amazon. These are paperbacks, ebooks, and also on Kindle Unlimited. Happy reading!